The hour of 6.30 having come and gone, I will call to order the Common Council meeting of Tuesday, January 17th, 2023, and ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Alder Tischler. Alder Tischler is present. Uh, the 12th District is uh, vacant currently. Alder Revere. Here. Alder Revere present. Alder Vidor. Here. Alder Vidor present. Alder Wahelia. Here. Alder Wahelia present. Alder Benford. Present. Alder Benford is present. Alder Bennett. Alder Bennett is present. Alder Carter. Present. Carter is present. Alder Conklin. Present. Alder Conklin is present. Alder Curry. Alder Curry. Alder Evers. Here. Is present. Alder Figueroa Cole. Alder Figueroa Cole is present. Alder Foster. Here. Alder Foster is present. Alder Furman. Present. Alder Furman is present. Alder Harrington McKinney. Present. Alder Harrington McKinney is present. Alder Heck. Here. Alder Heck is present. Alder Madison. Alder Madison is present. Alder Miadze. Present. Alder Miadze is present. Alder Paulson. Here. Alder Paulson is present. Alder Fair. Here. Alder Fair is present. Madam Mayor, we have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, as usual, I will remind us that we are collectively here to do the business of the city of Madison, ask folks to be kind to each other, to assume good intent, and to please refrain from using profanity uh, in your remarks. We start tonight with an appointing resolution. Item one is Legistar 74894, appointing Barbara Vetter as Alder for District 12 to serve until the spring 2023 election. President Furman? Move appointment. Second. It's moved and seconded to appoint. Are there questions? Is there discussion? Is there any objection to recording a unanimous, enthusiastic, Vote in favor. Seeing no objection, the appointment passes. Congratulations, Alder. May I say some words now? Uh, he, first, he gets oh, no, sworn in. Swearing, yes. <laughs> we do the swearing thank you, thank you. Awesome. <laughs> Come over on this side down. Yeah, <laughs> Come over here. Come close to me so I can see. Yeah, right here. All righty. All right. So do you, Barbara Vetter, solemnly affirm that you will support the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the State of Wisconsin, and the Charter of the City of Madison, and will perform the duties of common council member in and for the 12th Alderman District to the best of your ability? Yes, I do. Outstanding. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you all for being with me here. I'm going to be learning as I go along again, but I just want to introduce my grandchildren. This is Elodie, and this is Micah. They're my two grandchildren that I talk about all the time. And they're here tonight. Thank you, guys. I love you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. My son, Ash. <laughs> My husband, Luciano. <laughs> so that's the whole family. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. That will bring us to our honoring resolutions, um, which is item number two, Legistar 75500 commemorating January 27th, 2023, as International Holocaust Remembrance Day. President Furman. Whereas the Holocaust was the state-sponsored systematic persecution and annihilation of European Jewry by Nazi Germany and its collaborators between 1933 and 1945, at least six million Jews were murdered. Roma, people with disabilities, and Poles were also targeted for destruction or decimation. Millions more, including gay men and political dissidents, also suffered grievous oppression and death under Nazi tyranny. And whereas on January 27th, 1945, Soviet troops liberated Auschwitz, the largest Nazi killing center and concentration camp complex, where approximately 1.1 million people had been murdered. And whereas the United Nations General Assembly passed resolution 607 on November 1st, 20, 
05 to designate January 27th as International Holocaust Remembrance Day to commemorate and remember the Holocaust and its victims and, and. Whereas the theme of the 2023 International Holocaust Remembrance Day is home and belonging, which encourages the exploration of how victims adjusted their ideas of home and belonging as they faced the violent anti-Semitic onslaught during the Holocaust and what home and belonging meant to survivors. And whereas the history of the Holocaust offers an opportunity to reflect on the moral responsibilities of individuals, societies, and governments. And whereas we, the people of Madison, should always remember the terrible events of the Holocaust and remain vigilant against hatred, persecution, and tyranny. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Madison Common Council and Mayor commemorate January 27, 2023 as International Holocaust Remembrance Day in memory of the victims of the Holocaust and in honor of its survivors. Be it further resolved that all Madisonians should work to promote human dignity and confront hate whenever and wherever it occurs. Thank you, Alders. We'll take that as moved by Alder Furman and seconded by Alder Vitiver. We do have uh, two folks here uh, to receive the proclamation, Hilde Adler and Rabbi Betsy Forrester are with us. Would uh, one or both of you like to speak? Go ahead. Hilda is speaking first. Okay, uh, first of all, I would like to thank Mayor Rhodes Conway and the Common Council in the city of Madison for introducing this resolution. It's very important because the Holocaust is becoming ancient history and Ancient history is so easily forgotten. And in this world of 2023, the anti-Semitism is frightening. So it's heartening to know that Madison remembers and cares. I was asked to relate myself to this resolution a little bit, so I will do this very, very briefly. I was never in a camp. I do not consider myself a, re a survivor. I consider myself a refugee. I was very, very lucky that I was able to get out of Germany with my family as late as 1939, and that our quota number was low enough that America would let us in. My family went through a lot as Jews in Germany, but I want to be crystal clear that it was absolutely nothing compared to what the people in the concentration camps went through. I was in my house in Nuremberg where we lived on Crystal Night, that famous night when the Nazis ransacked every Jewish home in Germany, every store, every business, burned down every synagogue and took about 30,000 men into concentration camps. I remember it. I remember when the Nazis came into our house and destroyed every single thing in it, every piece of furniture, every dish, every rug, every, everything. I remember when a tall Nazi officer in big black boots cut the head off my favorite doll and it rolled across the floor to my feet. And I remember a couple of months later, my father's good friend who had been put into the concentration camp Dachau that night, coming back and not even looking like a person. He was skin and bones and hollow eyes and I did not recognize him. <laughs> I don't have time to tell you everything I remember, but please believe that the unbelievable stories that you hear are true. And tell the Holocaust deniers that they're wrong. The stories, the six million Jews and the five million others were killed and shot, gassed, burned in the ovens, starved to death by Hitler and his Nazis. The world cannot afford to forget this, even though the witnesses are getting few and far between. Thank you for remembering, and thank you, Madison, for offering this resolution. And thank you to Hilda. These are traumas that all Jewish people live with. We live with them whether we lived through the Holocaust or whether we are children or grandchildren of people who did. And it's a collective trauma that our children also carry, even though they may not come to know people who survived the Holocaust. Thank you for this proclamation, this resolution. We accept it very gratefully. Elie Wiesel said in his book, Night, 
we must always we must always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, it never helps the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. Sometimes we must interfere when human lives are endangered, when human dignity is in jeopardy, national borders and sensitivities become irrelevant. Wherever men or women are persecuted because of their race, religion, or political views, that place must, at that moment, become the center of the universe. When we think about home and belonging, this is the home where Hilda lives. This is the home where I lived. Madison is our home. And we do feel, I think, that we belong here. And yet, we are aware of anti-Semitism. I am aware of it in my work as rabbi of a Jewish congregation. And I'm aware of it as I interact with faith leader colleagues who share with me the reality of anti-Semitism. It is frightening. And we are very grateful to be in a community that understands the importance of home and belonging and that makes a resolution like this so that we never forget the great evil that human humanity is capable of and that we always are determined to rise above it. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thank you, Hilda, for sharing your stories with us. It's been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? Seeing none, is there any objection to recording a unanimous vote in favor? Seeing no objection, we record a unanimous vote in favor. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. That will bring us to disclosures and recusals. Are there any disclosures or recusals from any members of the body on tonight's agenda? Seeing none, we'll go to the presentation of the consent agenda. President Furman. Thank you, Mayor. A consent agenda is moved with the recommended action listed for each item on the agenda, including public hearings, except one, items which have registrants wishing to speak, Two, items which alders have separated out for discussion slash debate purposes. <laughs> agenda items with recommendations different from the agenda. Agenda item nine, legislative file 74885, updated definition of family. Alder Grant Foster, recommended action, change referrals to plan commission on February 13th and the common council on February 28th, plus Alder Vitiver, as additional referral to, to Housing Strategy Committee on February 23rd. Agenda item nine, legislative file 75482, substitute, designating City of Madison polling locations for the 2023 spring primary election. Alder Paulson, uh, recommended action is to adopt the substitute. Agenda items excluded by one, request of alders, or two, due to registered speakers by 645 p.m. on January 17th. Uh, agenda item seven, legislative file 74703, second substitute, transit-oriented development, TOD overlay district, speakers registered. Agenda item eight, 310-322 um, East Washington, uh, second alder district, um, a, a rezoning, um, speakers registered. Agenda item nine, legislative file 74885, updated definition of family, speaker registered. Agenda item 51, legislative file 75287, authorizing participation in the U.S. Alliance for Election Excellence and to accept grants from the Center for Tech and Civic Life. Uh, it also involves amending the 2023 adopted operating budget to increase the clerk's, uh, clerk's office supply budget um, and service budget. Agenda item 52, um, legislative file, uh, there were speaker registered on agenda item 51 to be clear, sorry. Agenda item 52, legislative file 75291, substitute a, a, re a resolution authorizing a non-competitive service contract with Epstein Yoon Associates Inc. for professional architect and engineering design consulting services for the State Street Campus Garage redevelopment project at 415 North Lake Street. Speakers registered, and I do also just want to point out that um, we did have a correction. It is um, not an LLC; it's it's an Inc. And so uh, I have stated that in the, the exclusion. And when I move the motion, I'll make sure that's that's clear. But that is a minor tweak, just in the organizational name. Um, that's reflected in the attachments, but was not reflected in the um, 
the, uh, uh, the, the title, but um, the action there would be to have adopt the substitute and there are speakers registered. All right, are there any other items that alders would like to have excluded from the consent agenda? Seeing none, then we'll just uh, go through that one more time to make sure we're all on. Oh, Alder Hang to McKinney. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, is it also the time to be added to uh, one of the amendments that's before us? Yes, if you'd like to add your name. Okay, uh, for item number 51. 75287. I'd like to be added as a sponsor. The clerk will note that. Thank you, Alder. And uh, agenda item 19, I just have a question of staff. Is that appropriate at this time? Um, not. I mean, to be at. Yep. Uh, it's 1975264. It's I have a question of staff. So technically, Alder, we should exclude it. Um, is there objection to the Alder just asking a question with the consent agenda? Seeing no objection. Alder, go ahead and ask your question on item 19. I'm not sure if we have, it depends on, on what your question is. Go ahead, Alder. Okay, I'll ask it. And if there's no one to answer it, I can, I can withdraw it. Um, there was a five hundred thousand dollars of GOB, a uh, geo um, borrowing from the Gammon Road, um, uh, and I'm not looking at that right now because I'm in my car. Um, but I, I wanted to ask the staff that five hundred thousand dollars that's being switched from the Gammon Road area. Um, could they tell me whether uh, all of the repairs? related to storm water treatment, not treatment, but um, storm water uh, repairs has been completed? And what generated the $500,000 over budget? Thank you, Alder. I think we have uh, several folks from engineering here. Um, I see uh, Chris Petakowski. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, so this is uh, the, that project is completed, and uh, there was, um, uh, you know, we always budget a, a little bit more uh, extra just for ch change orders and if things might uh, uh, cost overruns. So we we had uh, five hundred thousand left in that account, um, and we're proposing to transfer that over to Atwood, where the bids came in and are over our budgeted amount. That answer your and question, so, Alder? Yes. So it's my understanding that all of the repairs that was allocated for that particular um, uh, engineering task have been completed. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Thank you very much. That answers my question. Thank you, Alder. Thank you, Chris. All right. Uh, then last chance for exclusion items. Seeing none, um, let me just go through. Uh, you'll note that we have uh, a couple of things different from the agenda on item nine in terms of referral dates. Um, and on item 40, we will be adopting the substitute. Items that are excluded tonight are items seven, eight, nine, 51, and 52. On the consent agenda, President Furman? Move adoption. Second. Moved and seconded to adopt the consent agenda. Uh, are there any additional questions? Is there any discussion? Is there any objection to recording a unanimous vote in favor of the consent agenda? Seeing no objection, we will adopt a unanimous vote in favor of the consent agenda. and. Um, can the tech staff make me a co-host at least so I can mute and raise and lower hands, please? Um, all right, so then we will go on to public comment, um, starting 
with number seven. I'm just refreshing to make sure that we've got everybody. On uh, agenda item seven, which is the second substitute amending sections within chapter 28 of the Madison General Ordinances to implement the new transit oriented development overlay district. Our first registrant is Liz Jesse of district 11 to be followed by William Okowitz to be followed by Wesley Marner. And if you're in the room, please come to one side of the dais or the other. If you're on Zoom, staff will unmute you. Do we have Liz Jesse? Yes, I'm here. Go ahead. Great. Good evening. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. My name is Liz Jesse, and I would like to go on record as being a Hill Farms resident that is in support of including historic districts in the TOD overlay zoning changes. I am a bike and a bus commuter. My partner and I rarely use our car. We mainly use bike transportation, but we also use the bus if the weather is too risky for bikes. When we moved to Madison in 2015, we selected Hill Farms for the great bike and bus connections. We did not know, nor do we care, that it is a historic district. We feel very lucky to be living along a BRT route, and I believe that more people moving to Madison should be given the opportunity to live here as well. I also consider myself an environmentalist. Yes, an environmentalist that currently lives in a single family home, but I see single family home neighborhoods really as a thing of the past. When we lived in a DC suburb, it was a mixed use neighborhood and it was rewarding on many levels. We lived in a townhouse, but there were also single family homes and apartment complexes in our neighborhood that were intermingled. Madison is growing. People wanna live here, which is fantastic for our city. We need more housing and we don't have more space. Higher density is going to happen all over our city, including neighborhoods that are historically single family dwellings. Lastly, I consider myself an advocate for transportation and housing equality, and I see this move to include historic districts as an equity issue. The pattern of single family zoning that dominates many of the historic districts is also linked to a history of exclusion. You can actually still see this history of exclusion in our historic district. For example, Residents of the Hill Farms who live in high density apartment buildings are allowed to pay dues, but they are not allowed to be voting members of our association. That privilege is restricted to those who live in detached housing. Opening up lots in these districts to building types other than detached single family homes also give more people an opportunity to live in these areas, which can help address historic inequalities. Also, current WISDOT numbers say that 30 to 40% of the Madison population doesn't drive. This opens up more housing options for carless citizens of Madison that want to live along BRT routes as well. You are going to hear and read many people complaining about the scope of the zoning change, that it splits our neighborhood in half because of the quarter mile overlay. Fine, let's take it further. I am confident that we will see similar zoning changes throughout the entire city in the next five to 10 years. This is just the start, right? People currently living in Madison and people moving to Madison need places to live and environmentally friendly ways to move around. You Building have about 20 seconds. Near, thanks. Building housing near transit will make it possible for us to achieve abundant housing and a better city. Please vote to include historic districts in the TOD zoning changes. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Our next registrant is William Okowitz of District 6 to be followed by... Wesley Marner to be followed by Anna Shen. Hello, my name is Will Ohovich and I'm a lead for Madison is for People. I'm here today to advocate for including historic districts in the transit oriented development overlay district. Uh, I sent an email to the All Alders email earlier today containing our petition, which had uh, 130 signatures supporting the inclusion of historic districts in the TOD overlay. I wanna talk a little bit more about that. Our petition focused on two things, equity and environment. The environment portion is straightforward. Transportation and especially private automobile usage is a major driver of greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. By making it easier to live near BRT and by removing parking minimums, two things that TOD does, we can reduce our city's carbon emissions. The equity section is maybe less obvious, um, but I want to talk a little bit more about that. Like Liz mentioned, 
Single family zoning is about a history of exclusion. And as we can see in editorials published in the Cap Times just a few days ago, which I'm sure many of you read, that legacy still continues. So much of the discussion around including historic districts in these overlay zonings has not been about the historic integrity of the buildings in those districts. It is about the demographics of the people who are going to move in if duplexes are built or if small apartment buildings are built. Watch any of the meetings and you'll see what I'm talking about. It is very much about excluding renters and about keeping these I'm going to use the word enclaves, might not be fair, but keeping these enclaves exclusive. What makes this all so ridiculous is how uh, just utterly, utterly low scale this change is. I mean, a duplex is two single family homes next to each other. They share a wall. That's all it is. Um, I, I'm sure many people in this room have lived in a duplex or a small apartment building and not turned into neighborhood mating maniacs who leave their trash on the lawns and shoot guns in the yard or whatever it is people are afraid of. Uh, I'm sure many of us continue to live in those kinds of neighborhoods. And yet we are still just good citizens of the city looking for a place to live, looking for a place to re rest our head at night when we get back from our jobs. If this was going to threaten BRT funding, I would say, obviously, it's not important enough to go through with it. But I think the entire framing of this discussion has shown that this is not about historic integrity of these districts. It is about exclusion. It is about keeping homes expensive, and it is about keeping renters out of neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you. Our next registrant is Wesley Marner of District 11, to be followed by Anna Shen, to be followed by Joseph Keyes. We have Wesley. Yes, hello, am I? There we go. Go ahead. Thank you. Good evening. I am Wes Marner. I'm a resident of District 11, and my home in University Hill Farms will be impacted if historic districts are included in the TOD zoning overlay. And I want to be completely clear up front. I am 100% in support of the TOD zoning, and I am 100% in support of including historic districts as part of this change. You all know Madison's growing fast. There's very little vacant land and housing, especially affordable housing, is in very short supply. And right now, at the outskirts of our metropolitan area, housing's being built by dividing farmland into subdivisions, we're building roads over prairies, and development outside our border is causing irreversible damage to our environment. As members of the Common Council, you've heard a lot from people about how bus rapid transit and the accompanying TOD overlay can mitigate damage from that development elsewhere. So I'm not gonna repeat any of that. What I do wanna talk about are the implications of voting no on including the historic districts in this plan. You know that implementing this TOD zoning is an equity issue. You know that Madison needs more housing in multifamily residential zones. So now think about the resistance that you've heard to TOD zoning. Yesterday's Cap Times opinion piece is an example. The author, who's a Hill Farms resident, says, quote, while the proposed overlay doesn't rezone my home, I'm concerned about the single family character of our neighborhood, end quote. I'll let you decide what single fam family character means. But my friends, no matter what the intent of that sentiment, its impact is to perpetuate exclusionary zoning that Hill Farms has enjoyed for nearly 70 years. Zoning laws, especially single family zoning laws, were originally created to exclude minorities and poor people from affluent white neighborhoods. Hill Farms and other neighborhoods like it have enjoyed privileged status in part because of this exclusionary zoning. If you vote to exempt historic districts from the zoning overlay, then you as a member of the common council are saying, you know what? It's okay to perpetuate the division of wealth in this city. It's okay to keep a certain neighborhood exclusive. It's okay to let a group of homeowners effectively lock others out of affordable housing in their area. I hope that's not a message you want to send. It's definitely not a message that I want to send as a member of this neighborhood or as a voter in this city. You've got an opportunity to make a statement here tonight about how every part of Madison should contribute to equitable housing moving forward. Don't lose the opportunity. Support bus rapid transit, support the transit oriented development and include the historic districts in the overlay. Thank you. Thank you. 
Your next registrant is Anna Shen of District 11, to be followed by Joseph Keyes, to be followed by Robert Proctor. Do we have Anna? Hello? Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Thank you for letting me speak. I have been a resident of Hill Farms for 42 years and raised three children here. I'm opposed to the TOD overlay as it currently stands because of its divisive effect on neighbors and neighborhoods, specifically splitting the Hill Farms neighborhood in half. I understand that there are good intentions to use TOD to provide better transit op options, increased and affordable housing, and increased diversity in our neighborhoods, regardless of whatever lip service there is for um, inclusion. The current limited and arbitrary scope of this TOD does very little to accomplish these goals and has the huge downside of dividing neighborhoods across the city. The city wants to promote neighborhoods. Why fragment them? As they say, the devil is in the details and the details of this plan are bad. Look at the zoning map. The dividing lines zigzag across the neighborhoods to maintain the narrowest possible rigid quarter mile boundary. The end result is that some neighborhoods are split in half while others have slivers here and there cut off. Next door neighbors with essentially identical houses in what, in what used to be a single neighborhood are suddenly different with respect for what they can expect for their houses. I'm dismayed that the plan splits in half hill farms, a cohesive neighborhood that has functioned as a single unit for over 60 years, where I was very happy to raise my children. If you want to talk exclusion, why are you excluding half the neighborhood and not the other half? I have sent pictures to council members showing across the city, 22 single orphan houses that have different zoning from the neighbors around them. I can't count the number of blocks where two or three houses are split off of, an, of the rest of the block. In Hill Farms, we only have one street with duplex zoning and the TLD splits that one street into 14 excluded and 26 included lots. What is the reason for that? Another example of the arbitrary nature of TOD is that unlike the BRT local service areas on Park Street and the Northeast side, the local service areas for BRT Route F are omitted from TOD. This includes areas north and south of University Avenue from Whitney Way West towards Middleton, that's Spring Harbor, and the Junction Ridge neighborhood west of Junction Road. The point is the narrow application of TOD overlay detracts from its pretty limited housing benefits and the way the boundaries are drawn is damaging to neighborhoods. Before you pass it, please fix it. Don't divide neighborhoods, blocks, and next door neighbors just to keep that quarter mile boundary. Include entire neighborhoods in the, and that's time. In the overlay. Thank you, Anna. Our next registrant is Joseph Keyes, to be followed by Robert Proctor, to be followed by Robert Johnson. We have Joseph Keyes from District 11. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. I oppose agenda item seven, second substitute, amending sections within chapter 28 of the Madison General Ordinances to implement the new transit-oriented development overlay district. I was chairperson for the University Hill Farms Neighborhood Plan, adopted January, 6, January 5th, 2016, <clears throat> excuse me, by this body. Our committee worked in concert with city staff to accommodate density required by future housing demands and to maintain the nature of the National Historic District. Through that process, Hill Farms planned for the addition of 2,000 apartments on the bus rapid transit route or within about a block of it within the Hill Farms neighborhood. Currently, Madison Yards is being completed with about 500 apartments. Glad Development has completed the Hamptons with 59 <clears throat> apartments and is building the Manchester with 72 apartments. Here though, phase three with about 600 apartments will be getting city approvals in the next couple months. The remaining apartments are in the conceptual phase. This massive development will help address the forthcoming housing need. However, the addition of a few duplex conversions contemplated in this ordinance 
will be of little help. Thus, high density development along with high capacity bus road, along, along a high capacity bus road is already taking place in hill farms without zoning rule changes. Again, thank you for allowing me to speak today. Thank you. All right, next registrant uh, is Robert Proctor of District 4, to be followed by Robert Johnson, to be followed by Lisa Flax. And I'm sorry, Robert Proctor is representing the Realtors Association of South Central Wisconsin. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm Robert Proctor, Government Affairs Director of the Realtors Association. The Realtors Association supports the creation of all types of housing, whether it is owner-occupied, rented, detached houses, row housing, duplexes, apartment buildings, or condominiums. The Realtors Association supports the inclusion of historic districts within the transit-oriented development overlay district to help address the city's housing crisis. We understand that many are concerned that adding density and renters will adversely affect their neighborhoods. We respect their concerns. Unfortunately, the realtors were one of the groups back in the 1920s and 30s that created single family zoning and restrictions with the misguided idea of protecting neighborhoods. That policy has had a very negative effect on the city. If adding density and renters destroyed neighborhoods or reduced the value of single family detached homes, the realtors would be the first to oppose such changes. Reality has shown that adding renters and reasonable density does not destroy neighborhoods and does not reduce the value of single family detached homes. Instead, adding duplexes, row houses, and multifamily buildings near Madison's job center and public transportation will bring economic opportunity to many that have been historically left out. The TOD overlay district is a very modest proposal. It is not going to radically transform these neighborhoods. Madison housing needs far outpace the creation of new housing and are going to continue to do so in the future. Madison needs to embrace incremental change like TOD to manage it. The city needs far more single family homes, but it is not a zero sum game. Density and renters are not the enemy of single family homes. We ask that you pass the proposed TOD overlay district and include historic districts within the overlay zoning. Thank you. Thank you. Our next registrant is Robert Johnson of District 12, to be followed by Lisa Flax, to be followed by Nicholas Davies. We have Robert Johnson. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, this is Robert Johnson. Uh, I'm in opposition and join all those who express their basis for opposition. I would join in those comments and leave it at that at this juncture. Thank you. Our next registrant is Lisa Flax of District 11 to be followed by Nicholas Davies to be followed by Dylan Burrell. Do we have Lisa? We do not have a Lisa Mayor, but we do have a Marshall Flax. Let's try that. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, it was unclear of how to get in, but this is Lisa Flax. Go ahead. As Marshall Flax. Thanks for this opportunity. From its onset, the TOD overlay excluded NRHD historic districts and public meetings were clear to communicate this exclusion. Part of the TOD planning process involved a section 106 review with the U.S. Department of Transportation. Based on the exclusion of local and NRHD districts, the 106 process was approved. It included a clarifying statement, which reads, if however, the TOD overlay includes historic districts, FTA may need to reassess the project. After the 90 day public comment period for TOD concerns had expired, the recommendation was made to city planners to make a change to include NRHDs in the TOD overlay. I have to ask if the intent of the TOD comprehensive plan was to include NRHDs, why was the opposite offered as a project description to the 106 review? And why was the decision to add NRHDs communicated to neighborhood groups after the opportunity to comment had passed? Those who will be impacted by zoning changes deserve the chance to be informed and comment based on facts and a transparent process. 
To be clear, these comments do not suggest a lack of willingness to make changes in order to keep Madison a fantastic, diverse place to live. More than 2,000 apartments, some of which are being built currently like the Madison Yards, are part of the stated goals in the Hill Farms Neighborhood Plan. The BRT, TOD, and inclusion of NRHDs and zoning changes are separate entities. The success of the BRT is not dependent on including NRHDs in the overlay. The mayor confirmed this in recent statements shared in a Cap Times article. The mayor said she supported the original proposal, which excluded historic districts, and is agnostic on the version that includes them. She added, I understand people's concern. I think ultimately the inclusion of historic districts is probably not that significant. At this point, it's up to the council. So I urge you to take a comprehensive look at what appears to you be have about 30 a seconds. transparent process and especially the impact on NRHDs and existing single family neighborhoods before voting on this issue. Thanks for your time and consideration on this very important decision. Thank you. Our next registrant is Nicholas Davies of District 15, to be followed by Dylan Burrell, to be followed by Eric Stanley Hamilton. Good evening. Uh, you can call me Nick, he, him, his. Um, replacing one housing unit with two is literally the most incremental densification possible. Throughout the months of staff work and committee hearings on this, my concern has been that this isn't enough. If you look at how unaffordable it would be to demolish your house and build it all over again in the same spot, demolishing a house to build a duplex isn't all that different. You certainly aren't going to do it for the quick cash. So allowing duplexes is already the most extreme compromise possible. And personally, I only begrudgingly accept it because I fully expect us to look back in a couple of years and wonder where all the duplexes are and find that we have to crank up the allowable density further before anything worthwhile will be built. I lived in the Hill Farms neighborhood for years during election season. I was that pesky guy knocking on doors during the Packers game. Uh, I lived in multi-unit housing and given that the neighborhood isn't in ruins yet, I think I can confidently say that I didn't ruin it. There's twisted irony that if this is passed tonight with Hill Farms included, which I hope it will be, the Hill Farms Neighborhood Association will retain the authority to review and reject proposed duplexes. So somehow I find myself arguing in favor of empowering a neighborhood association while that neighborhood association is arguing the opposite. You might think that no proposed duplex could ever fit in with your neighborhood character. Well, come on over to East Moreland sometime, and I'll have to point out the duplexes to you because I probably walked by them a dozen times before I noticed that they have two front doors. Thank you. Thank you. Our next registrant is Dylan Burrell of District 19, to be followed by Eric Stanley Hamilton, to be followed by Annie Jones. Hi, everybody. Am I coming through? You are. Hi, everyone. Uh, excuse me if I'm a, a little nervous sounding. Uh, this is my only second time speaking at one of these, but I would like to say I am totally in favor of including the historic districts in the uh, transit-oriented development plan um, map. Uh, as someone who has just purchased a home here in Madison after falling in love with the place after um, living here for two years as a renter, I... The city needs more housing uh, broadly. I have friends and coworkers who are all around my age, mid to late 20s, who work, uh, you know, salaried positions who can't afford to live anywhere even close to Madison. I have coworkers who commute from Beloit. And these are, you know, we speak about neighborhood character a lot, but the neighborhood character are the people who live in the neighborhoods. And if we exclude through, you know, uh, price or housing, yeah, housing prices, you lose a lot of that character. You lose a lot of the wonderful people who make this city such a wonderful place to be. And uh, the reason why I decided to, you know, put my money down and purchase a home here. Um, I had more, I can't remember now. Anyways, I'm totally in favor of um, more housing. Duplexes probably aren't enough, like the uh, previous person said. Uh, build more housing. Uh, I love this city. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next registrant is Eric Stanley Hamilton of District 6, 
to be followed by Annie Jones, to be followed by Tim Jones. We have Eric. That was me. Hello. Yes, good evening. Can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. I sounded so nervous. I had all these things to say and I completely forgot them. <laughs> oh. Am I coming through still? <laughs> go ahead, Eric. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, my name is Eric Hamilton and I am a resident of District 6, immediately adjacent to, but not within, the Third Lake Historic District. I support the transit-oriented district proposal, and I specifically support TOD, including local and national historic districts. These districts are some of the best areas in Madison. I believe it is valuable to provide additional housing in these districts so that more people who are moving to our great city have the opportunity to find a place to live in and experience these wonderful neighborhoods. Having TOD apply to local and national historic districts is one way to provide this opportunity. Additionally, it's my understanding that these districts already have many additional protections above and beyond zoning, from deed restrictions in Hill Farms to city preservation requirements in Third Lake and the other local historic districts. These additional restrictions will make it harder to achieve the goals of transit-oriented development, which is unfortunate. But they also mean that the zoning changes being discussed tonight will not significantly affect what buildings are allowed to be built in many areas of the historic districts. Put another way, we have the opportunity to provide for modest increases in density in the right areas of the city without affecting many homeowners in historic districts because of these additional restrictions. Including the districts remains important because there may be edge cases where the new zoning can welcome new residents with housing. And because it is important to signal to the rest of the city that Madison is committed to the process of sustainable development without unnecessary exclusions of particular neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you. Our next registrant is Annie Jones to be of District 11, to be followed by Tim Jones, to be followed by Thomas Wilson. Hello, Malvini Weak. I'm Annie Jones, no Wieswin. Hello, everyone. My name is Annie Jones, and I wanted to introduce myself in my Menominee language. I'm an enrolled member of the Menominee Nation. I'm doing so as a means to remind us that we are a native land. While indigenous people have occupied this land for an estimated 13,000 years, the city of Madison was established a mere 187 years ago in the Hill Farms neighbor neighborhood just 70 years ago. Think about how that environment and landscape of this place has changed by the introduction of good and not so good development in that amount of time. While I love living in Madison and particularly the Hill Farms neighborhood, I am a relative newcomer to the city of Madison having moved here in early 2015. In that short amount of time, I have seen the community endure some welcome and unwelcome changes. I have been disappointed by the seemingly endless urge to bulldoze and pave over oftentimes good development and replace it with an endless stream of cookie cutter development. I'm also a professor organization development and tribal nation specialist with UW. I spent the first two thirds of my career in Kenosha County working with the city and county planning departments on zoning agreements, comprehensive planning processes and brownfield redevelopments. Specifically, I specialized in facilitating dialogue, deliberation and public engagement processes. I know how these processes can help engage people with having a say in with what their neighborhood will look like in the future. And because of that experience, I can definitively say that people support that which they help create. I oppose the overlay in the University Hill Farms neighborhood because uh, in uh, late last year, we were assured that the historical districts like ours would be exempt from an overlay. I understood this in my mind and my mind was at rest. I didn't catch the blurb about the change in direction in the neighborhood newsletter. Public postings, after all, are not the same as public engagement. As a BIPOC person raised in duplexes and apartment buildings by a single mother in Kenosha's industrial neighborhoods adjacent to what are now brownfields, I take issue with how neighborhoods are being pitted against, neighbors are being pitted against one another and accused of nimbyism or even racism. Like many of my neighbors, I simply want to be part of the decision making that will impact our neighborhood for generations to come. The division the neighborhood is experiences is experiencing is a symptom of inadequate public engagement and an overlay that divides the neighborhood. Please remove the overlay tonight and invite us to the planning table tomorrow. Collectively, we are passionate because we love the neighborhood and the sense of place that we feel when we are at home there. Personally, I'm passionate about making sure that we have a say in what the neighborhood is like in the future, in this very place where my ancestors were given no say. 
I see a neighborhood that is welcoming of diverse voices who are actively involved and in conversations time. about increasing density, increasing access to public Thank you. transportation. That's your time. Thank you. All right, our next registrant is Tim Jones of District 11 to be followed by Thomas Wilson, to be followed by Janet Sharesco. Hello. If you look at the satellite view of the city, you will see a large swath of rooftops and cement that run along University Avenue. You will notice a similar area along Mineral Point Road. The space between them is green. This is Hill Farms neighborhood. The TOD overlay rezoning with respect to Hill Farms splits our neighborhood. A close look at the TOD rezoning overlay with respect to each home that is affected and the neighbors that aren't will point out how inconsistent the rezoning will be. Don't think a quarter mile. Look at the homes affected, how it zigzags. It's embarrassing. The TOD overlay rezoning is also inconsistent with the downtown. They said there is no need, that it would be redundant, or that it is already being followed. Yet they want to add historic neighborhoods for consistency. <laughs> this makes no sense. Auxiliary units or granny flats are already allowed under current zoning regulations. We don't need more duplicate regulations or regulatory bodies. I think most have agreed, if approved, the TOD rezoning is almost sure to increase the property values of those most affected. That's nice if you want to sell or redevelop. We don't, we hope to stay. Adding duplexes with absentee landlords is not in the best interest of our neighborhoods. I recommend a no vote as written, either include all in the neighborhood or none. Don't separate our neighborhood and don't make exclusions. Thank you. Thank you. Our next tradition is Thomas Wilson of District 13 to be followed by Janet Sharesco to be followed by Rachel Fields. Well, good evening. Um, I'm here to express my support for implementing the TOD overlay as passed by the Transportation Policy and Planning Board and Plan Commission, uh, including the historic districts in that overlay. Um, I'm really happy to see this legislation as it is an important piece of a much bigger picture. Uh, the city has done a lot of great work over the past several years, implementing changes to our transportation system, tackling the root causes of the housing crisis and responding to the threat of climate disruption. Good examples of this work include BRT, the Metro Network redesign, zoning changes around ADUs, complete streets, Vision Zero, and the list goes on. Uh, each piece moved forward, strengthens those other pieces, and reinforces the whole, making a safer, more resilient, and inclusive city. I live about a block from the edge of the overlay in an older neighborhood, uh, very close to campus, and I want more duplexes, triplexes, and other types of housing. I want a diverse neighborhood. Some of the best neighbors I've ever had in the last 10 years that I've lived here we're renters, including undergraduate students. I know it's a separate issue on your agenda, but I also support updating the family definition and doing away with those exclusionary rules. I've been following a lot of the conversation around this topic for the past few months, and um, I, historic preservation and the family definition have really been weaponized against renters to keep certain types of people out of certain parts of the city, largely by folks who, who have theirs and don't want to share, even if sharing won't affect what they have. Um, I also read the uh, Cap Times article from a couple of days ago um, from the Cap Times editor, and it was really disturbing. Some of the language in there is literally straight out of the MAGA, build the wall playbook, and it's quite shameful. Uh, these so-called zoning protections were discriminatory when they were made. They're discriminatory now. They cause a whole host of problems for our city, and it's time to let them go. Please support this overlay, including the historic districts. We all know it doesn't change the rules around building facades. It's just being used by people who want to kill or water down the legislation. Support the changes to the family definition and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Our next registrant is Janet Shresko of District 5, to be followed by Rachel Fields, to be followed by Marcy Fritz Newbury. Hello? Hello. Uh, yes. Um, so I live in District 5. I'm not in the historic district, but I think that um, there's been a bait and switch, and I would not want the historic district included in the overlay. But um, an issue that's not been brought up is that uh, housing, which is in with, within a half a mile of the university is extremely attractive to students. And um, taking a single family house and making into a duplex is not necessarily expensive depending on the floor plan. 
um, with the proposed family definition change. Also, a single family house right now could, without any zoning changes at all, have become a duplex plus an ADU um, with up to five unrelated adults in each of those three units, 15 people. Um, the university is very short on housing and the rental housing that they get from um, Edgewood College and Madison College um, is further away than um, the older houses across university that are included in the TOD overlay. Um, and um, it's a unique situation. Opening up a house to be rented by 10 to 15 um, well-heeled students does not make it more affordable. It does not make it more diverse. Um, students are um, over are less diverse body, both economically and racially than um, Madison as a whole. Um, I find it a little bit disingenuous to say, well, housing is expensive in Madison, so let's make these in allow people to make duplexes with, um, because that will not lower the price of housing. It will lower the quality of life for people who are already there because um, it takes frankly a lot of love and effort to maintain a 90 year old house, um, even if it's not um, up to standards of historic district designation. Um, and um, you're comp you will be um, having five, 10 and 15 people competing um, or um, paying rent when, um, which puts houses further out of rent of um, normal working people. Um, it's, it's, um, it makes it more discriminatory, not less. And um, really the, um, whatever, um, whatever bad motivations people had a hundred years ago um, should not allow the university's housing problems to be put on the back of people living in relatively modest houses. You have about 30 seconds left. Who were, um, who bought those houses as, as we did recently with the expectation that it was a single family neighborhood. Um, every university town that we have ever lived in, the areas which are not zoned single family near universities have, um, um, disintegrated a lot. And that's time. Um, thank you. Thank you. Our next registrant is Rachel Fields of District 13 to be followed by Marcy Fritz Newbery to be followed by Nathan Newbery. Hello, uh, this is Rachel. I'm speaking in support of the TOD zoning change and in support of including historic districts in the change. I think TOD will help us tackle the housing crisis, increase access to transit, impact climate change, and make our city more accessible and diverse. And frankly, the only opposition I see to it is related to neighborhood character, which I think just means I don't want things to change. And I think buying a home gives me the right to control everything around my home as well. And frankly, I think some of the people speaking on this issue have never had to contend with the current prices of Madison housing, which are totally inaccessible even to young people with good salaries. Um, living next to a duplex rather than a single family home is not a meaningful sacrifice, neither is living next to a five story building rather than a four story one. And these sacrifices are especially minor compared to not being able to afford to live here because rent for a one bedroom is $2,000 a month or having to move your family to a distant suburb without transit because you can't afford an apartment near transit. So I would just encourage the all alders to think about what is really important for the city, which is tackling our housing crisis and vote in support of this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next registrant is Marcy Fritz Newbery of District 6 to be followed by Nathan Newbery to be followed by Cheng Wu. Marcy, we, I see you unmuted. But we're not hearing you. You may be muted on your end. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Um, so I am Marcy Fritz and I'm at the very edge of where this TOD overlay will impact. We're on Mary Street where we have, I think, a more specific and unusual situation. But when you have one unusual situation, I'm not quite sure that will be the only unusual situation. Um, I'm for uh, more affordable housing, all of the things that hopefully this will impact and support. Um, unfortunately, with my work with families in the community, 
Um, just because you add more housing units doesn't necessarily mean more housing is available to those that are most marginalized. And so I think we're simplifying some of those pieces of this. I do not support this because of the specific situation that um, will result in impacting of 222 Mary Street, which is a very um, concerning complex already sitting on the Yahara River. Um, this building has already been uh, talked about in other city planning sessions and addressed with the massive flooding that has been happening around the Yahara. And it seems like um, with this TOD overlay, the uh, decisions that were currently made by the Planning Commission and um, Common Council, which rejected an increase in density here, this will open up an opportunity for the uh, owners of this large complex to then expand where it was already rejected in another area. And like I said, when you open up a situation like this and we have one anomaly, it makes me wonder if there are anomalies like this in other areas. Um, so I would like to continue being able to review this. Um, so I do not support this right now. Thank you. Thank you. Our next registrant is Nathan Newbery of District 6, to be followed by Cheng Wu, to be followed by Taylor Kokonis. Nathan's not available. Sorry, that was my okay. husband. Thank you. <laughs> so then our next registrant is Cheng Wu from District 19, to be followed by Taylor Kokonis, to be followed by Ann Walker. Hi, thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm speaking in favor of transit-oriented development and the inclusion of historic districts because Madison suffers from an affordable housing shortage. I agree with a lot of the arguments brought forward in favor of um, including historic districts in TOD, TOD zones already. I also agree with the point raised by a previous speaker that was against the, the agenda item, um, that TOD isn't going to fix all the problems regarding housing inventory and affordability but I think that it should be one of one part of many policies that can help put us in the right direction. Because if I demand lots of young families are being priced out of both home ownership and rentals, um, being forced out of town, being forced to live on the edge of town um, and having to own a car and commute and all of the costs that come with that. Um, as many have stated before me, this proposal is really incremental, simply allowing for duplexes and um, I'm in support of it. Please vote to include historic districts in the TOD zoning changes. Thank you. Thank you. Our next registrant is Taylor Kokonos of District 15 to be followed by Ann Walker to be followed by Becky Parmentier. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Taylor Kokinos. Uh, I'm in District 15 uh, over by Ulbrick Park. i uh, just give you a rough idea where I'm at. Um, we live, my wife and I, in a detached single-family home. Um, we basically don't drive. We own a car and haven't touched it in four weeks. We use bus and bike as our primary means of transit, like some other people who have spoken this evening. Um, I'm emphatically in favor of the TOD overlay, including, including historic districts in the overlay. Um, my reason for supporting including historic districts is uh, somewhat different from other people's approach. Um, if you look at a map of the now defunct streetcar lines that Madison used to have before the advent of so much shift to automobile infrastructure, um, the overwhelming majority of Madison's historic districts are already essentially transit oriented. They were built around streetcar lines in walkable neighborhoods and the 15 minute community concept. Um, so including all of these districts, except for perhaps some of the newer historic districts like Hill Farms in the TOD overlay in a way restores the zoning code to the spirit of how these neighborhoods were built in the first place. Um, additionally, some of the nuances in the TOD zoning changes, like removing parking minimums for single family homes and in doing other things to just increase the value that we derive from the land in our city, um, I'm emphatically in support of as well. This isn't just about you know, allowing people to add an addition to their home to convert it to a duplex or to, um, you know, raise a decrepit house and build a, a duplex in its place, but to instead, um, you know, hopefully start to incrementally improve the density of the city in places where land is underutilized and could be a place for a person and not a place for 
an automobile, especially if we have the opportunity to get those people to their destinations through the bus rapid transit program. Hopefully future transit incentives are fantastic and ever improving bicycle network. Um, you know, the city doesn't need to encourage urban sprawl, especially outside of its borders. Madison is full. We have very few urban infill opportunities that involve massive new developments. So the urban infill opportunity we have is the lots as they stand essentially right now with some very small, you know, opportunities around the margins. About 30 um, seconds left. Uh, so I'll to wrap up my point, I'm emphatically in support of um, applying this, including to historic districts, both to drive up our density and hopefully to start to drive down some of our car dependence. Thank you. Thank you. Our next registrant is Ann Walker of District 6, to be followed by Becky Parmentier, to be followed by Eric Puschel. Good evening. I live on um, Winnebago Street across from the Yahar River. I have a real appreciation for mass transit and I support bus rapid transit. I also have a real appreciation for how many times my neighborhood has flooded in the past and the likelihood that it will continue to do that in the future. Cities look to other cities and often repeat those models. It's sort of a paint by numbers approach and I'm not saying that disrespectfully. Right? There are certain tried and true ways, ways to do things. So cities often locate info close to their downtowns and universities, our airports, and our highways. This paint-by-numbers approach, though, does not necessarily excel at factoring in things that are unique to an area. And one of the things that's really unique about the East, East, East Isthmus is our topography, how low the land is, how high the water table is, how close we are to lakes and the Yahar River, and how paved over we are, and how much we flood. So my question is, is the best place to build more infill in areas that are prone to flooding? Isthmus neighborhoods are also quickly gentrifying. What is mostly built these days are efficiencies and one bedrooms at market rates. I think an important point to consider is not only who we are adding to our neighborhoods, but who we are losing and who's being pushed out of our neighborhoods. Several times over the last several um, decades, Tenny Lapham and the Market neighborhood have had to fight to keep our schools open. And I have a question of, of if one bedrooms and efficiencies are the right fit to keep our schools robust. I do not believe that the overlay at present adequately addresses these issues. The overlay in its current form, I believe, will exacerbate flooding, affordability issues, and has the potential to weaken our school system. So while I very much support BRT, I do not support the overlay agenda item seven at present. Thank you. Thank you. Our next registrant is Becky Parmentier from District 6, to be followed by Eric Puschel, to be followed by Viria Excellus. Do we have Becky? Okay. Hi, this is Becky. Thanks for um, letting me have the chance to talk. I am a resident at 222 Mary Street, um, the anomaly that was mentioned. I've lived here for 12 years. Um, there's 22 people, uh, 22 families in the building, several of them with children. Um, this is a building that has been uh, constantly uh, has been threatened to um, be built up from its 36 unit um, capacity right now to and this proposal, which I am against, would change it to a 60 unit um, building. If anybody knows this area, uh, yeah, the Yahara River opens up to the lake and this, this building sits right on the Yahara. Um, it's frequented by school children, commuters, lots of people, hundreds and hundreds of people every day, as well as the flooding issues. Um, that people have mentioned. It's flooded here more than half the years that I've been here. Um, I'm against it because I believe that this 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 neighborhood, this area is an exception and it should be protected. It um, It is an environmental treasure for Madison and I believe that a five-story building would hurt all of Madison, uh, the people who use it, uh, cause more light pollution, hurt the animals in the in the neighborhood. Um, lots of lots of reasons. Um, one way around this is to change the 
zoning from the TRU2 to TRV2, which I would support. And um, it has been um, determined that the correct density for this unit would be in a low density LDR. Um, both the plan commission and the common council rejected an increase in uh, density several times. And we just keep having to um, fight to keep this um, area protected. Um, also, the Mary Street is a very small street, lots of traffic, very difficult to get out onto uh, Winnebago. Uh, it's a bus route, a major bus route, and already the congestion is very terrible, and it is an, um, has been considered unsafe at times for even the school children walking because... You have about 30 seconds left. People are going very fast on this street. I, I can't imagine where they would put the parking. It has been proposed to do underground parking. I can't imagine what would happen to the river if that were the case. It just seems like a really bad idea. Thank you so much. And again, I'm against this for those reasons. Thank you. Our next registrant is Eric Puschel of District 7, to be followed by Vyra Axelis, to be followed by Darren Wasninski. Do we have Eric? Good evening. Um, thanks for the opportunity to, to chip in my two cents. Uh, I support this agenda item. I think it's a good first step. I think the city staff has put together a package of changes that should increase the number of people who can take advantage of the BRT. These policy changes are sensible, not just within the context of the BRT corridor, but many of them would be beneficial throughout the city. Uh, it's only good financial sense to put people in proximity to the infrastructure and amenities that we are paying for with our taxes uh, to ensure that those are being used to their full capacity. And I hope that in the future, our alders will have the foresight to extend this kind of overlay to other amenities and infrastructure, whether those be walkable commercial districts, grocery stores, multi-use paths, other transit routes or parks. Um, you know, Madison is in a housing crisis already. It's projected to grow even more rapidly in the future. And that's not surprising. It's a great place to live. It's a center for employment. Uh, but it means that we're going to have to continue to have these conversations about infill and upzoning. This is a very gentle upzoning. Any infill will be on a parcel by parcel basis at the discretion of the property owners. Um, if I have any concerns about this, it's that these changes don't go far enough. And I would really encourage council members in the future to push more aggressively for infill and upzoning. Um, it takes time for those changes to be translated into the housing units. And I think that um, we, we're already behind. So that's, the, that's all I have to say about that. Um, so I encourage you all to, to vote in support of this. Thank you. Thank you. Our next registrant is uh, Vyra Axelis of District 19, to be followed by Darren Wasninski, to be followed by Margaret Porco. Vyra, uh, it looks like you need to unmute yourself on the phone. It's star six to unmute. Yes, hello. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, hi. My name is Vyra Axelis, and I appreciate uh, the, the opportunity to speak up at the meeting. Thank you for that. Um, I would, however, oppose item number seven, implementation of the transit-oriented development overlay district. I feel that the very fabric and heritage of our beloved neighborhoods need to be kept intact and protected. Single family zoning should be left intact for all people of all races, no matter what. The right to own private property should be protected. The joy of owning a single family home, the pride in maintaining a home and a yard should not be denied to anyone. 
we lived in a neighborhood and currently do also where there are many different people that live here, whites, blacks, Hispanics, people from India, people from Asia, Tibet. It's just wonderful. So they're all single family homes. This proposal slightly reeks of Marxism and even communism and shows leanings towards the concept of the 15 minute city where people are packed in like sardines. So please don't try to fix something that isn't broken and may the Lord protect our right to single family home ownership. Thank you. Thank you. Our next registrant is Darren Wisniewski, um, District 4, representing AARP of Wisconsin, to be followed by Margaret Porco, to be followed by Bonnie Rowe. Hey, I'm oh, Darren oh. Wisniewski, Associate State Director of Community Outreach for AARP Wisconsin, and a resident of District 10 in the city of Madison. AARP is a nonpartisan, nonprofit nationwide organization that helps empower people to choose how they live as they age strengthens communities and fights for issues that matters most to families, including issues that support the creation and preservation of livable communities. And on that note is why I'm here this evening. A livable community has affordable and appropriate housing, supportive features and services, and adequate mobility options for people, regardless of age and ability. ARP applauds the overall direction of the proposed plan along Madison's soon to be implemented bus rapid transit route and high frequency bus routes to include TOD. We especially appreciate the broad scope of the efforts uh, that the outreach of the planning department has made. Wisconsin Department of Transportation estimates that over 30% of Wisconsin uh, Madison residents are non-drivers. This number is sure to grow in coming years as research shows that the typical person outlives their ability to drive by eight to 10 years. TOD, um, we believe proactive members such as measures such as TOD work to ensure every person's right to mobility. We are a proud collaborator with Madison as part of the AARP network of age-friendly states and communities. And in this capacity, we come out and support the proposed TOD legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Our next registrant is Margaret Porco of District 11, to be followed by Bonnie Rowe, to be followed by Linda Lenhertz. Do we have Margaret? Mayor, there is no Margaret in the attendees. Okay, thank you. Our next registrant is Bonnie Rowe of District 11, to be followed by Linda Lenhertz, to be followed by Blake. Good evening, Mayor and members of the Common Council. I want to start out by saying that I don't oppose development or increasing our density. We are a growing city without much undeveloped land and people need places to live. And I'm particularly passionate about development that encourages ownership. Single family homes, duplexes, row houses, condos, townhomes. I want every adult in our city to have the opportunity to own a home if they want to, to begin to build generational wealth that they can pass on. It's a way out from under disparate systems of the past. My concerns are with the underhanded way that I feel the city has handled the historic districts. Mayor, I was in the town hall meeting back in October where you spoke about the rapid projected growth of our city and the transit oriented districts. And I heard with my own ears when Ben Zellers of planning stood up and said that the historic districts would be excluded from this overlay. City staff originally recommended excluding the historic districts from this plan, and they were excluded initially. But now with the backing of the Transportation Policy and Planning Board and the Plan Commission, four alders are recommending historic districts be included back into the zoning changes. To those making this a race and equity issue and trying to guilt shame alders on this vote, you should understand that this TOD overlay is not going to fix the problems that you're claiming it will fix. We need to find other options and we need to have a city that's accountable, transparent and responsible to work with the residents, with our neighborhood planning organizations and to work in conjunction with each other to make this the best city it can be for all residents. I urge you to vote no tonight on the overlay districts until this issue is resolved and can move forward in the future. Thank you for your time. 
Thank you. Our next registrant is Linda Lenhertz of District 6, to be followed by Blake, to be followed by Michael Zenz. Mayor, there is no Linda in the attendees. Right, and we have a... Yes. Linda often calls in via phone, so... Uh, might be a phone number. For oh, Linda let's Lenhertz. try this one. Okay. Linda, is that you on the phone? Yes, hello. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I'm opposed to the, the TOD overlay. Instead of creating growth according to the comprehensive plan, the TOD creates growth, growth where the bus service will be provided, and bus service is being provided where there is already density. Density in those areas will likely increase, further reinforcing where bus service is going to be provided. Um, what's the city going to look like in 10 or 25 years? Certain parts will get bigger buildings and become even denser. People will be warehoused in CCT buildings, large buildings of 100 units with no usable living space. And there's no plans for increased parks. Although some people may be happy in that environment, many are not. And in particular, such places are not often very family friendly. In my opinion, there's lots of issues with the TOD and implementation of the TOD on a large scale could have unintended consequences in many areas. In particular, the city has recognized, quote, by right development may create adverse impacts on sensitive neighborhoods and populations, potentially impacting existing affordable housing, end quote. So why not take this more slowly? Implement TOD along the BRT east-west route and see how it works. In particular, the places to implement it would be along the East Washington, northeast of Milwaukee Street and the Odana area. These are the neat areas in most need of density. The other bus routes were created based on existing densities and so should do just fine and could be added at a later date once any kinks have been worked out. And I also think, note that though not directly on point, former farmland should be developed at an average density greater than five or six units per acre. Um, Blackhawk has five point something as compared to the Isthmus that has a density of 22 units per acre. And exclude historic districts. These areas are not that large and federal funding could be at risk. There has not been an official opinion as to whether the federal funding for BRT is at risk. And as Tom Lynch told Plan Commission, the person he talked to didn't think so, but somebody further up the food chain might take a different opinion. Um, despite what was said by some earlier this evening, excluding historic districts is not an equity issue. The Isthmus has a lot of intermixed residential properties, single to some of the single properties rent out, and it also has many large apartment buildings. If we want to talk equity, let's talk about Blackhawk. More recent and ongoing development at five units per acre, a median price around seven hundred thousand, and, and that's it's covered time. by restricted governments, including a requirement for. Thank you, Linda. Garages. That's your time. Thank you. Our next registrant is Blake of District Twelve, to be followed by Michael Zenz. Mayor, there is not a Blake in the attendees. We, we've got Blake in the room. <laughs> and oh, you, pardon me. You can actually go to either side for future reference. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Hello, my name is Blake. I'm a citizen living in District 12. I'm also running for Aldermanic District 12. Um, Thank you, Barbara, for representing us today here. Um, I'm calling, uh, I'm speaking to uh, be in support of this agenda item. Uh, I don't speak for everyone in District 12, but I did speak to many of them over the weekend. I spoke to my neighbors and they all agreed this is a great way to improve Madison and preserve green spaces. This is a very gentle tool that the city has available to it to improve housing in the city, housing affordability, and access to city services. Thank you. Thank you. Our next registrant is Michael Zenz of District 12. Uh, hi, everybody. So um, I think this actually is a pretty simple issue. 
Um, so I live in Eakin Park, um, and we're going to get um, you know, very good transit service, just like um, every other place along the BRT and along the high uh, frequency routes. And so the deal is that you know, if you're on one of these routes, then you're going to have higher density to help produce the ridership for that route. So I'm going to get uh, you know, uh, zoning that's higher density in my, at my uh, house. And so it seems reasonable that other people would too, right? And so in particular, one thing that um, is a little odd to me is that we have the east-west route of BRT that got all this infrastructure, the new buses, and the north-south route has not yet and may never, right? So if federal funds don't come through, we might never get that um, extra funding. And so how can you explain to the people on the north-south route that they will get the TOD overlay and yet the people in the historic districts um, especially at Hills Far Phil Hill Farms, uh, will not, right? So um, I support the, the second substitute. I think this is a great thing to do. It's the fairest uh, way to do this. And I, I just don't see how you can justify um, giving TUD overlay to the rest of the city and not the historic districts. So the, the final thing is that um, zoning uh, is not an issue of historic uh, preservation, right? There are duplexes in uh, 60s suburbs, right? There's lots of them, um, just like in my district, just like in my neighborhood, which is built in the 30s and 40s. Um, so I, I just don't understand that, right? So I think the fairest thing to do is just to um, do the TOD overlay uh, with a certain distance from um, high frequency routes, which is what this does, and then everyone will have the same deal. Thanks. Thank you. Those are all the registrants we have wishing to speak tonight. Are there questions for any of the registrants on item seven? Uh, Alder Madison. Yes, I just wanted to ask if I can ask for Annie to be able to finish the last few things that you, I believe it's Annie that you were going to share, if that's okay. Yep. Annie, if you want to come back and, and finish. I was almost done. Um, I was saying that I see a neighborhood that is welcoming of diverse voices who are actively involved in conversations about increasing density, increasing access to public transportation, maintaining a historic neighborhood feel, and protecting the environment. I'm not, uh, I'm, my opposition is about um, public participation and uh, being led to believe one thing in October and then um, having something else presented to us now. And I think that the neighborhood opposes, the, the opposition from the neighborhood is because of, um, because of that and because of the neighborhood being divided and being sort of pitted against one another. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alder Benford. Thank you, Mayor. I had a question for Linda Leonard. Said like, uh, just like a lot of folks, she was cut off. But I last I heard was Blackhawk, and I'd like her to be able to finish her comment, please. We have Linda still on the line. Yes, I'm still here. Um, my comment is that this. Um, TOD is going to create density along the old parts of the city, and yet all of these new developments that are coming through, like Blackhawk, um, have very low densities. Blackhawk has a density of, of five dwelling units per acre, and prices are around 700000 for a new house. And people are talking about Hill Farms. It's not fair to leave them out but yet their houses are much more affordable. Their median sales price is 400, their median assessed price is about 430,000 compared to Blackhawk 700,000. So I don't quite understand this push in one way to be creating the TOD on the old parts of the city and leaving all the fringe and continuing to develop the fringe at low densities. Thank, Thank you, you Linda. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Alder. Thank you. Are there any other questions for registrants on item seven? 
Alder Paulson? Yeah, I was wondering if we had uh, Joe Keys still with us. Is Joe Keys with us still? It uh, looks like, yes. Yes, I'm here. Yep, go ahead. Uh, Joe, my understanding is that you have, uh, are or have been on the chair of the Architecture Review Board for Hill Farms. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about what the uh, Architecture Review Committee, I'm sorry, Architecture Review Committee uh, does with Hill Farms. What we do is we ensure, well, the uh, power to review the Architecture Review or the Covenants was given to us by the by the University of Wisconsin, which developed this property. And what we do is for folks who are making changes to their houses, making additions, changing the footprint of the house, uh, we look at that and see that it, it, it conforms to the covenants, the setbacks, and the architectural style. We also, uh, just over the weekend, I received a, a a note for someone who was putting solar panels on their house. I wanted to make sure that that, was, that would be informative. And we looked at that and said that was. Uh, it was nicely done. It was flat panels on the roof. So that's the kind of thing that we look at. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for registrants on item 7? If not... Then we'll go on to public comment on item eight. Item eight is creating sections of the Madison General Ordinances to change the zoning of property at 310 to 322 East Washington. Our first registrant is Catherine Pensack of District 6 to be followed by Cade Jackson. Do we have Catherine? Yes, hello. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak. I'd like to thank everybody that's here and especially the city council and all the members of the city staff. Um, I, while I'm on this, thank you, Benj. I was really excited to see that you are putting together a building energy savings program. I'm very much concerned with the environment and I'm speaking here as just an individual resident of Madison. I love Madison and I've been very concerned with you know environmental uh, our environmental future, which relates to uh, this building 310 to 322 East Washington, the project that is being considered uh, tonight in some regard. I tried to see whether I would support or oppose it. And I looked through all the, all the uh, applications and, and descriptions of the property. And I can't find anything that really relates to how sustainable it is. Is there anybody's asked them a question of whether they're doing anything to you know, reduce the CO2 impact? You know, buildings like this, it's going to be a big building, 130 units, eight stories, eight to 10 stories. It's going to use a lot of energy. This hopefully will be up for decades. So the more sustainable it is, it's going to have a huge impact on our city. And I, I as, a, as just a regular citizen looking at the forms, I can't figure out if they're really doing anything to be sustainable or not. So I'm wondering, has anybody ever asked them? And do you, as alders, ask this question? When, when someone comes into your office promoting a, proposing a project to begin with? And where would we know what, what it is that they're, what they're doing? Now, this project is on East Wash and just a few blocks up the street, Baker's Place is going in and they made it clear that they wanted to be as energy neutral as possible. It's actually done by a group called the Neutral Project, which is trying to do neutral CO2 ne negative uh, or zero, uh, impact buildings. So um, I think that's a great project. They're doing it to make money. It's a commercial project. It's a large project. This can be done. This other project is just a few blocks away. What are they doing? I have no idea. So I hope that you will consider asking them. I do remember hearing one of the alders say one time that they want to see everything that comes through their office through an environmental lens. That's the term used, environmental lens that the alder used. I hope you'll all do that. I hope you'll get it in writing. I hope you'll ask. If you don't ask, it seems like we don't care. I think we all care. I trust all of you guys. You're working hard. So please ask and please write it down. Let us find out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next registrant is Kate Jackson of District 2, representing Avalon Cooperative. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. 
Hi, yeah, so my name's Kay Jackson. I'm representing Avalon Cooperative, which is a house on Franklin Street, which is just one block away from the proposed development. Um, and the eight of us here are in opposition to the development, um, but not because we don't like a lot of the aspects of the plan, but because we want the developers and the folks at St. John Lutheran's Church to push their vision further for affordable housing and community space. Um, so when we heard about this development, we were all bracing ourselves for another luxury high rise, like the one that we fought unsuccessfully at the end of our block. And we were relieved to hear that there is an alternate model for housing and community space uh, in the neighborhood. Um, but we think that the plan could be better and help set a precedent for what development can look like. Um, so right now, the plan says that there's 108 rooms or 83% of the building that will be affordable housing for folks who earn less than 60% of Dane County median income. Um, but I think another marker could be, will the people who maintain the building be able to afford it? So in other words, um, what are the wages of the people cleaning the building and will they themselves be able to move in? I think that should be a marker, one marker, one possible marker of affordability. Um, and we want to make sure that the building is essentially not affordable just in name only, but that the standards meet the needs of the people for housing. Um, a further concern is that a 10 story building further sets a precedent for high rises replacing more buildings on East Washington. I think the one on our block is just sort of the beginning of this. Um, and as a resident, I think part of the, the joy of living in this area uh, of Madison is the way that it still feels like a neighborhood. Um, so as an alternate idea, we are proposing that we make the building eight stories instead of 10 and be 100% affordable housing. Uh, this way that affordable housing units would not be last. Um, and I want to emphasize that affordable housing would also include units for families and not just one bedroom or two bedroom. I think other people in this meeting have noted that part of gentrification in Madison is um, making one bedroom, two bedroom spaces and not spaces for families. Um, and as a final note, I just want to say in the de decision making uh, process of this, I think there could be more engagement with the community and what kind of developments are wanted. Um, as someone born and raised in Madison, I've seen the city change a lot and have often felt angry and powerless about the ways Madison has developed to ac accommodate growth, um, but not accommodate the people who actually live here. And I think others have said in the meeting, um, I think something to consider for this development or further developments is thinking about the housing crisis in Madison and the growing density. Um, but are we creating housing for the projected numbers or for people who currently live here, people who are currently un unhoused or facing losing housing? Um, and then just as a final note, I want to add that there are other models of community and affordable and that's housing. Time. Thank you. Thank you. That's your time. Um, our last registrant on this item is Mark Binkowski um, of District 4, representing St. John's Lutheran Church. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Appreciate uh, your consideration of this project. I am representing St. John's on the redevelopment of their property. They have been on the site for 160 years, if you want to jump to the next slide. Uh, and the history of St. John's has really been about reinventing themselves to better serve their mission and their community. And so their building has gone through a remarkable number of changes in their history. And this project is the latest iteration of that. And if you jump to the next slide, um, as we've talked about, the project has 130 units. 110 of those will be set aside for those making less than 60% of AMI. Uh, we do have 15% of the units at market rate. Uh, those rates are lower than what you would see in a traditional fully market rate building. That is actually something that WIDA uh, incentivizes. They like to see mixed income projects so that you don't have just uh, certain buildings for affordable housing and certain buildings for market rate housing. It also provides opportunities if a resident were to uh, get a new job or potentially have a roommate or a spouse, a uh, partner. Uh, it provide, and, you know, were to no longer be income qualified, it provides them an opportunity to stay in the building and in the community that they're a part of. Uh, we have uh, uh, pursued a number of sustainable initiatives. Uh, we are looking at uh, having some passive solar on the roof. Uh, we are working with Focus on Energy to achieve 20% energy use intensity savings over baselines. 
Uh, we have green roofs on multiple levels. So doing a number of things here to try and be as sustainable as possible uh, while recognizing some of the constraints we have from a cost perspective and making the economics of affordable housing work. So I know St. John's has been talking about this for many years. They are very excited about the opportunity to bring this project to life. Uh, we have the support of both the city and the county with affordable housing funds, and we'll be making our WIDA application next week. So I appreciate your, uh, your consideration of this exciting project. Thank you. Thank you. That is the last registrant I have on item eight. Are there questions for any of the registrants on item eight? Alder Curry. Thank you. Um, sorry for you sitting down, but I have a question for Mark. Or not, I'm sorry, I got your name wrong, didn't I? Yep, no, Mark. Okay. Yep. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Mark, for the little presentation. Um, are the, you said that the market rate apartments would be lower than um, compatible in the city. Are they lower, higher, equivalent to like fair market rent for our area? They are priced at what would be considered, you know, fair market per WIDA standards. But for example, the two bedroom market rate units right now, we are looking at uh, $2,200 a month. Um, we have, you know, you can find two bedroom units um, near downtown in this location that, you know, range from 25 to 3,000 a month in certain buildings. And so uh, they are significantly above the income restricted levels, of course, um, but we would consider those rents as being lower than a comparable fully market rate property. Thank you. Um, follow up question for that then for the 30% units or let's say hypothetically there be a, a applicant that has zero income. What would you say that would fall into your 30% units? I mean, I don't know if I have a good answer for you. You know, zero income is challenging. We are working with um, the housing services consortium. We have five units that will be uh, set aside for referrals from HSC. And we have another, I believe it's eight units that will be uh, set aside for veterans experiencing homelessness in, and working with uh, HUD's VASH program for referral. So we do have a number of those set aside units for people uh, you know, currently experiencing homelessness. And then we have 30%, 50%, and 60% set aside units. Thanks, sorry, I keep adding questions. Maybe this is the last one. Um, of those five units set aside for uh, consideration for a referral from the Homeless Services Consortium, are they for family units, single units, a mixture of both? We haven't identified which specific units yet. So we have a mix of studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms. We only have one three bedroom. Uh, it's a very tight site, so it's hard to fit larger units in. Uh, but we have not identified which specific units. But you know, generally speaking, we would target, uh, you know, having some level of a mix between, you know, those all those units, the income levels being proportional to some extent with the various unit type sizes, and we would, you know, intend to do that as well with those set aside units. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Don't don't go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I expect you all have questions for him. Yes. Uh, all right. So Alder Bennett is next. Yes. Um, uh, so I was wondering, um, for your unit mix, why couldn't you add more affordability to your unit mix or more like of the 30%, 50% AMI to that unit mix? Yeah, it really, the challenge with this project has always been making the economics work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as you all know, there's not a lot of affordable housing that gets built in high rise buildings that are predominantly affordable housing. It's normally market rate with a few affordable units thrown in. And so from a construction cost standpoint, we still have similar costs to a market rate building uh, in terms of you know, post tension concrete and all of that. And so what we have attempted to do is to maximize the amount and the, the number of affordable units and the levels at which they're set aside while still maintaining financial feasibility and right. it's been a bit of a tightrope. Fortunately, the city and the county have also provided support. And so if we're successful in securing we to tax credits, we believe that we can make the numbers work. Um, but it's just to go, you know, to have half the units be at 30%, right. the economics don't work with the cost of, you know, high rise construction in an urban site. 
Sure. And if you were, so obviously this is relying on getting the WIDA tax credits. If you were unsuccessful in getting those tax credits, would this not go through to completion? The project in this current iteration could not, uh, would not be feasible without WIDA tax credits. So St. John's is committed to um, doing something with this site to further their mission and provide a supply of affordable housing. Uh, 130 units and a project like this would not be feasible without tax credits. Uh, and so, you know, we have not at this point explored alternatives. Right. Okay. And then I was also wondering about the, the, the design elements of the project. So from the design that was shown in the, I guess, what we got here, and it's quite different than the, what's originally there with the St. John's Church. Are you doing anything further off, further down the line to try to um, incorporate some of those design elements of what currently stands? Yeah, so we've done a number of things. Um, we prioritized at the church's direction the use of natural materials. So you'll see that there's not, uh, you know, much metal panel, window trim, of course. Um, but the church really wanted to um, prioritize those natural materials. Uh, we've come up with a concept on the first floor at the corner to use colored and stained glass uh, in a more contemporary fashion than a traditional sort of historic detailed stained glass, but in a way that still communicates mm. kind of the use behind that space. And we're also exploring opportunities to uh, preserve and reuse some of the historic finishes inside the church, some of their detailed ornate woodwork. We're looking at ways that the existing exterior stained glass could be you know, potentially salvaged and potentially resized and accommodated elsewhere. So we're trying to bring some of that history in, um, but recognizing that the current design of their building and the current layout of their building uh, is not very efficient and doesn't meet their needs. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Of course. All right. Next, we have Alder Carter. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Mark, can you, um, real quickly, if, if you have it in front of you, can you go over the number of units in the 30, 50, 60 percent? Can you do that? Thank you, Heather. I was like, I think I can get close. <laughs> oh, but Heather I don't know can do perfect. it. Um, so, yes, yeah, so right now we have 26 units at 30 percent AMI, 54 at 50 percent, and 28 at 60 percent. Thank you. And then, um, if I recall, I thought at some point a few years back that St. John also worked with the road home. Are you familiar with that? You mentioned the veterans units were about eight and the homeless consortium would have five. Are you familiar with whether they're going to be working with the road home? It has not been discussed to date. I'm not aware okay. of St. John's past work. I know they've done a lot of work with Lutheran Social Services and Porchlight. Yeah. I'm not as yeah. familiar whether they've worked with Road Home. Okay. And then my last question to you is, I believe there were some questions regarding um, being as green, um, green energy. Can you go over that? Yep. And I'm paraphrasing. I don't have the exact words of the previous person's question. Yep. So we are, uh, you know, we do a number of things just from a best practices standpoint. The church is going to retain ownership and control of the completed project. So they're obviously invested in uh, designing a sustainable building. We are working with focus on energy uh, and are targeting somewhere between 20 to 25 percent uh, savings, energy use intensity savings over baseline. Uh, we have working through the details right now, but are looking at somewhere between likely 15 to 20, maybe as high as 25, but I don't want to promise anything, uh, kilowatt hours of uh, solar on the roof. Um, and so we're, we're looking at a number of those things to be as sustainable as possible. And there was some question regarding going to 10 stories. So are you, is the church planning on doing eight? And if they can do two more, or is the plan for 10 stores? 
The plan is for 10 stories, uh, and that comes back to uh, maximizing the mm -hmm. density on the site so that the project is financially feasible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. You've answered my questions. Thank you, Alder. Alder Harrington McKinney. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I circled a few questions that I have, and I hope that you will be able to um, to answer those. The first thing I put was affordability, and then I um, circled set aside units, and then I circled making the economics work. So what I'm landing on is is that um, uh, would a person who um, has um, a credit history that's uh, not stellar, how will they be treated? Will they be, is there any special consideration to someone who would fall into that category? Is that, are my questions out of order? No, absolutely. Um, so, you know, best practices and, and what we'll be doing here is we have a, a detailed tenant selection plan um, that is, uh, you know, drafted by the property manager, has been reviewed with Lutheran Social Services, who will be the supportive services provider. Uh, and that tenant selection plan really is, you know, gets to the heart of that, which is ensuring that those sorts of issues, you know, an adverse credit check are not used unilaterally to rule out prospective tenants. Um, so it's really looking holistically, um, you know, there are, if, there's sort of alternative methods of if a credit check comes back bad, but they can prove a history of, you know, paying rent. And so there are different things that the tenant selection plan specifically states will be used to try and avoid that situation, uh, you know, where tenants are getting sort of arbitrarily or unfairly screened out from qualifying for the project. Excellent. I think that uh, you did uh, circle around my question, but they would have the opportunity to compete even if they had an adverse credit history. It, would that be part of the set aside units that you're talking about or? Well, that would, they would all, the tenant selection plan would apply to all of the units. And so, um, you know, I, again, I don't have that specifically memorized, but the intention is that, you know, one issue like that is not used to uh, deny an application and it's really looking at applicants holistically and looking through, you know, trying to work through um, alternative methods of um, reviewing applications. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Benford. Thank you, Mayor. I had a really quick question. I, I'm on the screen. I know <laughs> I seem like a floating head in an old Star Trek episode, but... Uh, uh, anyway, uh, I noticed on one of the slides that there was over 5,000 uh, feet dedicated to partners and community organizations. Do you have a sense of who it's related to an earlier question, who might use that space or who might you partner with or the property manager? So that space uh, really is... Um a part of what St. John's has, has always done is utilize their building for various partnering organizations. So, um, you know, Porch Lights Digs, um, Backyard Women's Mosaic Project, um, Off the Square Club are kind of a number of the, just a few of the different groups that they've worked with. So that is something that St. John's is going to be working through who um, you know, who those partnering organizations might be that could occupy that space. They have not gone, they have not finalized that yet, um, but those are conversations they're having both with their existing partners and, you know, with potential other partners. But it's really about, um, you know, furthering their mission and providing space to these sort of community-focused, mission-driven organizations. Great. Just to follow up, has a property manager been identified? Did you say that already? Uh, I did not say that, but yes, Urban Land Interests uh, is uh, going to be providing the property management and Lutheran Social Services will be providing uh, the supportive services. Both will have uh, staff on site on the project. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Alder. Alder Heck. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mark uh, 
just a few questions. Uh, uh, but, but first, uh, thanks for all the work that you've done on this, and thanks to St. John's. I know it's been a while. Can you uh, uh, just briefly describe uh, the neighborhood engagement opportunities that, that came along with this rather lengthy process? Yes, thank you. So we've been talking, uh, working through this for several, several years. Um, we started the approval process in the fall of 2021. Uh, we actually went to Urban Design Commission for an informational presentation in December of 2021. Uh, so we had uh, publicly noticed neighborhood meetings that fall. Uh, out of that came the development of a steering committee that was led by Bob Kleba, or co-chaired, I should say, by Bob Kleba and Mariah Renz. Uh, we had several meetings with the steering committee over the course of, I'll say, the last 12 months for round numbers. Uh, I know that you know we had a, maybe half a dozen or so that would uh, attend those meetings. I know in talking to Bob and in some of the comments he made at Plan Commission last week, he had some frustration at the lack of uh, community uh, neighborhood engagement and people that were uh, attending those meetings, but we worked through a number of issues and uh, improvements to the projects that came out of some of those discussions. Thanks. And then um, you mentioned UDC. Did, do, I, am, do I understand you went to UDC three times? Would yes. that be correct? That is correct. Okay, <laughs> and uh, those, uh, and then plan commission recently, and those would have all been uh, postcard notifications to nearby residents, so they would have been aware of those opportunities as well as the mini steering committee mm -hmm. meetings, uh, which are admittedly hard to get people to attend. Okay, thanks. Those are my questions. Thank you, Alder. I don't have any other Alders wishing to ask questions. I think now, now it's safe. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, all right. So we will move on to public comment on item number nine, uh, which is amending supplemental regulations within the Madison General Ordinances and definitions to update the definitions of family. Our first registrant wishing to speak is Nicholas Davies of District 15 to be followed by Matthew Kulkick. Hi, uh, thanks for another opportunity to speak. Um, I understand that the proposed motion on the agenda tonight is referral and the question before you is what plan commission meeting to refer this to. So I'm gonna focus on that for tonight. Um, for a little context, I was surprised to learn that even now in the year 2023, a, a city like Madison could still have an ordinance like this on the books that has a say in which three consenting adults can live together and which three adults cannot. It's problematic and discriminatory and I look forward to it being repealed. I've unknowingly violated this, this ordinance before myself. A lot of my friends have. Again, we're talking about an ordinance that prohibits unrelated adults living together for any reason, which is really common and completely ordinary, especially in a tight housing market that we've been talking about a lot tonight. Um, this backwards ordinance would be practical would be impractical to ever enforce at citywide scale, but that is a little cons consolation to the people who have had law enforcement resources weaponized against them by their neighbors under the pretext that this family definition ordinance provides. So when I heard about the five month long referral that was proposed, I was concerned with the length and arbitrariness of that. Uh, with any lengthy referral, one of you typically asks smartly, you know, what do we expect to happen in those five months? What's the, what's the significance of that time frame? In particular, I'm concerned that the five month time frame might mean more getting added to this item. A recurring theme in some of the other public input has been that some mansion owners are unwilling to give up this discriminatory ordinance that they use to persecute less privileged neighbors without getting some kind of concession in exchange. And if we're going to do that, if we're going to impose additional rules on certain campus edge properties, prohibiting uses that are allowed under the zoning code and effectively rezoning these other people's properties, that needs to be separate from repealing the citywide ordinance because rezoning individual properties, particularly other people's properties, goes through a very different process. On the other hand, if people wanna talk about this item more, I'm not opposed to referring it to the next plan commission meeting. I joined the last plan commission meeting expecting to speak on this, 
and didn't get the opportunity because of this proposed referral. Thanks. Thank you. Our next registrant is Matthew Kulcic from District 13. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. All right, perfect. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so my name is Matt. Uh, I live in the Greenbush neighborhood. So first of all, thank you for uh, giving me a chance to speak tonight. Um, I wanted to say that I agree with the commission's request to push the vote on this family definition change until June. Um, I feel there are a lot of open questions around this proposal that will take time for the city to answer. Uh, some examples of those questions are how will this change impact rent and housing prices for non-students in the near campus neighborhoods? Um, also, how will the city ensure that non-student residents are not priced out of near campus neighborhoods now that they have to compete with students and landlords? So, um, you know, think of a family who's currently renting in Greenbush who has one, maybe two incomes. Um, if this proposal goes through, that same family is now going to have to compete with five students who can pool their money together and can price out current uh, residents, the same family who's renting here right now. Um, another example, can the city give examples of other college towns and, and cities with similar challenges, which is a residential neighborhood close to a major university, and what have they done to address the issue? So um, those are just some questions. I'm sure there are a lot more, and I, I just feel it will take time for neighborhoods, um, especially around the UW campus, to compile these questions, to get them to the city, and for the city to look into these questions and, and, give, a, and give a response to them. So I, I really feel like we should have just as much information as we can about how the impact this proposal will have, um, about what the impact will be that this proposal will have, so that the council can make the best decision possible for the city of Madison. Thank you. Thank you. Those are the registrants I have on item nine. Are there questions for either of them? Seeing none. Then we will go on to item 51, uh, which is authorizing the city clerk to participate in the U.S. Alliance for Election Excellence. And our uh, one registrant wishing to speak is Jerry Mullen from McFarland. Thank you. My name is Jerry Mullen and I'm speaking in opposition to resolution 75287. According to the National Center for Education Statistics, the United States ranks 24th among industrialized nations in literacy and reading. As a result, most Americans lack a basic understanding of the Constitution, Bill of Rights, separation of powers, and that the source of their liberty is from God and not the government. Unfortunately, the dumbing down of our Americans has led to a government of elected officials and bureaucrats who are either willfully ignorant of their duty to uphold the Constitution, they swore an oath to protect or they exploit the gullibility of their constituents by seizing power and implementing laws in violation of our founding documents. To refresh your memory, the 14th Amendment, also known as the Equal Protection Amendment, states, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. The election fraud in 2020 led to the disenfranchisement of Wisconsin voters living outside Dane and Milwaukee counties. Many courts have ruled that election fraud dilutes everyone's vote and is illegal. This resolution authorizing the clerk to accept grants from the leftist organization U.S. Alliance for Election Excellence is unconstitutional under the 14th Amendment. The Wisconsin Supreme Court ruled in Teagan versus WEC that the use of ballot drop boxes were illegal in 2020 in violation of Wisconsin law. In fact, Justice Rebecca Bradley wrote, Quote, if the right to vote is to have any meaning at all, 
Elections must be conducted according to the law. If elections are conducted outside the law, the people have not conferred their consent on the government. Such elections are unlawful and the results are illegitimate." Close quote. Although this was not a 14th Amendment ruling, the ballot drop boxes were installed in only blue and Democrat areas of the state. You have about 30 seconds left. Furthermore, they were paid for by leftist activist groups. The fact that the illegal ballot drop boxes remain in place throughout the city of Madison reflects an arrogant disdain for the rule of law. Although I speak in opposition to this resolution, I have lived in Dane County long enough to know that the leftist agenda has priority over the Constitution, statute, and individual liberty. This reckless approach to governing is likely to cost the taxpayers millions of dollars in legal fees when yeah, the city is sued for violating the Constitution. Thank you. Are there any questions for our registrant? Let me refresh and see if we have you. Um, uh, Mike, I don't have you, but please come ahead and uh, and we can you can work with the clerk after the fact to make sure we get your registration proper. I'll do that. Thank okay. you. Name is Mike Willett. Um, I have worked as an election worker for about 20 years. I've worked as a chief inspector in district in Verona for about 10 years. I worked as a special voting deputy. About a year ago, I got nominated as a Republican representative on the Dane County Board of Canvas. So I got some time in elections. I really appreciate all the work that you folks are looking at here in correcting elections, because there, there have been some problems with the elections. So what are the problems? Is it our equipment? Is it our people? It's a wonderful question. And really the most important thing that it is, is trust. It's all of the people in this county trusting that we're counting the votes right. I am a representative, and I should have said that, as a, of the Republican Party. So I am speaking as, for them as well, not for any of those other organizations that I work for. How do you get the trust of the people of the Republican Party? And it's not by taking money from this this organization. I've read their stuff. I understand they're saying not, they're nonpartisan. I've seen that before. I get it. There are a lot of people that just aren't going to believe that. I don't know if it's true or not. It doesn't look like it is. Next thing, it's a grant money. I served 12 years on the Dane County Board. Didn't turn down very many grants. I get that. We like that money. We like other people to help. But this is different. This grant money doesn't help anything that you're doing already. In fact, it explicitly says it cannot be used to replace money in your, currently in your budget. It's not a replacement of funds. So what is it for? A really good question, and what is it for? It gives a little listing there. Did we have bad voter turnout in this county? Heck no. We had some really good voter turnout. Do we want to take a million and a half dollars and make a whole bunch of people mad, taking money from a company that may or may not be left, but certainly looks like it is. Your own paperwork, your header of your agenda, says a couple of interesting things to me. I hadn't seen it before. Consider who benefits. Who is burdened? Who does not have a voice at the table? How can policymakers mitigate unintended consequences? You all wrote that, or at least most of you probably did, and hopefully you look at it. I don't think there are many Republicans sitting out here, not in the city of Madison. There are still a lot voting in the city of Madison. I, for one, and also for the Republican Party, would strongly ask you to vote against this. This is not money helping your budget. This is money that's not helping educate it. Well, maybe it will. It's not going to get more people to the polls. And that's time. Thank you. Please vote again. Thank you. Thank you. And if you could just connect with the clerk. I, I looked through and I didn't see in case you registered on a, a different that. item. Thank just, you for seeing yeah, me. Just want to make sure. Thank you. Uh, all right. Questions on this item? Seeing none. That will take us to item 52, uh, which is a substitute 
authorizing a non-competitive service contract with Epstein Ewan Architects uh, for the State Street Campus Garage Redevelopment Project. And we have Eli Tsarovsky of District 4, uh, representing the Campus Area Neighborhood Association. I, uh, th thank you, Madam Mayor, for letting me speak today. Um, can you all hear me well? Yes. Awesome. Uh, so my name is Eli Sarovsky. I'm the president of the Campus Area Neighborhood Association. The Campus Area Neighborhood Association is a volunteer organization that fosters civic engagement, builds community power, and advocates for the people of the campus area in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, I'm writing to you on behalf of the Lake Street Garage Redevelopment Steering Committee and the Campus Area Neighborhood Association regarding agenda item uh, 52. I want to speak um, on behalf of the idea of community engagement and honoring the values that are uh, outlined in the Vision Zero project and um, as well as in Complete Green Streets. We believe that um, any third party contracting with the city of Madison should also um, fulfill the mission of uh, effective community engagement um, and engaging the community where projects are being built. And considering that this is a transportation project with a bus um, terminal being put at this parcel of land, we think that the city of Madison should really work to help um, EUA um, fulfill that mission of community engagement and honoring community members as experts. Um, we have not really engaged, we have not really enjoyed that throughout the project. I'll be honest, since the neighborhood meeting, unfortunately, um, concerns that were brought up um, regarding the transportation plan and regarding um, just the general um, use of Hawthorne Court. Um, we, instead of having an open conversation and a collaborative approach to it um, that honored like the experiences of people within our neighborhood, it was more just us essentially trying to be forced to say, yes, this is a good project because there are really great aspects of this project, like the affordable housing components of it that we desperately need in our neighborhood. Um, but we just felt like that aspect of community engagement stuff wasn't really truly honored um, in the way that we've seen in previous projects. For example, in the Olive Madison project that we were a part of, um, the 800 Regent Street project and the Trinitas Madison project, all projects that went through steering committees and engaged the neighborhood in a meaningful way. Um, we did not enjoy that in this project. Um, there were not meeting, there was I think one meeting or two with the steering committee. Um, and in those meetings, we have about a, 30 seconds left. There wasn't a nature of collaboration. And we hope that moving forward with this project, that we can restore that um, nature of collaboration and neighborhood feedback. Um, so thank you for letting me speak today. Thank you. It's the only registrant wishing to speak on item 52. Are there any questions? Alder Bennett. Sure. I was just wondering from Eli, could you... I, I don't know if it came out clear to me. Could you explain more about the engage, neighborhood engagement that you did have, if any? Yeah, thank you for the question, Alder Bennett. Um, so the, uh, the engagement that we did through this project, um, we had the initial neighborhood meeting as um, done through city code. You just have to, you have to have the neighborhood meeting. And so through that, many people engaged in that uh, process. We, did uh, have some good conversation, I thought, at that meeting, which was made me excited for this neighborhood process and making our student committee and engaging with the development team and the city of Madison um, on the public part of this project. Um, so then after that, we did engage. We were, actually, it took us about a month or so to figure out a meeting um, with the development team, um, which is fine. We, we enjoyed a, a good, thoughtful discussion with them. Um, however, they weren't able to answer any questions based on the public parcel of land. So we did try and get some meetings with um, city staff to really talk more in depth and critically about the project. However, in those discussions, they were sort of less collaborative and they were more so just like talking about like the plan that was there and the plan that was there. And Typically in the, our neighborhood engagements, we have sort of enjoyed that like back and forth discussion. Um, and that really was only one meeting. So we weren't even able to really continue that back and forth discussion as a steering committee. 
Um, so we just really hope that as this project continues and more design aspects are brought into it, that we can sort of try and regain that, that like bi-directional conversation about the project because it's really important in our neighborhood and there's a lot of people who are interested in providing solution-oriented feedback to make just a better project for everyone. Okay. Thank you so much for clarifying that, Eli. Um, one other thing, I understand it's um, the Neighborhood Association's opinion that the project as it stands is not in line with Vision Zero and um, Green Streets. I kind of was wondering if you could explain that more. Yeah, so um, the reason that we came to that um, conclusion is because, so in the Complete Green Streets um, policy document, it talks about the modal hierarchy and it puts pedestrians at the top and then it puts buses. Um, and then in Vision Zero, it really looks at pedestrian oriented um the like when thinking about um transportation projects it looks at creating confident and comfortable bikers and the way that hawthorne core is being used right now the steering committee came to the conclusion that that it really isn't a uh, pedestrian oriented um way of creating um a bus terminal on bus street because you are you have a really major brt line that's going to be put on university that's going to the uh, East Campus Mall stop, you have an unprotected bike lane, and you have University Avenue, which is extremely busy. And then, of course, the sidewalk on University Avenue. And so we think just introducing uh, and now bus, like inner city buses having to turn onto Hawthorne Court, which if you saw the uh, NBC 15 interview that I did, um, just comparing like a semi truck to entering Hawthorne Court, it doesn't really make sense in terms of the lanes of traffic that are necessary to cross into Hawthorne Court um, as compared to um, the Lake Street just turn um, in the control intersection. And not to mention that there isn't a stoplight or a way to indicate to people that this is a made can become a, suddenly a major street in our uh, neighborhood, even though it's functions as an alleyway at the moment. So that was part of the reason too, where it's like, there's already a built environment that is functional in the sense of there's a stoplight and a crosswalk with lights um, like less than a hundred feet away from Hawthorne Court. So we are just saying that there's other solutions that prioritize the pedestrian and biker experience in our neighborhood. Um, and that we just don't think this plan has reached that. Um, that standard that the city set for itself. All right, thank you very much. Any further questions? Seeing none, that is the end of our public comment for tonight. It's almost nine o'clock. Alder Vitiver. May we have a five minute break, please? I, any appetite for 10? <laughs> yes, 10. The motion is for 10 minutes. Is there any objection to taking a 10 minute recess? Seeing none, we will be back in 10 minutes. 9.03.
We're less than a minute out, folks. If the uh, folks online could come back, the folks in the building could take their seats again. All right, 10 minutes and more having elapsed, a quorum being present in the room as far as I can tell. I will reconvene the meeting and ask the clerk to please call the roll. Alder Tischler. Here. Alder Tischler is present. Alder Vetter. Here. Alder Vetter is present. Alder Vivere. Here. Alder Vivere is present. Alder Vitiver. Present. Alder Vitiver is present. Alder Rogelia. Here. Rogelia is present. Alder Benford. Present. Alder Benford is present. Alder Bennett. Here. Alder Bennett is present. Alder Carter. Present. Alder Carter is present. Alder Conklin. Present. Alder Conklin is present. Alder Curry. Here. Alder Curry is present. Alder Evers. Here. Alder Evers is present. Alder Figueroa Cole. Here. Figueroa Cole is here. Alder Foster. See him. Alder Furman. Present. Alder Furman is uh, here. Yes. <laughs> Alder Harrington McKinney. McKinney here. Alder McKinney is present. Alder Heck. Here. Alder Heck is present. Alder Madison. Madison is present. Alder Miadze. Present. Alder Miadze is present. Alder Paulson. Present. Alder Paulson is present. Alder Fair. Here. Alder Fair is present. Madam Mayor of Quorum. Thank you. All right. Uh, so the first item is item seven, which is Legistar 74703, a second substitute amending sections within Chapter 28 of the Madison General Ordinances to implement the new transit oriented development overlay district. President. Berman, a motion, please. Move approval of the second substitute. Moved and seconded to approve the second substitute. Uh, we'll start as we always do with questions for staff. Alder Tischler, is it questions? Well, I don't know if, if the now is the right time to make it a motion. Not yet. All right, thank you. Are there questions for staff? Staff does have a short presentation. Yes. Okay, we'll have our uh, Planning Division Director Stouter. 
orient us to this item and then questions for staff. Great, thank you, Mayor. Can everyone hear me okay? All right, um, I will keep this brief and I want to thank Katie Bannon, the zoning administrator who's here as well and, and can assist with questions. And then I, I wanna thank in, yeah, in absence of uh, Ben Zellers of the planning division who did a lot of project management, a lot of hefty work on this initiative, is not able to be here this evening. So transit oriented development or TOD is something that the city has been discussing and thinking about for probably almost 20 years now, it predates my time with the city. Um, it, was, it was mentioned in our 2006 comprehensive plan, written in as a placeholder in our 2013 new zoning code, and then uh, really explicitly recommended in the 2018 comprehensive plan. We began work in earnest on this ordinance, this particular ordinance with the city's plan commission in late 2021 and have had a series of community meetings um, and many board commission, commission and committee meetings since then. Um, tonight, I just wanna provide a very brief overview of what transit oriented development is and, and making a leap that uh, most folks do understand the why. Uh, we heard a lot of that through the public comment. Basically it's linking, uh, you know, the the opportunities for more housing close to our core transit, our highest frequency transit, where, in, where we're uh, beginning to invest more and more in transit for as a, as a method of getting around the city. Um, so what is transit-oriented development as an overlay district? First, TOD is generally pedestrian-oriented, compact, and mixed use developments centered on quality public transit. And I wanna stress here that it happens at a variety of scales, and you've heard a little bit about that already this evening. Um, some of the TOD regulatory framework impacts our single family residence districts within a quarter mile of our core transit lines. And it does that by adding the ability for single family homeowners to pursue an additional unit to their home so that it, it would then be a two unit building. And then on the very other end of the spectrum in some of our highest intensity based zoning districts, I think our really heavy mixed use districts, we've just rezoned um, the Oscar Mayer area to accommodate regional mixed use. In those areas, the TOD boost really enhances the, uh, the amount of stories that can be pursued by right, the amount of building height. So it, it takes it from five stories to eight stories in some of the highest intensity areas near transit uh, within the city. There's a whole spectrum of zoning districts between those two ends of the spectrum, but along the way, transit-oriented development works in the same way to add a slight boost to what can be done by right uh, within those districts. Um, when you look at our zoning map, this is just a, a west side excerpt of our zoning map, you can see that the base zoning, we have about 40 different types of zoning districts within the city today, um, and they cover either large geographies, in some areas of the city they cover very small geographies as you can see here um, in this area. The base zoning uh, that is in place today would remain the same essentially under the, the transit oriented development overlay. And then the, the overlay would be added to it to make some slight modifications to what could be achieved uh, within those properties. So similar to a wellhead protection overlay that's added um, in parts of the city right around our wells, um, overlay zoning is a tool that can be used to make modifications to, to the base zoning district regula uh, regulations. I wanna talk just for a moment about the process. Again, while this has been comp contemplated for nearly 20 years in Madison, this effort really began in earnest back in September of 2021. Uh, we had many meetings with our city's plan commission, also the Transportation Planning and Policy Board, um, a series of public community meetings back in May of 2022, which really provided opportunities for, for input to help shape the policy that's before the council this evening. Um, back in November, the, the introduction of the transit oriented development overlay occurred and then it's since went to the Transportation Policy and Planning Board and Plan Commission in early December and is before you this evening. And I wanna just take a quick opportunity to go through the options that um, all of which are on Legistar but the, the council will be considering this evening. Um, this is the uh, original version of transit oriented development as it was introduced back in November. Um, it covers about 14% of the city's land area, and this version excludes uh, the downtown, the UW campus, 
and also local and, and national historic districts. So this was the version that was, again, originally uh, introduced back in November. Uh, this is the second substitute that's before you this evening, and this is the, the version that has been recommended by the city's Transportation Policy and Planning Board and also the city's Plan Commission. Uh, this version is very similar to the original, except that it does include portions of our city's national and local historic districts. Uh, and those are shown here in blue and, and light orange, just so that you can see the locations within the city uh, where, where those portions of the historic districts are included. Um, also, throughout the day today, a couple of other changes have been considered and are also in Legistar. Um, Amendment 1 in Legistar requires, would require property owners to live in two unit buildings if the base zoning was in a single family zoning district. Um, and so that works, it works off of this version, the, the substitute, which does include the, the national and local historic districts, but it would add that additional requirement um, for owner occupancy. Um, if someone's adding a second unit to their building, they would need to live in that, uh, in that building. And then the second amendment that's before the council this evening um, basically goes back to the original. It, it removes the local and national historic districts. Um, so those are the versions that you have before you. And at this point, Katie and I are available to take questions that you may have. Um, and I'll turn it over to, to you. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Uh, we have, I believe, questions from Alder Benford. Thank you, Mayor. Heather, uh, this is a question for you, and thank you so much for the presentation. You've heard of uh, many folks um, talk about that there just wasn't enough time for community input. What's the timeline if this was possibly referred to allow for more community engagement? Well, the, I think the timeline for referral would would be up to the council. I will say that we had uh, a hefty amount of opportunities for community engagement, uh, mostly in the spring and summer of 2022. We put out a wide call to alders to um, share on their blogs. We put out a wide call to neighborhood associations and other listservs uh, regarding the series of four equal opportunities in May of 2022 to participate in, in public, public information meetings where folks had a chance to really provide some input and help to shape this. Um, all of the plan commission and transportation planning and policy board meetings have been public and there have been many attendees, uh, you know, providing some input at those as well. Um, we also put out a call to alders to invite staff to come to meetings that they might uh, consider important. And, and we did in include, uh, we did incorporate a few community meetings that were on demand uh, by individual alders or neighborhood associations uh, back in June, July of, of 2022. Um, you know, the, the impetus for transit-oriented development is probably one of the strongest elements of our city's comprehensive plan is to provide more housing in areas where folks have access to transportation choices, particularly transit. Um, it was probably the very loudest thing we heard from, from folks back clear back in 2016 when we were going through the comprehensive plan process. Um, so we, we feel that there has been um, a, a very broad effort uh, regarding community engagement. I think over the past week, we've uh, been asked by, by alders to, to really provide some more in-depth information to folks who were hearing about this for the first time who might live in a local or national registered district, uh, historic district. Uh, we did attend two community meetings, one in person and one virtual, just over the course of the past week um, to provide some more information there. But I do wanna stress also that um, during the time we were uh, working with our city's plan commission on this policy, we did cover in depth the, uh, the ways that this ordinance could impact national and, and local historic districts. Uh, and those recordings are all available on the project website um, for each and every meeting that's, uh, that's been held over the course of the last year and a half or so. Thank you. I, I really appreciate uh, the detailed outreach efforts. I, I guess my question was um, more specifically, if I, I understand there's certainly limitations, right? Whether it's staff, it sounds like you all put in a ton of time. Uh, but 
the fact that other alders asked for more detailed information recently, and we heard from folks tonight, uh, I, is there a, I want to try to ask this the quickest way. Is there a timeline as far as like the overall plan? I certainly understand like the considerations around BRT. This is somewhat separate tonight, what we're talking about. But if this was a pushback to allow, because we heard these voices tonight, and I heard what you said, that there was a lot of effort put into this. How does that impact overall a timeline? The impact would be based on the duration of the referral. I, I think that it is important to note that transit-oriented development as a zoning overlay is really important to try to get in place before the major transit investment takes place. It can take one, two, three years to pull together uh, a particular development or redevelopment project on the, you know, on the uh, larger, more intensive end of the spectrum. And we are fast approaching a complete redesign of our transit network this summer, which this transit-oriented development overlay respects. And so we think it's very timely uh, to pass this as soon as practical. I see, thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Alder. Alder Carter. Thank you, Mayor. Heather, I, I, I was concerned with the number of people who stated that back in October or November, um, they were ensured that the historical districts would not be included. Can you uh, expound on why that is being included after a statement to the um, uh, residents that it was not gonna be excluded? And then I have one other question. Yeah, thanks for that question, Alder. Um, so the the board's committee and commission process, as you all know as Alders, and I'll just state this for those who may be watching, um, often involves changes to legislation that's been introduced here at the Common Council. That was the case here with the transit oriented development overlay. It was introduced in November at the Common Council meeting um, without including any of the national or local historic districts. And then as the ordinance went through the board's committee and commission's process, our city's transportation policy and planning board and plan commission both voted to include portions of the national and local historic districts within a quarter mile of our core transit routes. And so that is how it's landed back here at the, the council meeting uh, this evening. So wouldn't it be prudent to um, go back out to the communities and explain why it's now included? Because I think that's one of the things that they were um, voicing objection on. My second question, oh, if you want to answer that, that's fine. I was going right into my second question, Heather. Sure. Uh, so I, as, I, as I may have mentioned, um, a few alders who do have local or national registered districts within their, uh, mm -hmm. within their districts um, did work with staff to put on basically a one in-person and one very well attended virtual meeting just last week. And that's why uh, this has been delayed by one cycle. Um, it was scheduled to come to the council on January 3rd and we all agreed that we needed to take the time to basically answer answer the questions of folks who may have just been been learning about this. And so we we had two very well attended in person and virtual meetings last week to do just that. And you talk about thank you for that. You talk about the um, building density. I'm paraphrasing Heather. So building density on these transit lines. Isn't that what we do already when it comes to affordable housing? And it looks like even market rate housing is looking at being on current uh, transit lines. Yes. What makes um, this different? Well, this is a change to our regulatory framework to allow more housing and, and more employment uses uh, to, be, to be basically um, developed by right. I think that 
you're you're absolutely right that a lot of that um, is happening already. I think you mm -hmm. know developers certainly our affordable housing funds are you know express a very strong preference for affordable housing near transit, and so we as a city basically provide that nudge to affordable housing developers to look for sites that are very well served by transit. This transit oriented development zoning overlay district um, dovetails really nicely with our, our preference areas for um, expenditures through the affordable housing fund. So you're absolutely right. There's a, there's a definite overlap um, between where we want housing and other uses to be able to move forward easier and where we want to fund more affordable housing within the city. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alder. Uh, Alder Wahili. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Heather, thank you for your presentation. I have a couple of questions. And my first question is uh, for the um, uh, the TOD uh, transit-oriented development to take place, what are some of the attributes for district to, qual to qualify for TOD uh, overlay? Great question. I mean, the, the essential way to qualify is how close are you, how close is your property to our, our core transit routes? So the, the highest frequency transit routes, the places where transit uh, is coming 15 minutes, uh, you know, every 15 minutes, folks would have a, a bus arriving um, during normal daytime hours. So it, it's really a matter of geography. It's where where is your property located in the city? If you're within a quarter mile of our, our high frequency transit routes, then the transit oriented development overlay applies. And so with my other question is, you know, we and we heard uh, from uh, different speakers tonight uh, indicating that there are uh, plenty of uh, parking lots or land that's empty. Why can't we not use those land to develop for if, if our purpose is to have more housing for our residents? Yeah, our, our hope is that we, we absolutely would. Um, one of the major tenants in the comprehensive plan and in all of our sub area plans is to try to make sure we're promoting the use of underutilized auto oriented properties throughout the city that are along transit routes. And so, you know, we, we just recently completed the, the area plans around the two regional malls, East Town Mall and West Town Mall. Both of those are prime examples where we have, you know, literal seas of parking that could be developed and redeveloped over time to accommodate thousands of new housing units. Uh, that's absolutely a major part of this transit-oriented development uh, overlay district. It also functions at a much smaller scale. Let's say there's a, an aging strip mall with a large surface parking area uh, right along a transit corridor. This transit-oriented development overlay district would promote uh, you know, a greater number of housing units that could be done by right uh, to redevelop that property. And so the areas like the, the, that you're describing, the surface parking lots and underutilized sites near transit are really where the transit-oriented development overlay matters the most. That's where it's going to have the most impact. Thank you. And my last question is, is the intent to increase housing or to increase uh, transit uh, uh, access? Uh, the intent is both. It's it's a, a real synergy, really, that we have an opportunity for here as, as we're taking on greater investment in transit and really focusing our transit system. We also have an opportunity to create more opportunities for housing choice right near that transit. And so, you know, 50 years down the road, folks living in Madison should have more choices uh, of, regarding places to live and work where they can use transit as a day-to-day -day option. So we're doing both at the same time uh, with this legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Alder. Uh, Alder Figueroa Cole. Thank you, Mayor. Heather, um, can you please um, explain uh, the decision making around those 22 lots that were selected and people are kind of confused about the selection process? The six that green. Yes, um, I can. In fact, 
I want to show a, I want to show basically an image that this is a, a public publicly available zoning map that really shows the transit oriented development overlay. And I think that what was described in some of the questions that I heard uh, were questions about, well, why why am I in and my neighbors out, or vice versa? Why why are certain neighborhoods bisected by uh, by the boundaries of the transit oriented development overlay? And you know, essentially, as I as I mentioned. The overlay is really a function of distance to the major transit routes. And so let's let's take a look here at uh, Monroe Street. This is Monroe Street. And you can see that generally uh, the, uh, the properties included in the overlay go out about one quarter of a mile from Monroe Street itself on either side. The imperfections are due to the fact that if a property is in the overlay, the entire property needs to be in the overlay. I'm going to zoom in here. This is a random property um, just to show uh, a close-up illustration of this. This is refreshing now, sorry. So you can see here there are some jagged lines here at the edge of the transit oriented development overlay. And the reason for that is that we didn't want to slice parcels in half. We didn't want to say, well, half of your property or building is within the TOD, the other half isn't. And so if a property was within a quarter mile of, of our high frequency transit, uh, we wanted to make sure that that entire property was in the district. So that's the reason for some of the jagged edges. And of course, um, you know, in some neighborhoods, there are going to be some parts of a neighborhood within a quarter mile of high frequency transit and some just outside that. And so, you know, by nature of, of the way the district was, was created and that proximity to transit being the driver, um, some neighborhoods will be divided. Thank you. That's all I got for now. Thank you, Alder. Alder Tischler. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, Heather, you, you mentioned it's a matter of geography, um, and it's it's a quarter mile uh, from the uh, uh, from the routes. I guess my question is, looking being optimistic, this is this is going to work. We're going to get uh, additional funding in the in the, in the future. What happens when we extend uh, the routes? Um, thinking in particular, maybe down Monroe Street, and it continues on through um, where it splits there, you know, uh, it continues on through Nakoma, continues on down Odana Road, what happens then? Sure, great question. So I think if, if the bus rapid transit or other high frequency transit system were to be expanded through the years, the council would then have a decision uh, before them as to whether or not to extend the TOD, transit and development overlay. Um, it would always land at council as a decision because it is it is an ordinance. Um, but the thought, at least from the you know on the part of the plan commission, is that um, yes, if if those transit investments and that transit frequency was being extended, then it would naturally um, involve the extension of the TOD overlay. If I could just do one more follow-up question, um, it's a quarter mile. What you said from from the routes. And I mean, the whole goal of this is to have higher density so people can can get to the to the bus stops. Why are we not having the uh, uh, quarter mile radius from the bus stops? Because in some cases, this is a question of you know it could be an additional I don't know 500 feet. Um, so I guess that I guess that's my question. Why why is it why is it the routes and not not the stops, which is where people are getting to to get on the bus? Otherwise, they're just standing there watching it go by? Yeah, that's a great question too, Alder. Um, this was one thing that was covered probably about a year ago at plan commission meetings where we were in informal discussion about the creation of the TOD overlay. And uh, guidance was provided by the plan commission. Um, I think once they realized how complex the resulting shape would be if we focused on bus stops. And remember, there are two bus stops at every location on each side of the street, right? Okay. So if the, the complexity of that shape was not worth, honestly, the hassle of, of creating it. And so smoothing it out uh, as more of a, you know, a, a straight line right along the route, uh, when you really looked at the differences between those two, um, it made more sense to the plan commission and to staff at that time to to move forward with the the smoothed version of the shape. Right. If I, one one more quick follow up, if I could. Um, I mean, 
you know, f you can split the difference between where the stops are. Just draw, you know, just draw draw a line between where the two stops are across the street. But, but you know, it's a matter of you know a matter of feet, matter of inches. Um, I mean, for me in, in District 11, it's a question of 14 houses in Westmoreland being added or not. Um, so I'm, I guess by by going from where the stops are, from going where the routes are. So I, I think it it is worth considering looking at the stops, because that's also where we be putting the investment um, in, into having those stops, either, either putting up the, the, the signs, putting up the, the, uh, the, the, the benches. And it's a, it's, I think it's far easier for people to understand that than, than just, uh, just a line. So I'll just, I'll end there. Thank you, Alder, Alder Bennett. Hi, I don't know if you've addressed the equity issue yet. Um, Heather, but are you able to just speak to how this plan specifically will help bring about more equity in the city um, for people obtaining housing? Sure. I think, it, you know, we've we've heard this question a lot at, at plan commission and certainly at community meetings as well. I think it's important to, again, note that zoning in and of itself is is not going to all of a sudden magically provide equity throughout the city. We really need to look at our entire toolbox in this case. The TOD overlay is a way to make it easier to construct more housing units or, or more employment opportunities close to transit. Meanwhile, we need to continue as a city investing in affordable housing, um, you know, land banking for, for particular affordable housing um, outcomes right along these, these high frequency transit routes as well. So the zoning alone, the TOD overlay alone, uh, doesn't ensure uh, housing equity, but it does make it easier to construct more housing and to construct more types of housing uh, within a quarter mile of our high frequency transit routes. Thank you, Alder. Alder Evers. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Heather, thanks to you and, and the work that staff has done, Ben Sellers and others on this. Um, and thank you for <laughs> the staff meeting that was held in District 13 uh, in September to answer questions for residents there. But my question, my first question is actually for the other Heather, Heather Bailey. Hi, Heather. Hey, um, <laughs> at the December 12th Plan Commission meeting, you weren't actually able to be there, as I recall. I think you were at a landmarks meeting, but you had already published a memo stating your position regarding uh, the issue about in whether or not including the historic districts in the TOD and what kind of impact they would have. And as I recall, you uh, you commented that the local historic districts, and I'll give you a chance to go into more detail, would actually still be protected by the provisions in place through landmarks. And uh, that the historic districts would also have their tax credits, but you added that the TOD overlay could also increase development pressures that result in demolitions rather than adaptive reuse of existing structures. and that. That sentence struck me, and I wanted to give you an opportunity to explain a little bit of what you meant by development pressures, and perhaps also for the benefit of everyone listening, the, the decisions or, or the difference between a decision, uh, an approval to demolish or, uh, you know, to go in the direction of adaptive reuse. <clears throat> so... Um... Yes, we had a landmarks commission at the on the same night as plan commission. Uh, land landmarks commission was informally uh, d discussing the proposal um, at the request of Alder Tischler, who serves on the landmarks commission. So they had a discussion. I wrote up a staff memo to uh, provide my analysis of uh, potential impacts for I anything related to development. Uh, we can set some parameters for how we things might go, how we think things might go, but uh, how they actually turn out, um, you just have to wait and see. So for potential impacts for the local historic districts, we have our updated local historic district standards um, that we, the city adopted in uh, May of this past year and implemented in June. So 
for the local historic districts when we're talking about preserving the physical character of these places um, those protections are there landmarks commission does not uh, rule on changes of use that is a function of zoning so landmarks commission is looking at physical changes to these historic structures and that's where the adaptive reuse comes in um, willie street is a great example of uh, some buildings that began their lives as residential structures, and now they're put into commercial use. Lambert's Commission is about the physical character. It's not about the changes of uses, be it a single family or that that building then becomes a two unit. Um, that is not what Lambert's Commission is involved with. For the National Register districts though, those are honorary designations. They do come with financial incentives to encourage property owners to reinvest in their properties. The standards for that process are the Secretary of the Interior standards for rehabilitation. Um, and so that's about adapting a uh, structure for new and ongoing uses. Um, and that's most of what Landmarks Commission is doing as well. But for the National Register Districts, as it is an honorary designation, it doesn't come with those historic property protections for ensuring that uh, we're having an emphasis towards adaptive reuse. It is uh, there for property owners to do with as they see fit. So Landmarks Commission isn't um, doing approvals for new development or reinvestments or demolitions in those areas. With the preservation tax credits as an option, which is a very popular program um, in the National Register districts that are all over the city, um, that provides uh, the, possibly the funding to help make the uh, additional development intensity happen for these properties. But as we see all over in the city uh, currently, uh, additional development pressures sometimes lead to demolitions. Um, there's some financial options to uh, help promote adaptive reuse for the national districts. Um, but it, sure, ad additional development pressures can sometimes lead to demolitions. I think that is uh, a well accepted fact. If uh, a neighborhood decides that they are really concerned about the physical character, the appearance of uh, the neighborhood that they're in, they can always move forward with the process for becoming a local historic district. Yeah, great. Well, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, and this question then goes back to the other Heather, to Heather Stouter. I, I wonder if Heather, if you could also speak to this issue of uh, the potential for increased development pressures that could result in demolitions rather than adaptive reuse outside of the historic districts. For example, and perhaps like a neighborhood like Greenbush or Bay Creek or Bram's Addition, places where there are naturally occurring affordable housing, older structures um, that we are trying to, you know, we're, we have programs to try to update and preserve. And uh, but would these development pressures by uh, with uh, within the overlay perhaps add to uh, more demolitions rather than adaptive reuse. Potential. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I, I think it is uh, somewhat of a case by case basis, but in every case, it it does come down at least to the economics first. You know, and I think in in a, some of the neighborhoods that you mentioned, if we're talking on the you know on the residential small scale, um, it would be quite expensive to imagine tearing down a five hundred thousand dollar single family home in order to construct a two unit building. I, I think the economic reality of that is a, a real stretch, but in some of those same neighborhoods along commercial corridors, if there's a very underutilized site with surface parking and a one story commercial building today, demolition is the very likely outcome there rather than adaptive reuse. So it's it's a case by case basis. Um, I think economics is plays a plays a large role in whether whether we're seeing adaptive reuse or, uh, you know, in the case of a single family home, perhaps uh, an addition to that home or, um, you know, an interior change that creates a second unit. That's way more economically feasible than a demolition um, in a new, you know, two unit building. Does that get to your question? Yeah, it, it does, because I think some people are concerned that the TOD overlay will 
will kind of enhance the uh, speculative real estate situation where folks will be buying up distressed properties, knocking them down and building uh, duplexes in their place. And where I see that might not be happening with a property that's worth $500,000, I can imagine some neighborhoods and some houses that are perhaps suffered in some ways due to deferred maintenance. Uh, falling victim to this and being knocked down. I, you know, that happens. Neighborhoods evolve. There are three homes in my neighborhood that have been demolished and replaced by new homes. Oh, there's, is there a question here? Yeah, I'm getting to it, Mary, just real quick. I'm, uh, I'm wondering, as I was saying, if adding the possibility of a second unit doesn't change the value of the property such that it might incentivize more demolitions. Yeah, as I mentioned, I think those cases would be few and far between. You'd have to have a very inexpensive, um, you know, home that has not been well maintained. Um, and then you'd still be facing expensive demolition costs and quite expensive construction costs for an entirely new two unit structure. And so I think it's a it's a question that, you know, individual property owners would have to weigh and think about the capital that they have, the equity that they have in a property. Um, but I think that uh, it is possible that that folks would pursue a, a demolition of a home to construct a two unit building. You know, I want to share an example on the north side where uh, an affordable housing developer just recently obtained a large property um, with the intent to demolish a single family home, divide the property into two and construct two new single family homes. That's happening on the on the north side. Um, and, and in that particular case, with subsidy, the economics worked uh, in order to achieve that. So there, there probably will be some cases, but I don't think it will outpace what we see today um, in the realm of, of the demolition of single family homes. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Figueroa Cole uh, for the second time. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Heather, the other question that I forgot earlier, sorry about that. Um, on regards to the concerns from residents um, regarding the split on zoning, is this, is this a situation that is just unique for this neighborhood or do we have these kind of situations around the city? Uh, great, great question. And so, you know, in, in neighborhoods that have a diversity of uses and housing types, by and large, they have a diversity of zoning districts already existing. So I think, I think that's what you're, you're getting at. And, you know, again, I, I will show the, the interactive zoning map that, that you can all see. Um, let's see, let me go somewhere on the isthmus so it's obvious where we are. Um, again, waiting for, for it to refresh. Um, but you can see on either side of the isthmus, so, so here I'm circling kind of the Marquette neighborhood. This is the Tenny Lapham neighborhood here. And you can see that that those two neighborhoods have a very wide variety of zoning districts. Those so, are the different so the colors, colors shown on the, the map. Districts. Those are zoning districts the that colors. exist today, the mm -hmm. different colors, mm -hmm. correct. So again, if if you live in a neighborhood with a variety of housing choices and a variety of land uses, then then absolutely you, you have underlying zoning that, that, that differs, just like the map you see here. Um, if you live in a neighborhood where all of the housing units are very similar and the lot sizes are similar, then you're probably in a neighborhood where uh, you're in the same, same zoning district. And we can see that a little bit more out on the city's periphery uh, where these large swaths of land are, are in the same low density residential uh, zoning district out in this area. Thank you, that's all I got. Thank you, Alder. Um, Alder, for the Heather that's in the room. Um, so I had, for, I think I forwarded you an email that I got from someone who I think was a former city planner and I kind of always notice emails like that because I'm not. Um, and the suggestion was to end the outlines of the TOD at the back end of lots instead of the front end of lots so that you wouldn't have this situation where one side of the street would be in it and one side would be out of it. So I'm just wondering if planning staff considered that um, and if so, what you found, and if not, why not? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I fully understood the, the recommendation, but I can describe what we did um, as staff. So we, 
and, and this was working very closely with the plan commission. So the plan commission in a series of meetings um, really encouraged staff to move forward with the quarter mile, quarter mile buffer. And then what we found is, well, if we do a perfect quarter mile from the transit corridor, we're, we're going to be splitting some properties in half. And so the question then becomes, is this property in or out? We, we followed parcel lines um, instead of following street lines. And, and so it was, it was a pretty fine-grained uh, geographic information systems exercise to really come up with the boundary um, so that it was as close to that quarter mile buffer at, as it could be. There are a variety of ways that it could be done, um, but that it wasn't done in a vacuum. It was done with a lot of guidance from, uh, from the plan commission uh, well over a year ago. Alder, Alder Paulson. Yes, uh, for uh, I think Heather and Katie and they can tag team as as they see fit. Um, and I want to the the point of my question is getting into the applicability of uh, of zoning districts where um, duplexes are permitted, um, and this feeds in a little bit to the, the the land use map, which sometimes talks about low residential. Um, I should just talk you know my microphone here so so sorry I'm not gonna make eye contact while asking this question so um, again, I'm directing to the chair um, so chair um, my question is um, on the generalized uh, future land use map where we talk about um, low residential um, uses um, inside of those low residential uses uh, there are multiple zoning districts that are consistent with them and some of them are Things like SR1, the suburban residential uh, consistent one district and consistent two and consistent three. And then there's the traditional residential one and residential two and residential three. And some of those um, uh, permit uh, duplexes and some of them do not. Um, but if someone comes to us and says, um, I would like, I am currently in, I own a property that's in a suburban uh, residential uh, consistent district one, um, which does not permit um, a sing, uh, duplex, but I own the property, and I would like uh, to rezone it to be uh, SRC three, which does permit a, uh, a district in the air, does permit a duplex and the lot's the right size. Um, could you just walk us through um, how much do they have to pay to do that, um, and is this something that? And I realize I'm asking it a little bit in the abstract, but this is something that you would expect that uh, staff member would typically recommend that the plan commission uh, and council eventually approve to be able to put a duplex in, um, to rezone to be able to put a duplex in, either through our district rezoning or maybe we can get him into PDEs to go all out. Thank you. Okay, um, so I think what you're describing would be termed by some to be spot zoning. So it, it's a, a, a property, let's say it's in a, it's. On the edge of the city, it's in a sea of, of the same zoning district. Um, if that's the case, and they're asking for a different zoning district to do a, a two unit building, typically staff have not advised folks to move forward with that because it, it's, a, it's a really, uh, it's, a, it's a rock to push uphill, to a pretty tough process. It is expensive. I think I'll look at Katie, I, you know, it's in the realm of $500, which is expensive for, for some. Is it more? No, it's more. It's more now. Um, but it's also about a, a 10 week process uh, that that would be involved. And so, you know, this would sort of take it out of that uh, equation. There wouldn't need to be a, a rezoning to contemplate the addition of, of one unit to an existing structure. Right. But if, uh, so my follow up, I guess, is then um, would you recommend it? Would you not recommend it because it um, is expensive and takes a long time, uh, or because it's unlikely to succeed. Historically, it's it's very rarely been pursued. I can only I can only remember a couple uh, during my time here, and I think one was approved and one was not. Um, so I think you know you'd have to have a very supportive. You know, you know how public hearings work. You would probably need to have a very supportive alder and and support from uh, those around you in order to have a strong chance of of getting that approved by the plan commission and council. So it's it's less the expense that would lead to that advice and more the this is going to be a really tough tough route to go. We don't know that you'll end up getting an approval at the end of the day. Okay, thank you. That was helpful. Sure. 
Thank you, Alder. That is all. Oh, Alder Tischler for the second time. Sorry. Um, yeah, my, my first line of questions were, were regarding expanding the bus routes and how that would change. I guess my follow-up is what happens when we go the opposite direction and we, we remove a bus route. Does that then change the zoning? That's a good question. I don't think we've contemplated that much, but I think that it's important to say that it would not automatically expand the zoning or contract the zoning. Each and every change to the transit oriented development overlay would necessitate a separate action by the council. But I think, um, you know, if, if I were to imagine, um, you know, a dramatic um, reduction in the city's ability to fund transit or to fund transit um, and a, a new, let's say a new way of organizing Metro transit based on that funding restriction. Um, it probably depends on the timing, but I think, uh, you know, constricting the geographic coverage of transit oriented development could also make sense. But again, that would be a separate action by the council. It wouldn't happen automatically. And I guess quick follow up. So it's, the magic number is, is 15 minutes, right? Every, everything running 15 minutes, that, that's, what, that's what triggers the zoning change, so. Que is that a? That's a question, I guess, yeah. Yeah, a, so when, a, when we worked with the plan commission on this and, and even in our, in our conference of plan, the recommendation was to create a transit-oriented development overlay around high capacity, high frequency transit routes. Bus rapid transit routes um, were, were always sort of considered to be uh, eligible and in when in our conversations with the plan commission, but they then explicitly, uh, once the Metro Transit Network redesign was happening, um, they thought that 15 minute headway made a lot of sense to, to focus on. And, and that's why the existing uh, draft geography before you this evening covers parts of Monroe Street and Cottage Grove Road as well. Yeah. No further questions. Thank you, Alder. I have no other Alders in the queue with questions. So thank you, Heather. Um, it has been moved and seconded. We'll move to discussion then. Alder Miadze. Yes, Mayor. In, in light of the fact that uh, a lot of people have talked about not having enough community engagement, uh, I was just wondering if we can refer this to the next uh, Transportation Commission to have more of a ro uh, robust conversation about this so that people can be more engaged, um, especially since people did not hear about the historical districts being um, being involved in the TOD. So I'm just seeing if we could refer to the next Transportation Commission. Is that a motion, Alder? Yes. Is there a second? Second. Moved by Alder Miadze and uh, seconded by Alder Wahilihi. Um, Alder or someone, can you please look up the date of the Transportation Commission meeting that in order for it to be a proper motion. Motion is to refer to the next transportation committee meeting. Is there questions? Alder Tischler, you were gonna jump in with a motion. Okay. Okay, uh, Alder Paulson, questions? Yeah, I just have a question. Um, has this ever been to the transportation commission and does the uh, Alder from the 18th really mean the transportation commission or is he perhaps thinking TPPB? Uh, well, so on the first, Heather, has it been to transportation? No, it's it's focused on the transportation planning and policy board since they uh, really focus on that big picture policy uh, like this is. So it, it has not gone to transportation commission. All right, so uh, Alder Miyadze, just to note, your colleague is asking you of your intent uh, for transportation versus TPPB. Uh, Alder Furman, question? Yes, um, we, we typically, um, or at least a point of order, we typically would have a date for it to come back to the council. And so I'd request that there at least be a date for it to come back to the common council as part of the motion, please. Thank you, Alder. That's entirely in order. So again, Alder Miadze, if you could clarify uh, if you are requesting transportation or TPPB. And... Uh, trans Go ahead. 
Transportation Commission. Uh, a lot of things that the TPB does usually goes to the Transportation uh, Commission uh, for uh, the last approval of what uh, has been done. So since it hasn't been gone, hasn't gone there yet, I think it should go there. Then it should go to the next uh, Common Council meeting. And Alder, um, if you can uh, supply the dates for those, please, to make it a proper motion. Is there discussion on the motion to refer? Oh my heavens, Alder Tischler, are you on the motion to refer? Um, is is there any city staff on this <laughs> that can actually look up the dates? Alder, you can ask council staff to do that, but it's all available online. Um. Alder Tischler, was it a question or comment on this? Okay, Alder Tischler. I was going to make a comment saying uh, April 18th, but to come back to the council. Uh, it, it, uh, we already have the motion before <laughs> but, us, Alder. Okay. Um, so if you wish to amend the motion, you can make a motion to do that, but let's find out what the original intent is first. Right. Um, all right. Uh, Alder Furman on the question. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm not supportive of this referral. It's not clear what it will achieve. Um, you know, I think uh, some of the things that were, were left out of the discussion uh, this evening, um, or at least not detailed enough, uh, in my opinion, were, were, were the fact that how much Plan Commission very specifically talked about the historic districts. Um, there were discussions at two meetings over the summer. There's a memo that goes into detail about it. Um, the Hill Farms Neighborhood Association, if you go and look at their meeting minute notes, you will see that Alder Tischler was there in August and had a, a pretty in-depth conversation with them, and they very much knew that this was a very strong possibility. When this was at Transportation Policy Planning Board in December, um, and uh, I sponsored the motion um, to uh, include the historic districts, um, which again, were always in contention, um, I did have alders say that they wanted an opportunity to engage the community more, and we delayed it a meeting. Um, and at that point, it was it was a significant delay because we had no other meetings in December, and so we gave something like six weeks additional time um, for discussion um, and for neighborhood meetings with postcards, you know, virtual and in person. There's been a ton of discussion, and so at some point we need to ask ourselves, what exactly are we looking for? Um, if we believe it's our job to survey every individual resident on how, what they believe about policy, um, referring it to the Transportation Commission certainly is not enough time to do that. That's also incredibly foolish. Um, we should not be making decisions based on surveying every single resident to see, see if they support or oppose something. What's incredibly important, though, and, and what every alder who's seen their mailboxes or listened tonight sees, is understanding people's questions and concerns about order. this. Point of order. Alder Miyazay, what's your point of order? I I do not like to be insulted by anybody on the Alder floor. Alder Miyazay, you're not being insulted. This the Alder is addressing the chair as is appropriate and is discussing the item. Please continue, I, Alder Furman. Thank you, Mayor. I apologize if uh, the Alder was insulted. That was not, certainly not my intent. My point is, um, if we're, we're, as a body, deciding to refer this, we need to understand what we're looking to do. I think we've heard loud and clear um, that some people feel like they've got theirs and they're not interested in changing the character of their neighborhood because they're good. Let's be realistic, folks. We're in a housing crisis. We need to continue to make every change we can to be reasonable about, not, not just reasonable, but actually to be real about changes. Um, you know, I heard more time is not going to give us any more information, um, more discussion and re-traumatizing people, frankly, to go through this again. I mean, the amount of emails we got, et cetera, I'm just not seeing the end game there on, on uh, getting us more information. Um, so I'm hopeful we actually make a decision this evening and don't continue delaying very, very overdue changes. Thank you. Thank you, Alder Alder Heck. Thank you, Mayor. Um, while I don't disagree with, with President Furman, I, I'm going to address the am this amendment itself and suggest that referring this to Transportation Commission is, is not really appropriate. It's not even really in their purview, and they would be starting from scratch, given that they haven't considered uh, this proposal at all. So uh, um, as I said, I don't disagree with Alder Furman, but in terms of this amendment, I, I wouldn't be supporting it. Thank you, Alder. Alder Harrington-McKinney. 
I'm asking for clarification um, uh, in backtracking with um, Alder Miazzi, Madam Mayor, you asked him to consult a date, but before he came back with a date, um, President Furman had um, um, started his conversation. So I just wanted to make sure that we were in order. Alder, I'm waiting for all, the maker of the motion to supply us with a date, which he could do by raising his hand. And in the meantime, I'm giving him the time to do that by continuing discussion on the issue. Did you wish to discuss the amendment, Alder? Yeah, uh, the 25th. No, I, Alder Miadze, hold on, please. It, Alder Harrington McKinney has the floor. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Alder, I'm recommending that you, uh, the two dates that are available is February the 22nd or um, February the 8th. So my suggestion is, is that which date would be appropriate so that we can close this discussion off? Thank you, Alder Harrington McKinney. Next in the queue, we have Alder Fair. Thank you, Mayor. Um, real quick, I just want to add, uh, add, I guess, to what uh, Alder and President Furman said. I think we, we, we set a, a precedent. I know we've, <laughs> we've said it before, but we should try not to set a precedent of when we hear residents complain that they weren't engaged that should be something that we take seriously, but it doesn't automatically mean we should be referring something for more time. Um, that's, we, uh, we have to make decisions. We are, we've been elected by our, our, our constituents to make those decisions. And you know, the, as has been said, it's gone through the process and tonight is decision time. And so I hope we will not um, pass this referral and make a decision this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder, Ooh. jumping around here, Alder Paulson. Yeah, first I was gonna uh, also suggest to my colleague from the 18th, uh, the 25th uh, is a TC meeting, the, the 8th and the 22nd, and then even March 8th, uh, if we wanna start really getting out there. Uh, though I would uh, strongly recommend uh, not to pass this. Uh, this is, uh, the TOD overlay district is a land use question. Uh, the plan commission has been the lead committee on it. Uh, TPPB was was one of them, but uh, this is this is a, this is a zoning question and a uh, changes to the to the the zoning code, um, and much of TOD is uh, on building form and building height and uh, the appropriateness of of setbacks. And this is not really in TC's bailiwick. And and uh, we TC has enough to do. Uh, every problem of like where do we put a stop sign and where to put a street light, we send off to TC. Um, I've been engaging with them on an ordinance right now and they've been fantastic to work with, uh, but uh, let's not send them something that's not in their wheelhouse um, and uh, is not something that, that needs a referral in the first place. So I hope we vote no on uh, this referral and we take this up and put this to bed tonight. Thank you, Alder. Alder Miyadze. Alder Miyadze, you're muted. Dates that, uh, that follows for the TC is 125, and the next common council is uh, 27, is what I suggest. Thank you. Thank you, Alder, for clarifying your motion. Um, so the motion before us is to refer to the January 25th Transportation Commission and the February 7th Common Council meeting. Is there further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, that is the motion. All those in favor, referral aye. Those opposed, no, as your name is called. And the clerk will please call the roll. Yeah. Alder Tischler. Alder Tischler, aye. Alder Vetter. No. Alder Vetter, no. Alder Revere. No. Alder Revere, no. Alder Vitver. No. Alder Vitver, no. Alder Wahelia. Aye. Alder Wahelia, aye. Alder Benford. Aye. Alder Benford, aye. Alder Bennett? No. Alder Bennett, no. Alder Carter? Aye. Alder Carter, aye. Alder Conklin? No. Alder Conklin, no. Alder Curry? No. Alder Curry, no. Alder Evers? No. Alder Evers, no. Alder Figueroa Cole? No. Alder Figueroa Cole, no. Alder Foster? Muted. Alder Foster, you're muted. Just unmuted. You 
back. Not hear anything. Go ahead. Okay. Alder Furman. No. Alder Furman, no. Alder Harrington McKinney. Aye. Alder Harrington McKinney, aye. Alder Heck. No. Alder Heck, no. Alder Madison. Alder Madison, no. Alder Miadze. Aye. Alder Miadze, aye. Alder Paulson. No. Alder Paulson, no. Alder Fair. Alder Fair, no. I show six eyes, 13 no's. Hey, what? Alder Foster, one more time. If you're there. If not, uh, with six eyes and 13 no's, the motion fails. We're back to the main motion, which is to adopt the second substitute. Further discussion, Alder Tischler. Uh, hold on just one minute, Alder Tischler. Can we ask the Alders to turn off their microphones, please? Uh, I'm, I usually try and get to it, Alder, but. Thank you. We'll keep, keep trying. Alder Tischler, go ahead. Uh, I would like to make a motion to adopt Amendment 2 to the second substitution. Uh, moved and seconded, or moved to adopt Amendment 2 to the second sub. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded Amendment 2. And, and Alder, just for the listening public, would you briefly describe what Amendment 2 is? Amendment 2 is going back to the original um, that would not include historic districts. Thank you, Alder. Uh, moved and seconded. Is there any questions for staff? Seeing none, is there any discussion? Seeing oh, Alder Harrington McKinney. Uh, Madam Mayor, I, I get. Where I am stalled at is, is that originally, um, as presented tonight, the um, historic districts were not included and announced, and then that was changed. And so um, I'm really unclear about why the change. I've read a lot of the documentation, but that still sticks in my mind. And so I guess I'm missing the process, and I would really ask for help in understanding what that process uh, was and is. Is that in order? Um, Alder, I think that um, Director Stouter did address it, but I'm happy to recap if that's helpful. Um, the original proposal was brought forward at staff's recommendation um, and with the agreement of the sponsors, obviously, uh, to uh, not include the historic districts uh, in the transit-oriented development overlay. As that item, so what's before you is an ordinance amendment, as the ordinance amendment worked its way through the legislative process and in conjunction with the committee discussions, um, an amendment was made to um, first the first substitute and now the second substitute, which is before us, to include the historic districts in the overlay district. So that's the, the purview of our legislative process, right? Our committees get to make amendments and changes. And um, so that's what happened. Um, and that is, at the end of the day, after votes at TPPB and at Plan Commission is recommended to us, to you, from those bodies. What Alder Tischler is proposing now is to revert to the original proposal um, and to uh, go back as if before the committees discussed to that original proposal. Okay. Further discussion? Uh, Alder Furman. Thank you, Mayor. I wanted to just briefly, since I'm the person who moved the motion at Transportation Policy Planning Board, um, provide a little bit more feedback, a little bit more information on that discussion and, and why I moved that motion. And obviously, I, I assume since the board voted for it, agreed with me. Um, there, there are two aspects to this. There's the local historic districts. And I think what's incredibly important to understand about the local historic districts is there's still a ton of protections there. Um, these districts will have something that I and, 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 many, and, and, and several colleagues worked on, updated, um, powerful, strong, good um, uh, protection ordinances in place. Um, but let's not get confused. Historic preservation is not, not the same as let's stop density. You, you can do both. The National Historic Districts don't 
do not currently have any special um, uh, restrictions in our city, and I didn't believe this was the appropriate place to start adding restrictions. Um, density is not bad. Um, density um, does not change the character of the neighborhood um, if you truly understand what the character of a neighborhood is. Um, if you want to use that as code for keeping people out, that's a different story. Thanks. Thank you, Alder. Alder Tischler? Yeah, I just want to speak to the amendment. Um, yeah, I first want to just thank everybody from my district uh, who, who did take time to speak uh, both on both sides. This is, you know, this is how I believe alders work to, to listen and, and hear back from their constituents. It's how I like to, uh, I, how I should form uh, decisions. Um, and I just want to say that many of these people who are speaking are, are far more articulate, more persuasive than, than, their, than their, their alder. Um, so I'm, but I want to just say that, uh, you know, several months ago, you know, members on this, uh, council, uh, invited me to join this group. And back then I had a very little time to get up to speed on the issue. Um, and the first thing I had to, to vote on was the, uh, Metro network, uh, redesign. And I had taken a lot of information in just a couple of days. Um, but I re relied very heavily on uh, staff recommendations, and that's why I voted yes. Um, you know, things, um, you know, I'm, I recognize Madison, you know, is, is ranked as one of the best places to live in the United States. It's one of the fastest growing cities in Wisconsin, and those of us who've been here for a while have, have known this to be true for a very long time. You know, I've lived here for half a century, and I've witnessed our population nearly double in size, and it's this rapid growth uh, that has created the housing crisis again um, and prompt us to look for ways to build uh, housing uh, anywhere possible. But I want to go back because we, we have talked about the, the 2018 comprehensive plan for the city of Madison, which recommended adding TOD overlay zoning to increase housing in select areas. And that same plan also recommended a, a strategy to preserve historic places. And so I think we really are at a crossroad uh, with the addition of historic districts into the uh, bus rapid transit to this overlay. Um, as the city moves towards addressing both the housing crisis and reducing our dependence on automobiles, I, I just don't see how we can just let bus routes be used as a vehicle um, for sometimes unnecessary changes in, in zoning. Um, and I want to be honest, uh, I guess, with, with ourselves that adding historic districts really are not going to get us to where we need to be for creating high density housing, uh, what the city needs right now. And I want to encourage everybody, you know, to take, you know, take, actually take a bus ride to District 11, see for yourself all the construction that's going on uh, in, in my district. You know, 200, 2,500 uh, new places are being built right now. People are starting to move in. Um, you know, the bus, the bus routes, the BRT runs through District 11 because uh, the neighborhood was designed this way to create all types of housing uh, for people. And high, and high density and duplexes uh, were part of that original idea. Um, and as I look ahead for the next two years uh, serving on the Common Council, you know, I want to be spending my time uh, and energy you know, looking at ways to usher in new uh, additional high density housing in areas that already have been zoned and ready for high density. Uh, you know, we have the spaces that are ready and they're ready to go. And, you know, they're not a quarter mile away from, from the bus route. You know, they're right there on the bus route. I'm ta again, talking about my district. So I, I encourage everybody to, uh, to support, uh, not including the historic districts at, at this time. Thank you, Alder. Alder. Heck. Thank you, Mayor. Um, first, I'll say uh, that as a, a someone who represents the geographically smallest Alder district, which is a function of its density, uh, I, I don't frankly have a lot of sympathy for, for folks who consider their uh, more suburban districts to be um, you know, under a lot of development pressure and changes because uh, downtown districts are and have been uh, developed to a much, much higher intensity 
thankfully, I'm, I'm glad about that, but uh, I, I don't have much sympathy for folks who uh, are, are, are uh, claim that their districts have sufficient density already. Um, but, but speaking to the motion, um, or the amendment, I guess, uh, I, I, I feel like it's, first of all, overly broad because we've pretty much all agreed, I think, that local historic districts are relatively well protected by our historic preservation ordinance and, and throwing those out of the TOD overlay district is not a great idea in my opinion. And as for the national districts, um, I really think this is also too broad because frankly, we heard almost entirely from people who live in the Hill Farms neighborhood, uh, both in support of this and opposed to that. Uh, maybe a little more opposed, I don't know. But uh, I would, the rest of the National Historic Districts, we had either no input or a little bit of input, maybe from the Marquette area that includes a historic district, maybe a little bit from Vilas area. But I'm, I'm not going to be supporting this. It seems like it should almost just be, let's uh, only exclude Hill Farms, is, is what I get out of this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Bennett. Thank you. Uh, that was very well said um, because it does seem like only excluding health farms. And if I, I thought this was about historic districts. I would think that we would include all historic districts, local and national, into this debate and not just one of them. Um, but I, I have a few things to say. First off, um, Madison might be the best place to live if in, in the US if you are white. Um, because time and time again, Wisconsin ranks as one of the worst places to live if you are a black um, and, or brown or any person of color. Um, and I think it's sad that we feed that um, for alders to feed into these concerns and misinformation. Um, that's being brought about and a little bit too convenient to propose to refer this till after the election that's coming up. Um, but what I've seen in the debate today has been strictly nimbyism at its finest. Some comments that really stuck with me were, God bless our right to single family housing. And um, this single family housing is close to Marxism, if not communism. And I'm really glad that this debate is near Martin Luther King Day um, because I, have, I had a couple quotes prepared since we always love to quote MLK. One of them being, call it democracy or call it democratic socialism, but there must be a better redistribution of wealth within this country for all God's children. Now, when I look at the Hill Farms neighborhood, I, from what I understand, it was built during the 1950s, 1960s era, during the height of the civil rights movement, and during a time where um, only certain people could sign the deeds in the Hill Farms neighborhood. The history about Hill Farms that I want to know is that history of exclusion. I want to know about the racially restrictive covenants that were in the deed restrictions that were in the deeds during the, when these homes were built. I want to connect that to this debate that we had today about the concerns about students and renters that could possibly be entering this neighborhood and how that relates to the redlining that we've seen historically in Madison. And from what I saw when I, um, when I visited the Hill Farms neighborhood, um, I know that this might be intentional or unintentional um, to have an enviousm, but I have another MLK quote for you. Um, the majority of white Americans consider themselves sincerely committed to justice for the Negro. They believe that American society is essentially hospitable to fair play and to steady growth toward middle class utopia embodying racial harmony. But unfortunately, this is a fantasy of self-deception and comfortable vanity. And I want to see the, the self-deception and comfortable vanity in this debate. 
Look at, look at, look at us. Look at who is coming out to speak to these. It is all too convenient to claim that we're trying to be equ equitable and not see equity within the conversation of uh, folks turning out to say no. So um, this is a very obvious no to me. I, I think it's very clear why we should be building housing on bus, on, um, a bus rapid transportation because those are folks that can't afford to own a car in Madison. Why should Hill Farms be solely excluded so it should be exclusionary to those that were able to buy a home back when it was cheap or um, people that can afford to pay to buy a home at this point. Why can't renters be in Hill Farms? Why can't they enjoy the experience of Hill Farms neighborhood? And I think that's, um, and this is obviously not gonna solve our housing problems, but I think it's a step in the right direction and a step towards, um, what Madison should look like. Thank you, Alder. Alder Foster is next. Thank you, Mayor. Can you confirm that you can hear me? Yes. Great. Oh, thanks. Um, sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, I just wanted to respond uh, quickly to my colleague in the 11th comment that we should not be allowing bus routes to drive our zoning. Um, and just wanted to affirm that that's exactly what transit-oriented development overlay is intended to do, and it's exactly what it should do. Um, we spent uh, well over a year working on a network redesign, and the first thing uh, our consultant told us, who, which is probably the, the most well-respected national consultant on transit design, was that we cannot have uh, high-capacity, high-quality transit everywhere. We can only have it where we can afford or we choose to afford to put it. And throughout the course of that work, we were constantly faced with really tough decisions about where we were going to, to put our valuable city resources. And we ended up with a, a redesign that was embraced by this council that I'm really excited to see uh, roll out this summer. But as everyone knows, it's very limited in terms of where our best transit is going to be. And while we've decided to make that really significant investment in those corridors, that's also exactly where we need to put as much housing and other activity as possible, because that's where we're already putting our valuable transit resources and we need to capitalize on them. So yes, we absolutely do need to um, have our bus routes, particularly those high quality bus routes, drive our zone. Um, and that's why I do not support this amendment and why I support the underlying um, uh, motion of TOD. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Figueroa Cole. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I hate to be repetitive, but I do want to make a stand on, on my decision on this vote, especially since we're in a campaign season, and I know that that weights on a lot of people at this time. So um, according to the Hills Farms website, the first round of construction went on from 1956 to 1964 after the university had hired a firm to develop the master plan for the area. At the same time, the nation was going through major changes. In 1954, we had Brown versus Board of Education. 1955, Emmett Till was murdered and his mother shared his pictures for the world to see. And Rosa Parks became an iconic name. The Civil Rights Act of 1957 against voter suppression was came up. In 1960, Little Ruby Bridges had the courage to face the school system barriers. In 1963, the March on Washington and the bombing of the church on Birmingham, Alabama. And then there was the Civil Rights Act of 1964, preventing employment discrimination based on race, color, sex, religion, and national origin. During the same time, while the Hills Farm was being developed in Madison, Wisconsin. The Southern migration doubled the population of blacks, with, which continued to rapidly increase in the 1950s and 60s. In 1963, there were demonstrations erupted in Milwaukee against segregation in housing and schools. In the midst of all of this, all of these events, redlining practices were used on the city of Madison. All of, all of these changes were happening while the Hills Farm Covenants 
were created with specifications on building sizes and demands on garages, which potentially raised the cost of construction, making it even easier for the redlining to continue to proceed. Today, we replace redlining with words like character, desirable homeowners, hard work, and historical districts. I'm quoting here, make our city from the, from the emails that we got, make our city an interesting and vibrant place. There's no good justification to destroy the character of established neighborhoods. This seems so unjust and so unfair. While, we, while the intent of this legislation may be laudable, it seems likely in its current form to drive stable and desirable homeowners out of the city. The distinct the distinctive architecture and cohesive neighborhood character of Madison historical districts help, help is much of what makes Madison so appealing. My spouse and I work hard all of our lives to be successful and, is, and in a position to afford living in the Hill Farms area. Yesterday, we celebrated the life of Martin Luther King Jr. Many of us participated in those events. I went to, to both of the state and the city county um, activities. I had my phone in silent mode, but I could see the notifications from Hill Farms residents in favor or against the TOD ordinance popping up, while at the same time I was being reminded by the MLK speakers of the housing, housing injustice that's still evident today. I found it ironic, but also very disturbing. Here's where I stand on this matter. I, support this I supported this resolution when, was when it was first introduced. My only concern at the time was, why were historical district districts excluded? I was not given any legal reason or logical explanation for the exclusion. Hence, hence, I am in full support of the amendment to include the historical districts. What makes Madison appealing is the character of his residents not the character of things or the look of houses or the zoning codes. Neighborhoods, neighborhoods are not defined by zoning lines. Neighborhoods are built by people. This is an opportunity to ride the runs and to move, move us forward to a city that is, best, that is the best city in the nation for all, not just for some. As Martin Luther King stated in 1967, again, we have, the, we have deluded ourselves into believing the myth, the myth that capitalism grew and, pros, and prospered out of the Protestant ethic of hard work and sacrifices. Capitalism was built on the exploitation of black slaves and continues to thrive on the exploitation of the poor, both black and white, both here and abroad. abroad. That was in 1967 and it st still remains true today. And finally, for the people that call in favor of the TOD, who live in neighborhoods that are governed by outdated covenants, that use coded language to exclude people or to limit accessibility, I'm making a call to action. Continue your advocacy. Pull those covenants out, scrutinize them, bring them to light, and continue to make change. So I definitely was, I'm stand, and I will, I will not support the, amend, the current amendment. I will... Um, I will continue to support keeping the, the historical districts in it. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Fair. Thank you. Uh, and my comments are going to pale in comparison to that eloquent um, word, those eloquent words. Um, but um, I, I guess a couple things I just want to say. Um, I, I guess I want to start by just saying, like, I... I as someone who represents a, a fairly mostly residential West Side district, I understand to a point um, people's concerns. And I have no doubt that if this was Raymond Road or Schrader Road, for instance, um, which I hope someday it will be, um, but I would have, we would hear the same sort of um, arguments or just, you know, people's worries. I also, think that we do have to sometimes think about when we say things like we want to put housing there, what that sounds like to, to people who are just sitting out in the community hearing what that means. Um, you know, because that we're quote unquote putting housing somewhere where people live, you know, currently. So just, I think we all should just think about that. But, but I think, um, again, um, 
all the comments that have been made have been wonderful. Um, I think what, we're, what we see here, and to kind of get to what Alder Heck was talking about, the reason we, we are hearing from Hill Farms and we haven't heard from some of the east and north side and downtown neighborhoods, I guess not north, but east and downtown, is because for generations of folks who've lived here for a while, they've lived in a, a city that's quite different. It's more of a city feel. Um, so they're, they're sort of used to, um, as was sort of uh, iterated earlier, used to different uses, different developments going up here and there, just a different mix. And the west side is definitely more of a suburban feel, right? And so what we're, what we're really, I think, facing here is just change, and change is hard. Um, and so I, I want to say that I do understand that change. Uh, I understand Alder Tischler's um, pressure that he's feeling from his constituents, because I think I would feel the same, and many of us west side um, Alders would feel that. Um, but I guess I, I don't think this is such drastic change that it's going to destroy that feel of being a little bit suburban and having that yard and, you know, the things that people do um, appreciate. And I know those neighborhoods exist in other parts, not just the west side. But so I think really we are we're, part of this is just very simply change um, and people uh, are, are fearful of change sometimes. We all are. We all can be. Um, but I think we are doing the right thing. I think this is just a piece of the puzzle, right? We've, it has been said many times, this is not going to, uh, you know, create a whole bunch of affordable housing and like f solve our problems, but just a piece of the puzzle and a big program that I think the city is doing a pretty darn good job of. And we have a lot more to do. Um, and, and I hope that we can um, turn down this amendment and then support the underlying motion. Thank you. Thank you, Alder, Alder Tischler for the second time. All right, Alder, Alder, you, you, yeah, thank you for your comments, but you don't, you don't know how I've- uh, Alder uh, Tischler, please so, address the chair. Okay, uh, Mayor, people, people don't, can't make assumptions on how, how others feel. Um, I just want to make a correction. It, it's, the correct term is, is it's University Hill Farms. Um, and, and as uh, Alder Figueroa Cole has pointed out and gave, and, and gave us some uh, history is, it, yes, the university was involved. It worked with, the university worked with the Common Council back in the 1950s to uh, address a, uh, a housing crisis. Um, I think what's, what I think is important here and why, why we're hearing from a lot of people in that, in that district uh, is I've, you know, I've spent time and as, as uh, um, Alder Furman has pointed out, I, you know, I have been talking early on and engaging and, and meeting and uh, providing people with, with, with a balanced uh, information um, so they can form their own opinions. And I'm, I'm listening and asking them to, to provide feedback for me, feedback for the rest of us. But I think what's, what's, what I think is good that's coming out of this and why it's important to set aside and preserve just a small segment of, of, our, of our city uh, to preserve is because it allows us to have these conversations. Um, and I, that's what I, I think is important. We're, we're, we're learning about, uh, you know, the, the Madison's past, which is, which is by no means perfect. And so by, I think by setting aside small little chunks of our city, it's going to continue to have these conversations over and over again, which I think is good. So that is why I'm asking to set aside just a small sliver of our, our, our city's history. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Paulson. Yeah, so with TOD, um, you know, I'm in the third district, uh, and the, the metro director likes to tell me that, you know, in the red redesign, uh, the third district is getting the, the biggest improvement. Uh, we're getting a lot more metro service. Um, and, and while that's true, we still don't actually uh, get enough service that we are part of TOD. So um, someday, I hope uh, that we've got 50 minute headway down Milwaukee Street and coming back Cottage Grove. And I went and measured, and my house would fall in uh, TOD. Uh, it's got about 50, makes it by about 50 feet. Um, so uh, someday. But um, You know, we've, uh, TOD is a lot more than just um, single family uh, homes being rezoned into, into duplexes. I mean, uh, TOD is uh, 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 increasing density, changing the way uh, buildings are oriented to the streets, changing parking minimums, doing a lot of stuff all across the city. Uh, and we have seemingly kind of dived into uh, 
duplexes uh, in uh, the single family homes uh, in, in the historic districts. And so I want to touch on kind of two parts of that. And I'll start, I think, uh, with the historic districts. Um, and so there's, there's sort of two questions. Um, you know, first off, uh, can a historic district have a duplex in it and still be still remain historic? And I think the answer is yes, it probably can. I think we can, uh, if if uh, if there were duplexes along uh, the the bus routes in in Hill Farms that were approved by the uh, Architecture Review Commission or Review Committee of, of Hill Farms, uh, which is going to take a very uh, close look at the appropriateness and. Uh, the, the criteria that makes Hill Farms, uh, and, and I apologize to my colleague from the 11th, I'm gonna just call it Hill Farms as a save a, a word there. Um, uh, uh, you know, to, to continue, uh, Hill Farms, uh, uh, the, the physical characteristics that make it qualify for the National Historic uh, uh, Registry uh, 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 membership and the benefits thereof, um, you know, certainly I think that's possible. Right, um, and and the architecture review commission committee is there to to preserve that uh, integrity. Uh, if someone comes in and uh, tries to to rezone um, without TOD to put in a duplex, um, or if because of uh, because of the duplex or because of the uh, the TOD ordinances uh, that. Uh, those duplexes are permitted by right from from a city perspective. Uh, so, pro so long as they get the approval of of the architecture review commission, they can uh, uh, build that and and put that in. And so, um, I want uh, the folks in Hill Farms to have that opportunity, to have that ability to 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 do that without going through the expensive and uh, quite possibly not going to succeed. Uh, rezoning effort. Instead, I want to have that uh, uh, opportunity made uh, available to them, just like we're making it available to everyone else across the city. Whether or not they avail, avail themselves of it, can't say. Uh, but I want them to have that as an opportunity because, um, because it's an important uh, corridor that's got the good transit that uh, folks out in the third district don't have the opportunity to have. I want the folks that do get this investment from the city to have that opportunity to be able to add in a, uh, a couple more uh, units. Uh, and I'm confident that they will be able to do it in a way that doesn't jeopardize the overall historic district because they have a review process that, that will protect it. And I think we've established that tonight. We talked to uh, one of the chairs of the past chairs of the review commission. He talked about how they would review something that would change the footprint. I'm confident we've got that. Uh, if we've talked to the planning director about the challenges of having to go through something to rezone it um, uh, without the TOD. Um, and so I think the TOD brings benefits uh, to the folks in the historic district. Now again, the economics are probably not gonna work out all that often. You're not gonna come in and uh, buy a duplex, buy a single family home, tear it down, turn it, uh, rebuild it as a duplex. Is that my 10 minutes already? Okay, thank you. I have been going, I have been going for a while, so. Um, um, so, yeah, um, let me get my train of thought here going. Um, so I, I think the, uh, the historic uh, characteristics of Hill Farms will be able to be preserved um, with TOD because there are, uh, uh, there are measures in place to preserve that. And so I'm confident that we are not jeopardizing the historic integrity of, of Hill Farms by allowing uh, TOD, uh, by TOD allowing additional density without um, uh, a ton of additional uh, bureaucracy uh, and approval processes. And that's the only change, right? No one's going to come in tomorrow and buy them all up and tear them all down and put them into a duplex. First off, they probably get a beat. Second off, uh, it's not economical. Um, same thing as, um, as would happen if uh, someone came in and tore, tried to tear one of them down and build something crazy that doesn't fit at all the historic uh, characteristics, which by zoning right, they could do that today. They could put in something funky and modern, um, which might be kind of cool for house hunters, but isn't going to fit uh, in uh, the historic context of, of that neighborhood. Um, so that protection is there. I mean, realistically in Hill Farms, it's going to take like, um, you know, some... Uh, 
you know, force majeure and, and God help us, hopefully not a fire or something to, to have kind of a blank slate and insurance to start over. So it's not likely to make a, a lot of big changes, but if there are opportunities for someone to do that, I want them to have that uh, opportunity. So um, the local districts, I think we've already well established that um, we've got the, the Landmarks Commission, uh, whom I, I uh, trust to, to, to use their expertise to tell us if uh, uh, a change is, is uh, compatible or not. And so, you know, if it comes down to should Hill Farms be included in TOD, um, yes, I think it should because we have the opportunity uh, to make life easier should they have the opportunity to, to build a duplex. Uh, and B, we uh, all the mechanisms play are, are in place to protect the historic integrity. So I am very comfortable uh, including Hill Farms um, uh, in uh, in the TOD, uh, along with any of our other single-family uh, districts that are along um, along the, tra the the transit corridors, um, and uh, and yeah, I will stop there because I've been rambling, and maybe it has been ten minutes. So, uh, so thank you for trying to follow me. Thank you, Alder, Alder Harrington McKinney. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I. There's been a, a lot of comment about uh, the Hills Farm area, but um, um, where I want to be assured is uh, community engagement. And so Heather said that, and she can um, uh, correct me if I was um, incorrect, but there was um, opportunity for community impact, uh, input. And so my singular question is was there um, ample opportunity for the voices to be heard um, that this will impact? And so um, the, the communities that spoke up was Hills Farm, the Hills Farm area. So my singular question is, is that was the opportunity presented to other voices to weigh in on this, and they chose not to. And so that's what I'm looking for, the opportunities to weigh in, and they chose not to do that. Thank you, Alder. No other Alders in the queue wishing to speak on the amendment. So the amendment before us is amendment number two, which would remove the historic districts from the transit-oriented development overlay. All those in favor of removal, aye. Those opposed, no. As your name is called, then the clerk will please call the roll. Alder Tischler. Alder Tischler, aye. Alder Vetter. Alder Vetter, no. Alder Revere. No. Alder Revere, no. Alder Vitiver. Aye. Alder Vitiver, aye. Alder Wahelia. Aye. Alder Wahelia, aye. Alder Benford. Aye. Alder Benford, aye. Alder Bennett. No. Alder Bennett, no. Alder Carter. Come back to me. Very well. Alder Conklin. No. Alder Conklin, no. Alder Curry. Alder Curry, no. Alder Evers. No. Alder Evers, no. Alder Figueroa Cole. No. Alder Figueroa Cole, no. Alder Foster. No. Alder Foster, no. Alder Furman. No. Alder Furman, no. Alder Harrington McKinney. Same. Alder Heck. No. Alder Heck, no. Alder Madison. Madison, I. Alder Miyadze. Abstain. Miyadze, I. Abstain. Oh, abstain. I apologize. I thought you said the same. Uh, Alder Paulson. No. Alder Paulson, no. Alder Fair. No. Alder Fair, no. Alder Carter. Alder Carter? Aye. Alder Carter, aye. I show six ayes, 12 noes, two abstentions. With 12 noes, the amendment fails. We're back to the main motion, which is to adopt the second substitute. Further discussion, Alder Evers. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to move the first amendment to the second substitute. And I could just speak very briefly. This amendment. Uh, Alder, needs... let's get a second first. So yeah. Alder Evers will move 
The First Amendment, seconded by Alder Vitiver. Go ahead, Alder Evers. Yeah, I'll speak at more length in discussion, but this uh, amendment keeps the historic districts but restricts conversions to duplexes in the very same manner that we currently restrict ADUs uh, and that we would require owner occupancy. Thank you, Alder. So moved and seconded uh, Amendment 1, which requires owner occupancy for duplexes. Is there uh, questions? Are there questions for staff on this one? Alder Furman. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, this is a question for Heather. Um, I'd like a better understanding of what uh, the effect on the market this would, would be and why did staff consider this? And if so, why didn't they go forward with this previously? Um, I'm not sure what the impact on the market would be, but the, the limitation would essentially mean that in order to add a second dwelling unit to a single family home within the TOD, um, the property owner would need to live in one of the, one of the resulting units. And so I, I think that it would, I, I'm, I'm thinking out loud here, but it would essentially just restrict these unit additions to um, to something that was taken on by an existing property owner who's intending to stay in the home, uh, continuing to live in the home. Um, this was something that the plan commission did consider and did not end up recommending uh, move forward. And um, the sponsors of the TOD uh, elected not to move forward with this nuance as well. But it's something that, um, you know, staff was aware what, uh, was of interest to at least one alder. Um, thank you. Could you provide a little bit more detail? Are you able to provide any more detail on why the, the sponsors? Obviously, I don't necessarily want you to speak for them, but was any feedback provided that you can provide us this evening on, on why it wasn't pursued or maybe what some of the arguments were at Plan Commission against doing this? Sure, I, I guess I, I don't want to speak for anyone, but I think that, you know, there was a recognition that a move in this direction would be sort of counter to um, other policy changes we're pursuing at the same time, acknowledging that we're a renter majority city. Um, why, you know, the, the question was asked, why would we put another layer of, um, of regulation in place to ensure owner occupancy would be the only way to move forward with the creation of another housing unit. So that was that was kind of the essence of the discussion. But I would definitely defer to to sponsors to share more. That was that was helpful. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Are there other questions, Alder Evers? Is it a question? Yes. Go ahead. Yes, uh, Heather. Um, isn't it possible that a developer could? Um, uh, develop, a, purchase a property, demolish it and create, or not even demolish it, just convert it to a duplex and then sell it to uh, a, uh, you know, a, a, a family that chooses to live in one half. So it's not yes. just, a, so that that's a, an additional possibility, correct? That's correct. So that that regulation would run with the property over time. And so if right. when the property would be sold, there would still be that restriction that the future owner would need to also live there. Correct. And is, isn't it true that we also have this restriction with the addition currently of an additional unit in throughout the city with ADUs? I mean, it's not an uncommon restriction and we had reasons for doing it with ADUs, did we not? Yeah, and I can look to my colleagues, Matt and Katie, behind me here in, in case they have anything to add. But yes, that it is the case with accessory dwelling units today that that restriction is in place. So it's not, what what is being suggested here is not a foreign concept. That's all I'm trying to make the point on, correct? Correct. I think the accessory dwelling units are the only case that I can think of where that is in place as a regulation by the city. Is that Anything else? Okay. For, for those of you not in the room, the zoning folks are nodding yes. <laughs> uh, further questions? Alder was no. Okay. Alder Paulson, questions? Yeah, question that actually is a follow up to the, the previous two. Um, and, and staff may not know this, um, uh, but do we have any anecdotal data um, from? from ADUs, so an ADU is actually 
though it's permitted, it's still a fairly large investment, right? You're not going to, you know, if you're, if you're in for an ADU, you're in for $100,000 of, or more of, of, of fun. I have a friend who's building one right now, and uh, it's, it's quite the adventure uh, as we watch her uh, watch this go up in her backyard on Facebook. Um, but because they have this restriction that in order to, uh, you know, use the ADU, uh, the owner has to occupy it, um, you know, if you've now added, you know, you refied on, a, you know, you've taken up some home equity and you put on, you use that to put on an ADU and so you've got another 100,000, uh, you know, on your property and you now you go to sell it. Do we have any idea what that's looking like in the market? I mean, are these things able to sell uh, even though, you know, you now have, might have to pay $550,000 for a $400,000 house because you've got a second unit that you don't really want to be a landlord and you don't have a granny you want to move in yet. Um, or are, do we have any sense of, is that impacting anyone's ability to sell these things and, and move them? Mr. Tucker? Uh, yeah, hi, good evening. Um, since we've started uh, allowing ADUs, I'm not aware of any that have been built and have turned over and sold. But we have had eight, like ADUs or secondary dwelling units in homes that were built, you know, many many years ago. Uh, it's a highly unusual scenario. It's a unique finance. It's a unique buyer. Uh, it's often not a first time buyer. It's someone who's coming in, typically looking for that or with more cash that they can bring to the table because. You can't do conventional lending on them typically, um, just for those ADUs. They're they're quite unique in that regard. Are those scenarios where you have a second dwelling unit? Um, we're only about ten years into our experiment here of ADUs in its contemporary form, and only have maybe twenty twenty five that have been constructed. So haven't seen any turnover. That I'm aware of. Okay, thank you. Thank you, other. There are other. Questions? If not, the motion before us is amendment. Oh, Alder Evers? Another question? No, that was just getting ready for discussion. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, uh, seeing no other questions, uh, the amendment before us is amendment one, requiring owner occupancy for duplexes. Alder Evers, discussion. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, at that December 12th Plan Commission meeting, Alder Paulson, uh, I recall that he admitted that he had switched his position on historic districts. Originally, he was inclined to ex exclude the local historic districts, but include the national, but that he came to believe that the local, as we've heard tonight, have in intrinsic protections through landmarks where the nationals only have tax breaks. And he closed by saying, we may need to backtrack to do something to protect the National Historic Districts. And then we got a hold of Heather Bailey's memo, which we talked about tonight, how that the TOD overlay with respect to the National Historic Districts could also increase development pressures that result in demolitions rather than adaptive reuse of the existing structures. So it got me thinking, what, what do we mean by these development pressures? Just what are these? And why is it that Robert Proctor of the Realtors Association of South Central Wisconsin is so gung-ho about the TOD overlayer? Why is Bill Connors, head of Smart Growth, such an enthusiastic supporter? And, uh, you know, Alder Figaro Cole talked about capitalism and, and uh, Alder Bennett about equity. But let's remember that the private sector, that capitalism, which provides most of our housing in this country, does not inherently regard housing as a human right and that the speculative real estate market does not explicitly or in any way really value equity. So we have to think about what's at stake. We talked earlier about naturally occurring affordable housing and we have programs in our city joining with organizations like Sustain Gain to take some of our, to upgrade some of our old housing stocks in neighborhoods like Bay Creek and Greenbush and Bram's Edition. And we have to consider what happens during economic downturns, like in the Great Recession or, or during the pandemic, where, where some of these distressed properties uh, go into foreclosure and they get purchased by speculative uh, investors who are looking to then not have them as uh, sell them to someone who can own them, 
to a starter family or, or, or somebody who historically has been denied access to home ownership, but turn them into rental properties, fixing them up and driving up the price of rents and actually the price of housing in that community is called gentrification. So what we're what I'm suggesting here with this amendment is that we, as we have done in the city, we recognize the value of home ownership. We did this with the conversion of, uh, by, by restricting the conversion of single family properties to duplexes, we're doing the exact same thing we're doing with the restrictions on ADU, ADUs, where we would require owner occupancy in one of the two units, units or one of the three if there was also an ADU. Owner occupancy conversion to a duplex could help the empty nester stay in the neighborhood and pay the high property taxes on a fixed income. Owner -occup occupancy conversion to a duplex can help that young couple just starting out to move into a neighborhood and see that their, their purchase would transform into an income producing asset by renting out the other half. So what happens if we do this and we find out that it's too restrictive as, as Heather mentioned with, as the possibility why staff or, or the sponsors or the plan commission didn't go along with it? That, not enough conversions are taking place. Well, then we could relax it further at a different time. But moving, moving ahead without doing this now runs the risk of losing some of these natural occurring affordable housing in, in neighborhoods like Graham's Edition, Bay Creek and Greenbush. And by the way, Greenbush only has 25% owner occupancy where the city average is approximately 50%. So we lose these properties to speculative real estate investors who care only about their bottom line, who focus their capital, their resources towards profit making and not ensuring greater ac equity and access. Now, I don't know if this was in the kind of backtracking that Alder Paulson, Paulson was suggested, but what I am suggesting is a compromise here, that we keep the historic districts in the TOD we put a damp towel on the enthusiasm of the speculative real estate market while recognizing the value of home ownership. We can accommodate growth and accommodate people's needs at the same time. I ask that your consideration and support of this amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Foster. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I will not be supporting this amendment, um, and I will share my perspective as a sponsor of the uh, legislation to um, update our ADU codes as well as um, what's before us tonight. Um, actually, uh, the rationale, um, at least on from my part, um, and I believe it was shared by at least my other sponsors of the ADU regulation, um, is that the the ADU change was actually very different, um, and we were looking to really be as permissive as possible in terms of the form of that, the location of that within a lot. And it really, um, it's very different than what we do for primary dwellings in terms of setbacks, et cetera. And so the rationale um, from my end in terms of the owner occupancy requirement was number one, um, just literally being aware of the potential pushback from um, making the construction of ADUs uh, permitted use rather than a conditional use, which it had been, and also acknowledging that um, there it was a little bit more wide open in terms of what could be what could be done. That it was we didn't have nearly the experience that we do have with our um, building form codes for either single family or uh, duplex construction, and so the thought was that it would be less likely um, for something very obtrusive to be built and as an ADU if we had that owner occupancy uh, requirement. That being said, um, both myself and, and at least one of the other sponsors were very much even on the fence at that point of whether we should include that and felt like it was reasonable to include as a starting point. But I expect that that, um, that requirement very well may be revisited and probably should be revisited in the future as it relates to ADUs. Um, in terms of trying to extend that logic, to the construction of a duplex, I actually don't think it makes any sense at all. I think we have plenty of experience and confidence with our building form code related to duplexes. 
And there's really nothing to be gained by requiring uh, owner occupancy in, in one of those units. Um, and that's why I do not support uh, this amendment. Thanks. Thank you, Alder. Alder Miyadze? I do uh, support uh, uh, Alder Evers' uh, recommendation uh, and proposal. I mean, when we talk about housing in, in Madison, we really need to talk about what kind of housing. And this is, I think this amendment really, really talks to, mm. really resonates with me that we need to uh, approve this one. It sounds it sounds a lot better when we talk about um, housing and what kind of housing we need. Thank you, Alder. Alder Paulson. Yeah, I'm having some trouble with this one. Um, and uh, if my colleague from the 13th is going to speak uh, again later, uh, perhaps you can uh, address some of those questions. But um, what I'm having some trouble with here is that we don't um, we don't require this on other duplexes. None of the duplexes that are in the the third district uh, would would have this. Um, and so, you know, from from my perspective, it's just a um, you know what's different about the duplexes in TOD um, from the duplexes that are in you know the uh, an SRC three district in in the third district. Um, so that's that's kind of where I'm getting a little little hung up. Um, that you know we're going to all this trouble to to make it easier for folks to to build a duplex um, along a transit route, um, and and then the first thing we we turn around and do is we make it uh, harder to to use that uh, by making it unrestricted. But somewhere else in in the city where where a duplex is permitted, that no such re, uh, requirement uh, applies, and and I don't see what's special about the duplexes in a um, in a in an SRC one district um, in in the TO in the TOD versus an SL SRC three district outside of the TRD where a duplex is is, is permitted. I, I guess I think they're in the SRC one and C three. Um, uh, in case I didn't get those uh, zoning districts right, but I'm pretty sure those are right. Um, but I don't, I, I don't get it. Right. So why, why we would do this only in the TOD and not do it anywhere else? Um, you know, something I've been thinking about doing, and and I'm not going to do tonight. Don't worry. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, proposing, and I actually expect perhaps someone in the next council would, having seen some of the the candidates and some of their platforms, that at some point someone is going to propose that um, we abolish um, uh, single family zoning uh, entirely uh, in the city of Madison and and permit duplexes or maybe even fourplexes um, uh, everywhere that you can have a single family unit home. Um, in which case, then we would be in this awkward position. Well, what do we do about for um, the uh, for the TOD ones? But um, but I guess I, I'm coming back to um, why is a duplex in uh, TOD? Treat are different than a duplex somewhere else in the city, uh, where we've had lots of experience with people uh, having duplexes. Uh, it's for the most part fine. Um, you know, the uh, the worst neighbors I've ever had uh, were in a single family home, um, and uh, gosh, I was happy when they moved away. Um, uh, so I, I I just don't I don't get it here, uh, and so I'm not inclined to support it. But uh, you know, my my friend from the 13th, I'm. Uh, hoping he can maybe help me understand this when uh, he has a chance to come around here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alder. Uh, Alder Evers, for the second time. Yeah, thank you, Mary. I, Alder Poston, that's a good question. And I uh, think. Please address uh, the chair. Uh, Mayor Alder Poston's question was a good question. Thank you, Alder. <laughs> um, you know, and I think the difference is, is that we're speaking to um, the idea that transit access in the TOD is an amenity, a desirable amenity, and the and that there is a you know increased development pressures along and rightfully so, so within the TOD. But it's also this notion of home ownership um, is is sort of a way to try to meet 
these neighborhoods halfway. And the, the incidence of problems with absentee owners is something that to be considered. Now, there are a lot of good landlords in our community. But when we do have problems with nuisances, with respect to rental properties, generally speaking, they're absentee landlords, people who don't live in the neighborhood, in the city, or even in the state. And it, there's an increased likelihood that you're going to have more complaints. If you have an owner on site, there's less likelihood. So to me, this seemed like a reasonable compromise. When you talked about backtracking and looking out for the interest, perhaps of people who felt threatened by this change, I see this as kind of a incremental step and we may remove that at a, at a later date. But I also felt with the enthusiasm of the, the Realtors Association and Smart Growth that putting a somewhat damp, dampening effect upon that, uh, that speculative pressure and, and, and requiring some that kind of the presence in the community and the neighborhood could be, could be a good thing. And I, I suggest that if we find it's too restrictive, we can remove it at a later date, but I think it's a compromise that gets the historic districts in the TOD and allows us to move forward. Thank you, Alder. Alder Harrington McKinney. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, um, Madam Mayor, I will be supporting um, this that uh, put forward by my colleague because he really nailed where my hesitance is, is because in the district that I serve, um, absentee landlords um, is not a, uh, an oddity. I mean, it is a, it's a fact. And in so many of these duplexes, they are owned by individuals who don't have any investment in the community, have no investment in the city, who buys these projects and don't even um, keep them up. And so that would be my, my basic concern is that if they lived in that area, then they would be encouraged to at least Keep those uh, keep those properties up, and so I am absolutely going to uh, sub um, to support this because um, it is a way to number one um, um, protect some of the historic districts, but but more importantly, it provides an opportunity that if you're going to own a duplex that you will live in that duplex and the upkeep of that duplex will be guaranteed as well. And so there's two sides of it for me, and, but I will be supporting this amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. I have no other Alders in the queue wishing to speak to the amendment. Alder Paulson for the second time. I have a question for staff, I apologize. All right, Alder, go ahead. Um, go ahead, Alder. Um, if we, uh, because this is, I'm a little confused if this is a, a zoning or a, a zoning change to things or a, just an ordinance change to things, and, and I'm concerned about up zoning and down zoning and, and requirements there. Um, uh, if we don't pass this uh, tonight uh, as part of TOD and when this all goes into effect, can we add it later with, uh, with a... Um, uh, exception uh, for anyone who may have uh, already been using it. Yes. Is so it, it is just a supplemental regulation in the zoning code. So it, it could either happen in conjunction with this or, or separately. Okay, and if, and if anyone somehow manages to build a duplex before the council again comes back and does it in two weeks, uh, they would still have the right to continue to use that duplex? Or, uh, yes. Okay. It would Are, be difficult to enforce, and I'll look at Matt and Katie again in case they have more to add. But Thank you, Alder. Okay, I guess if I can speak to a second time then. Well, uh, you've spurred a whole nother round of questions, I fear. 
So, right. uh, so perhaps we could uh, dispense with the questions to see I, if they follow up, and we'll come back to you. Okay. Um, all their Vitiver questions? No comment. Okay. Uh, all their Tischler question? No. Okay. So go ahead, Alder Paulson. Yeah, I'm still uh, struggling with this one a little bit, um, and. And my preference is not to do it uh, again because I'm uh, I don't think it's justified uh, to treat some duplexes in TOD different. Uh, you know, let's set aside all the historic districts. Let's just talk about TOD on uh, on Monroe. You know, the the single family homes that on Monroe Street um, uh, could now be turned into duplexes, or the the ones on Atwood, or the ones up Northport, or anywhere across the city that have also had all of this change. Um, and I'm just not sure that um, um, why, again, why the duplexes in TOD, it just doesn't seem quite convincing enough that those should be uh, treated separate than the, uh, than the duplexes somewhere else. So I'm not inclined to support this. But at the same time, I appreciate that um, you know one way uh, owner occupied duplexes of one half of it is um, I think going to be something we see more of, um, and it's uh, you know maybe a, a good strategy uh, to help cut down on absentee landlordism. So I, I appreciate it, uh, and um, and I don't know I'm going to still hem and haw over it till right up until the vote, but. Um, my my inclination is not to do it. It's it's reassuring to know that if we vote it down, we can think about it some more and have a little bit more discussion uh, and and add it uh, in the near future, perhaps before this gets away from us uh, and we've created any problems just yet. So so even if we don't pass it tonight, perhaps we can bring it back and in a couple of weeks and have some committees discuss it a l in a little bit more detail um, and, and move forward that way. So I guess kind of my thinking in real time is evolving where I'm probably going to vote against this tonight, but it's good to know that we have the option to bring it back uh, in light of more discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Vitiver. Wasn't sure if I was still in. Okay. Um, so I, along with Alder Evers, represent near campus districts. I want to be crystal clear that the pressures on near campus districts are very different from other parts of the city. These are very transient populations, typically absentee landlords. You walk down the street, you will absolutely see the difference between owner occupied versus non owner occupied buildings. There are lots of noise complaints, lots of issues with um, trash collection, sidewalks, grass, et cetera. Um, so this proposal just helps a little bit to mitigate those things. It is a modest tweak, again, to try to help keep things from going south too fast. It is gonna be much, much harder to put the genie back in the bottle to go the other way. If we keep it owner-occupied now and we need to change it later, that's gonna be an easier change. And I also just wanna address that if the argument is why should duplexes be in TOD different than we really should say, why are we doing a TOD at all? Why shouldn't we just upzone the whole city? So really we've got to, <laughs> and maybe that's the direction we'll go, but right now we're looking at TOD. So, so this is a stepwise approach, helps protect the current owners, um, even though some of their concerns may be really far-fetched, it does help give them that feeling of security that they are not going to have their single family homes bought up and turned into multifamily units tomorrow. Thanks. Thank you, Alder. Alder Tischler. Yeah, one of the places that I am looking forward to returning to now that the pandemic is winding down or a version of it is, um, is to uh, make a trip back to uh, Disney World. Um, and I say that because uh, Disney World is situated uh, across you know major highways and uh, this was advanced knowledge that, that, that Walt Disney knew, and that's why it was laid out the way it is. Looking back at history, knowing where things are going to be is a way to uh, give somebody an advantage. Um, so I'm just making that connection between transportation and, and wealth. Um, and again, 
wealth, privilege, you know, the ability to transfer wealth to, to next generation is, is important. And I think uh, home ownership and creating an ability for people to own a home and to transfer it to their, to their children um, and to others, uh, loved ones, are, I think is important. So I'm, I'm supporting this. I think this is, a, is an excellent idea. Um, and I'm, I'm very, I'm very uh, appreciative of, of, of Alder Evers to, to, uh, to uh, bring this up. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Heck. Mayor, um, I'm, I'm kind of concerned about some of the things I'm hearing about the characterization of renters. Uh, there are hundreds of thousands of people who live in rented properties in Madison, in and out of historic districts, in and out of the TOD overlay district, and almost all of them are great neighbors. We, there's, I totally recognize that there are problematic tenants throughout the city, but it's certainly a small, small minority. And when there are problems, we do have ordinances and, and staff that can help. It's difficult for them because they're overworked, but it's not impossible. And I, I feel like we're forgetting about, we're talking about increasing our housing supply and also decreasing emissions by having reasonable transit options. And I think we're losing sight of that. Um, we're, we're so concerned about those few who are perhaps bad tenants or absentee landlords, it's a real problem, that what we're doing is denying housing opportunities and housing options for, for people. I, I think of a, of a little rental in, in my neighborhood, very reasonably priced, really small house. Uh, it's a rental. Uh, the owner wants to build an ADU above the garage and rent both. He can't. And for that reason, I'm also in favor of getting rid of the owner occupancy, re occupancy, occupancy requirement for ADUs that we put in. Uh, as Alder Foster mentioned, we had some other set of concerns, so I'd wanna think that through. But we need to focus on increasing housing opportunities and uh, not restricting them. So I, I certainly uh, won't be supporting this. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Carter. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to say that I am going to be supporting this. I have had uh, several years of experience of um, absentee landlords, and I will say that even in the conditions that their tenants were living in, the tenants were still good neighbors, um, but they deserve better. And so I am gonna be supporting this. This is a good compromise. I agree with um, uh, Alder Vitavera, whereas we can always um, take it out, but it's very hard to put it back in. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Bennett? Sure. Um, I just want to quickly jump in and say I don't really consider this a compromise. I consider it um, a back-end way of achieving what the first substitute that we just voted down. Um, <laughs> I think it's, I don't want to say most, but I, I, to me it seems like a lot of people that would want to create these duplexes might not want to have it owner occupied and it's just another hurdle to jump over um, for having renters. And I also want to say that it's having, as a landlords is certainly a real issue and it's prevalent downtown where you see all these rundown houses but I think that having them owner occupied is not necessarily going to make sure that all these houses become, or that that um, they will be maintained. It comes down to us as alders informing our residents about tenant rights, informing them about how to contact building inspection, about making sure that there's resources for homeowners or whatever apartment owners to be able to 
keep up their housing. Um, and at the end of the day, I think that adding to our ho housing stock and providing more housing is way more important um, than appeasing the concerns of a few. So um, with that, it's gonna be a no for me once again. Thank you, Alder, Alder Harrington McKinney. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I would invite um, uh, some of the commenters to drive through um, neighborhoods that uh, that's in the, the our, my current district to drive through um, uh, Elver the Elver Park neighborhoods to see the condition of some of those duplexes. And people, many people that look like me, have to live in um, duplexes where complaints have been made over and over. And then also some tenants fearing to complain uh, to build an inspection because that's all that they can afford. And so absentee landlords is an issue. It's a problem. Maybe it's not a problem where other people are, but it is a problem in the district that I serve. And the unfortunate thing is, is that many of the individuals who are living in these duplexes, um, they cannot do better. In some of those duplexes, they try to fix up, they try to uh, maintain a quality of living, but they have out-of-state residents who are making no investments in the property. And so when you're looking at the city as a whole, we need to start looking at those properties that uh, the city cannot reach in unless a occupant complains. And those complaints are limited because of, uh, of, of those kinds of challenges. And so I stand with um, my colleague, I will be supporting this. And um, the other rhetoric about just a few um, individuals, it's not even about the, um, 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 what is it, the Hills Farm or those kinds of uh, areas. It really is about looking at the city and those areas that do need that owner-occupied uh, owner um, caveat. And I agree that once it's out of the box, you can't push it back in. So I will continue to support um, the what's before us now and the First Amendment. Thank you, Alder. Alder Madison. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So um, I believe Regina said about like including it, or we can, you know, we can always Alder go Vitiver. back. Alder Vitiver. Alder Vitiver. Um, yeah, so about including it and it can be including it now and we can go back and make changes later. And I only say this as someone who spends a considerable amount of time uh, tracking down landlords um, and trying to advocate for tenants to get what they need. Um, and that's very, very difficult. And there's not a lot of funding uh, being provided from both the city and the county to help providers track those landlords down and then once tracked down to make improvements on those properties. So at minimum, I believe this hopefully will provide some controls in the beginning with some edits later on as needed. But I, do, I just want my, I just want this body to understand the difficulty in trying to advocate for clients with landlords who are not present and the conditions that it creates for those tenants. And so sometimes we're providing housing but we're providing very substandard housing and we absolutely provide very substandard housing across the city of Madison. Um, so, and I don't know how to explain that, the heaviness of that and make it realized for everybody. But I do want you to know that we live and work in a city where we absolutely provide very low standards of housing. And it's accepted because there is this fear about reporting uh, what you're human needs are. So that's that. Thank you, Alder. Alder Heck for the second time. 
Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I wanted to recognize uh, that I appreciate what Alders, uh, Madison, and Harrington McKinney had to say. I, I, I certainly understand that it's, it's not just a few absentee landlords, certainly, but I also wanted to remind them and, and, and my colleagues that we're talking only about historic districts in the TOD overlay. We're not talking about the entire city. Uh, generally, one could say that those neighborhoods are relatively privileged compared to some of the, the places that we, that we might have been discussing recently. Uh, and for that reason, I, I, I still won't be supporting this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alder Evers, it would be for the third time. Well, uh, just to, yes, thank you, Mayor. To clarify, the amendment is not addressing just the historic districts of the TOD. Uh, I, Mayor, if Alder Heck could realize that the amendment is to apply to the entire TOD, and he spoke to say that this would apply to just the historic districts in the TOD. The requirement would uh, for owner occupancy and the conversion of a single family home in the TOD to a duplex would restrict it to owner occupancy throughout the TOD. Wanted to make that clear. Thank and you. And I will Thank just you. one last one last thing I will add is that the majority of the benefits of the TOD are going to be on the transit routes themselves. That's where we're going to see the greatest benefit, and we're, that's preserved with this amendment. Thank you for clarifying, Alder. I'll just remind us all that we have traditionally limited ourselves to speaking twice on an item. Um, and Alder Heck, you would be for the third time. Y'all are killing me. Uh, I, I apologize for not understanding the amendment, but in, in my mind, it doesn't make it better. It makes it even worse. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. OK. Alder Curry. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm hoping that there may be somebody in queue after me because I feel similar to what Alder Paulson said about feeling conflicted. I do appreciate what Alders Madison, McKinney, um, ha Harrington, and um, Alder Vidiver have shared about nuisance properties, I guess, from my experience of helping folks who are homeless and housing insecure get into housing and knowing sometimes the desperation is real to take housing that is, isn't suitable or safe or even decent, and how sometimes it is extremely hard to hold those who maintain those properties or are responsible, responsible for them um, accountable. But I also struggle with the fact that um, developing, purchasing, renovating um, residential houses, industrial, it takes capital. And I worry about slowing down our production, our ability to produce the housing that we so desperately need um, if this is, if this uh, substitute amendment, I think that's what we're on, passes. Um, and so it feels like being in a really hard spot um, and I guess I'll say this to be very vulnerable. After almost being an alder for two years and working in housing and homelessness, I don't know, have the solution. I still don't know. I wish I could rack my brain and come up with the motion today that kind of addresses all of the concerns um, and comes to a compromise. So um, I guess I say that to say and, and latch on to Alder Bennett's call to action of us being policymakers and being able to create policy that influences or mitigates some of the risk consequences, um, fears that we have of, of having that heavy um, responsibility of, of leadership and making hard votes. But um, I don't, I'm, I'm stuck and I'm hoping that someone maybe has some solution or answer that could lend to what we're hearing of um, how to hold homeowners, especially those who don't have ties or property owners who don't have ties to our city accountable while increasing our housing stock and providing safe, decent, affordable, and uh, addressing segregation within um, our city. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Foster. I think this you, is the second um, time. <laughs> this is the second for me, yes, thank you. Um, I. Um, you know these conversations have a tendency to to, to drift and, and go all over the place i just want everybody to really understand what we're talking about here 
Um, this, you know, if we actually believe that the the conditions, let's just limit it to duplexes, that the conditions in duplexes across the city cause, um, you know, very bad situ living situations for tenants and for neighbors of residents in duplexes, then we should stop talking about this right now and we should just change and require owner occupancy for all duplexes across the city. There is no logical reason to do this as part of this TOD overlay, except to placate the folks that have been emailing us and, and speaking tonight, wanting to protect their precious single family neighborhood. And so the idea that we would put a restriction in place to protect the most privileged in our city from whatever negative consequences might come from having a building that's owned by someone who doesn't live there, that's providing housing for two different households, that we would, we would take this extraordinary measure and do that here and then leave the rest of, of renters and neighbors of duplexes across the city where we have plenty of them. And we say there it's okay because you're not in the TOD because you didn't used to have this protection, this redlining against this. It's just this, I mean, this is the stuff that Alder Bennett was talking about. And we've now found ourselves in this position where we're talking about this as somehow a compromise. And we're talking about some real issues with tenants and landlords in our city. I don't believe this is the answer across our city. I don't believe we should go and, and require owner occupancy for every duplex in the city. And if others don't believe that, then we shouldn't do it for TOD. And I think we just need to, we, we need to vote this down. And if people are concerned about party houses, if they're concerned about student housing, causing garbage, et cetera, then we need to look at what we're doing to deal with problem situations, whether they're in TOD or not, because all of our residents deserve these protections, the people that live in these buildings and the people that live next to these buildings, it has nothing to do with TOD. So let's not start trying to create some new restrictions and only apply it in TOD, because it just literally makes no sense. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Alder. Alder Bennett? Yes. Um, thank you. For the second time. For the second time. <laughs> uh, sorry to kill you, um, Mayor Satya. Mm -hmm. um, first off, I, I forgot in my previous comment, I wanted to address the students' concerns. I find it anti-student and it, like discriminatory towards students to the characterization of our rental behavior. <laughs> um, just, I understand that like it is a transient population, but again, I, I know I've said it many, many, many times. Mm -hmm. UW is the number one employer in the city of Madison, and we are also draw diversity to this camp, to Madison area. And also, I, I from me speaking to the students, that they want to live downtown, um, not in like the area. So I don't know if you're going to have a bunch of student neighbors if we bring about a bunch of duplexes, but. I also wanted to know how this conversation has changed throughout this debate. At first, it was about neighborhood char character. Then it was, I don't know, about equity. And now we're talking about um, tenants. And I feel like we're going down this slippery slope argument, assuming that every single duplex is going to, or a majority of duplexes are gonna have absentee landlords. And I think it's um, kind of, it, it's, it's harmful for us to go down that slippery slope because like Alder Foster said, um, what if this is such a big issue, if we think that having owner occupancy for every single apartment, every single duplex will make sure that it gets maintained, let's do that across the, di let's do that across the city of Madison and not just with the TOD overlay. Having absentee landlords is not um, exclusive to the TOD overlay. It's a citywide issue. And I don't know how bad the issue is. I don't know if anyone knows how bad or the issue is, we can speculate about it, but um, if that's the way, way we're going, then like, why don't we have owner occupancy for every single duplex, like Alder Foster said? Why? Because it doesn't make sense. And this doesn't make sense. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll wrap it up, but I just think that it's a fancy way of 
getting to what what was originally proposed about appeasing the few. And I, I don't think that we should go down the slippery slope right now. If we want to go down the slope, then let's talk about it outside of this debate, because it is a serious one to talk about absentee landlords. But this is not the time, and this is not the argument um, for it. Thank you, Alder. Alder Furman. Thank you. I'll try to be quick. Um, let's, let's just be reminded what the point of doing this TOD is, which is to encourage more housing. I, you know, if I uh, magically could, could make sure that we're going to have duplexes everywhere tomorrow, including my own neighborhood, frankly, I would like us to have duplexes everywhere tomorrow. Um, I'd actually like even more density than that, quite frankly. Um, that's just not going to happen quickly. Um, and I think anything we do to slow it down, like this type of restriction, um, is, is we're going to see much, 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 much less development because how much capital is involved. Um, actually, that's, you know, frankly, one of the saving graces of, of your neighborhood not turning into tons of duplexes tomorrow. It takes capital. Um, to think that all property owners or that a lot of property owners are going to have the money to turn their homes into duplexes or knock down their current home and turn in and build a new duplex or somehow reconfigure, um, it's just not, not going to happen. I absolutely hear loud and clear, and I think the staff sitting in the back of the room that, that have been helping us this evening hear very loud and clear that there are very strong policy preferences that we look harder at what we can do to make this a better place that, for people that rent. Um, but I just want to say, make no mistake, if we water down this TOD with this amendment, we will see significantly less development. And quite frankly, I don't even think this TOD is going to give us all the development we need. That's why there are going to be tons more zoning stuff in the future. This is just a small piece. Please don't water down TOD. We desperately need this growth near transit for, for a ton of reasons we've talked about this evening. Uh, so I, I, I ask people not to support this. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Tischler for the second time. Yeah, I mean, there's also, uh, we have an aging population here in Madison. I mean, people are, are you know, getting older um, and many of them want to live in their house. I think this is a, a way uh, for somebody to, who has a, a house, most likely might have, you know, in many cases paid it off, uh, to be able to turn the house uh, into a duplex and have uh, and rent it out and have it be investment property, but also having uh, somebody there, uh, you know, to kind of take stay in the neighborhood and extend it to to others. So, um, so I just wanted to point out that that's that's uh, we have to look at that at that population. And again, in my in my district, we have a, a, a large number of individuals who are uh, uh, older. We're starting to see. Just now, a kind of a turnover in some of the sections, but uh, but I think we need to look at that population as well. Thank you, Alder. I have no other Alders in the queue wishing to speak. So, the amendment that is before us is Amendment Number One, which would require owner occupancy for duplexes in the transit-oriented development overlay district. All those in favor of requiring owner occupancy, aye. Those opposed, no. As your name is called, and the clerk will please call the roll. Thank you, Alder Tischler. Alder Tischler, aye. Alder Vetter. No. Alder Vetter, no. Alder Revere. No. Alder Revere, no. Alder Vitiver. Aye. Alder Vitiver, aye. Alder Wahelia. Hi. Wahelia, aye. Alder Benford. No. Alder Benford, no. Alder Bennett. No. Alder Bennett, no. Alder Carter. Yes. Alder Conklin. Alder Conklin, no. Alder Curry. No. Alder Curry, no. Alder Evers. Aye. Alder Evers, aye. Alder Figueroa Cole. No. Alder Figueroa Cole, no. Alder Foster. No. Alder Foster, no. Alder Furman. No. Alder Furman, no. Alder Harrington McKinney. Aye. Alder Harrington McKinney, aye. Alder Heck. No. Alder Heck, no. Alder Madison. No. Alder Madison, no. Alder Miyazi. Yes. Alder Miyazi, aye. Alder Paulson. No. Alder Paulson, no. Alder Fair. Alder Fair, no. I have six eyes, 13 no's. With 13 no's. With 13 no's, the amendment fails. And we are back to the main motion, which is to adopt the second substitute. I hesitate to ask, is there further discussion? 
Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of the second substitute amending sections of Chapter 28 to implement the new transit oriented development overlay district, aye. Those opposed, no. As your name is called, and the clerk will please call the roll. Thank you, Alder Tischler. Oh. Alder Tischler, no. Alder Vetter. Yes. Alder Vetter, aye. Alder Revere. Aye. Alder Revere, aye. Alder Vitterer. Aye. Alder Vitterer, aye. Alder Wahelia. No. Wahelia, no. Alder Benford. No. Alder Benford, no. Alder Bennett. Well, Alder Carter. Excuse me. Alder Conklin. This is with historic districts included, the second substitute. Alder Conklin, aye. Alder Curry. Alder Curry, aye. Alder Evers. Aye. Alder Evers, aye. Alder Figueroa Cole. Aye. Alder Figueroa Cole, aye. Alder Foster. Aye. Alder Foster, aye. Alder Furman. Aye. Alder Furman, aye. Alder Harrington McKinney. No. Alder Harrington McKinney, no. Alder Heck. Aye. Alder Heck, aye. Alder Madison. Alder Madison, aye. Alder Miyazi. No. Alder Miyazi, no. Alder Paulson. Aye. Alder Paulson, aye. Alder Fair. Aye. Alder Fair, aye. Uh, Alder Bennett. Aye. Alder Bennett, aye. I have 14 ayes, five noes. With 14 ayes, the second substitute passes. And we will move on to item number eight. Uh, item number eight is Legistar 74869, creating sections uh, within the Madison General Ordinances to change the zoning at 310 to 322 East Washington Avenue. Uh, Alder Furman, a motion. Uh, move adoption. Moved and seconded to adopt. Are there questions for staff? Is there discussion? Is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor of item eight? Seeing no objection, we record a unanimous vote in favor of item eight. That will take us to item nine, which is uh, Legistar 74885, amending uh, uh, supplemental regulations regarding the definitions of family. Uh, President Furman. Uh, move referral to the Plan Commission on February 13th. Um, as the lead committee, uh, additional referral to ha housing strategy committee on February 23rd and the common council on February 28th. Moved and seconded to refer. Are there questions? Alder Paulson. Yeah, the housing strategies committee uh, hasn't met in seven months. Uh, and so I just want to make sure that if they don't meet, uh, this doesn't delay it coming back to the council. Like if it's... So let's uh, get on the truck or, or staff or about a potential meeting, Mr. Walker, or can you speak to that? Can anyone speak to that here? <laughs> just, I, I did get an email about their schedule, so just let me check it here. My question is less if they're going to meet. It's it's what happens if they don't. It still comes back. It'll it'll still come back with no. Okay, yeah. thank you. All right, uh, Alder Bennett, question? Yeah, I just wanted to understand the purview of Housing Strategy Committee and just maybe understand if um, if Alder Vanderford would like to speak to why um, she would like to refer to that committee. Uh, so the first question is a question for staff. The second question is for the Alder if she wishes to respond. The um, jurisdiction of the Housing Strategy Committee? Uh, housing Strategy Committee is in charge of tracking housing data in the city of Madison, as well as making policy recommendations, largely on the, you know, creation and renovation of of housing. Um, they don't fund things; they really just make policy recommendations. So, follow up question on that: Does would this fall in their purview? Like, this is a is this kind of something that would normally be referred to housing strategy? Um, they, they do get referrals for um, policies that would affect the creation in general of housing. Um, not consistently, but they do receive those sorts of uh, um, referrals um, this, from time to time. This isn't for the, the amendment isn't necessarily for the creation, though. Uh, right. So this would be a opening up housing options for people. I, 
it's not directly um, something they would normally handle, but it's not far outside of their purview, I guess. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alder. Uh, Alder Ritiver, is it a question? No. Okay, do we have the information about meetings? We do, let me pull it back up. Um, so uh, they had, I, I think the, the staff plan was to meet in January, but then not meet again until March. Um, so they would be meeting next week on the 26th, I believe. Okay, so can we just clarify the motion, please? Um, sure. I mean, I think I think to be clear, um, you know, the 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 date that I was provided um, is is uh, what I said the Feb February twenty third. I mean, if they're if they're going to meet next next week to talk about this, quite frankly, one of the reasons this isn't even being considered tonight is there are questions that are being asked, and by the time it gets to plan commission, the idea is that those questions will have been answered or more researched, and so if it goes in front of housing strategy next week. Um, they're not going to have the information to work with. So um, I'll, I can let Alder Vitiver talk about that more um, and see, figure out. But I mean, it, it doesn't seem appropriate to me to, to go there that early um, based on my understanding of the intent of this referral. Thank you. Uh, all right. So Alder Figueroa, call is it questions? Confused. So there's two referrals then to the plan commission and the housing right, so strategy. The, the current motion is to refer to the plan commission to housing strategy committee and back to the city council. Okay, so and we asking for clarification about the housing strategy from the elder. Right. The 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 two questions that are before us. We're trying to dispense with the ones for staff first, and then we'll get into discussion. The elder can okay, clarify perfect. her intent. Thank you, Mr. Walker. I just want to clarify. So. Uh, they have a meeting scheduled for February. It's just their current work plan has items for a January meeting and then not again until March. So it's not that they can't meet in February. It is on the books. It's just their current work plan doesn't have anything scheduled for discussion in, the fe in February. So it would otherwise likely be canceled, I think. All right. So if we refer, refer something to them, they will have a reason to meet and they can meet. Are we all clear on the ability to meet? Okay. So uh, now, any other questions for staff? Seeing none. On to discussion. The question is referral. Alder Vitiver. Right. So as Alder Furman pointed out, um, we do not have a project page for this. There has been one public meeting. It was unfortunately not recorded for the majority of it. The public really can only see the ordinance. Um, it is long, obtuse, difficult to comprehend for the average person. Um, again, in this campus adjacent districts, this could have significant impacts. And we are asking for data to be presented. Um, and it seems that since the housing strategy committee is charged with assessing current data on Madison housing, that this was an appropriate committee for it to go to, um, for them to assess it and look at um, whether this was truly a strategy for maintaining housing choice, which has been proposed by staff as a primary reason for this um, proposal to go forward. Thank you, Alder. Alder Figueroa Cole. So the expectation is for the committee to, to present data, I mean, to, I mean, I guess I, I Alder, it's a referral. The expectation is that the committee will discuss it. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I mean, again, I'm in that committee and I haven't even got, they haven't even asked us if we have a quorum for that night. So it, it's not just about, like, I'm concerned about the date, the date. Um, Although we have mechanisms to pull it back to council if that's needed. So if they're not there, we will just move on. Yep. Okay, perfect. That's what I'm, what I'm concerned about. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Uh, I have no other alders in the queue, so I'll uh, just remind us that at their last meeting, Plan Commission voted to refer this to themselves in June. So the what's currently before us 
would refer it back to them sooner, also to housing strategy, and then back to the council sooner. Um, is there Alder figure a call? And then again. For the second time. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, and just like we did for this particular, the one that we just discussed, we can always have staff um, help with neighborhood association meetings or committee meetings in between to explain the policy, right? Yes, as usual. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Tischler. Just for clarification, so voting no moves it to June or moves it to the Planning Commission. Um, if this motion June. fails, we'll come back to the underlying motion and vote on that. Alder Wahilahi had her question answered. All right, so the motion is to refer uh, to plan commission in, I'm sorry, although I didn't write the dates down in June, February 15th, 13th, housing strategy later in February and the, and the council also in the end of February on the 28th. Thank you very much. Uh, is there objection to recording a unanimous vote to refer? Alder uh, Tischler objects. We'll have a roll call. So the motion is to refer to Plan Commission on no. uh, and February 13th, uh, Housing Strategy on February 23rd, and the City Council on February 28th. All those in favor of those referrals, I, those opposed, no. As the roll is called in the clerk will please call the roll. Thank you, Alder Tischler. Very well, Alder Vitter is excused. Alder Revere. Aye. Alder Revere, aye. Alder Vitiver. Aye. Alder Vitiver, aye. Alder Wahelia. No. Wahelia, no. Alder Benford. Aye. Alder Benford, aye. Alder Bennett. Alder Bennett, aye. Alder Carter. Alder Conklin. Aye. Alder Conklin, aye. Alder Curry. Aye. Alder Curry, aye. Alder Evers. Aye. Alder Evers, aye. Alder Figueroa Cole. Aye. Alder Figueroa Cole, aye. Alder Foster. Aye. Alder Foster, aye. Alder Furman. Aye. Alder Furman, aye. Alder Harrington McKinney. Aye. Alder Harrington McKinney, aye. Alder Heck. Alder Heck, aye. Alder Madison. Aye. Alder Madison, aye. Alder Miadze. No. Alder Miadze, no. Alder Paulson. Alder Paulson, aye. Alder Fair. Aye. Alder Fair, aye. Alder Tischler. Alder Tischler, no. I have 15 ayes, three noes. With 15 ayes, the referral passes. And we will move on to item 51. That's correct. Which is Legistar 75287, authorizing the city clerk's office to participate in the U.S. Alliance for Election Excellence. President Furman. Move adoption. Second. Moved and seconded to adopt. Are there questions for staff? Is there discussion? Mayor, um, I would like to. Yep, President. Uh, I'm going to do this on behalf of everybody who's going to vote for it. Thank you, staff, so much for working really hard on this um, and getting us these funds to make our election system better. Thank you, President Furman. Seeing no, does you, Alder Bennett? Just something quick. Every vote counts and every vote matters. Um, 2020 election results are real. Thank you for improving our system. Thank you, Alder Bennett. Alder Figueroa, call. I'm sorry, I, I wanted to just get a quick overview of this for the people that came on and spoke about it and the emails that we received about it. If Attorney Haas can help us with that. Um, Attorney Haas? Um, sure, I can just quickly address this. I mean, I could talk for an hour about this, but Please don't. Uh, I will not. <laughs> <laughs> I will just make two, two, two points. Two points. Um, there, there is no question about the legality of these election grants. Um, the city was involved in uh, lawsuits in both federal court and state court in which those uh, judges rejected the claim that the grants violated either state laws or the U.S. Constitution. 
The legislature also acknowledged that the grants were um, were not prohibited by law by trying to pass a law which would have pro prohibited the grants and that was not successful. In addition, there were federal courts across the country who came to the same conclusion as the judges in our cases. Um, I would also just say that as far as the argument that, or the observation about the public having confidence in our elections, it has also been proven over and over that the 2020 elections were safe and secure and accurate. Um, the fact that people may not want to believe that, I think speaks to what they want to believe, not to what the facts are. Uh, I guess the final point I would make is that the clerk's office has determined that it does have uh, one-time uses for these grant funds over the, over, uh, through the 2024 general election. Uh, the grant terms require that the clerk's office report reports how the funds are used, and that would be a public document that anybody could have access to. Thank you. That's all. Thank you, Alder. Alder Harrington McKinney. Uh, thank you very much for asking for that clarification. Um, I've been a chief inspector since 2006, and um, our uh, clerks in the, the office has the highest degree of integrity. I'm glad that this is passed, and I would hope that it passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. I have no other Alders in the queue. The motion, Alder Wahilihi. Yeah, could I be added as a sponsor? The clerk will add you as a sponsor, Alder. Thank you. Thank you. I have no other Alders in the queue. Is there any objection to recording a unanimous vote in favor of approval? Seeing no objection, we'll record a unanimous vote in favor of approval of item 51. We'll move on to item 52, which is Legislature 75291, President Furman. Uh, move approval with the note that the title should be uh, Inc. instead of LLC. Moved and seconded. The, I'm sorry, Mayor, uh, for clarification, it's of the substitute. Moved and seconded the substitute with a small clarification. Are there questions? Seeing no questions, is there discussion? Alder Bennett. Yes, I'm sorry to keep you up at this late hour, um, but this is a project that I've been working with the neighborhood a lot on. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to uplift the concerns of the Neighborhood Association and encourage um, the developers and the architects to continue working with them. Um, I think this is one project, especially because it is a city-owned property, like we should be able to do more with this project. We should be, a, like, we should be able to provide more affordable housing. We sh it shouldn't be subsidized luxury housing where there's a pool and hot tub on top of the development and there should be green space instead. Um, so I know after 12 o'clock, as it is midnight now, people might not be registering this, but... Um, I just wanted to speak towards the efforts that the Neighborhood Association has been putting into this project and hope that um, the architects and the developers will work with them in good confidence um, and take into account their concerns. Thank you, Alder. No further Alders in the queue. The motion is to adopt the substitute. Is there any objection to recording a unanimous vote in favor? Seeing no objection, we'll record a unanimous vote in favor of item 52. That brings us to the end of our exclusions. Alder Tischler, it is your turn. Motion moved and seconded to adjourn. Is there any objection to recording a unanimous vote in favor of adjournment? Seeing no objection. We are adjourned.